All right. Thanks everyone for joining today. I think the, as the time is approaching, we should start. So my name is Ting Nan. I'm one of the organizers from Google. And today we're organizing this Asia Robotics Workshop. That's the first in the core this year. And we're super excited to have the chance. So the age of robotics, why we're doing that is because there are a bunch of robotics tasks, for example, like dynamic walking, like uh, moving, either driving or flying over very narrow spaces, or like, you know, age of manipulations, like playing ping pong or playing tennis. Those are very different from those quasi static tasks where the time and time decision time is not that important. But for age robotics, they do tax on both the control inference time, the text on the fast sensors, and also require fast actuators, right? So given that, we'll be, those challenges, how do we solve that? That's the question. And I think they're very valuable. And today we are inviting a lot of speakers as well as attendees here to share the recent exciting progress from both the learning and control side and see what we learned in recent years and see how learning and control together can help us solve these very challenging but interesting tasks. And given that, I think our time is right for our first keynote speaker, that's Scott Kudersma. And Scott is from Boston Dynamics. As many of you have seen this very cool Atlas robots doing parkour, that is under the lead of Scott. And given that, Scott, uh, would you want to start? Yes, is my audio working? Yes, perfect. Great. All right. Uh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback from the room. Uh, but I'll go ahead and start. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here um, be able to kick off uh, what looks like it'll be a very exciting day of interesting work from all of you. Um, so yeah, I'm at Boston Dynamics. I've been here since uh, 2018. And I thought I'd start with just a couple sort of very high level company wide slides, just for those of you who don't track our work very closely. Um, so Boston Dynamics is a company that's been around for actually quite a long time, uh, 30 years. And the details of what the company has worked on and how many people there are here and so on is sort of shifted throughout the years, um, as has our ownership. Um, but we're really excited about the place we're in right now. So as of last year, we were acquired by Hyundai um, and we're all uh, pretty positive about that uh, because they have a very supportive and ambitious mission for how our technology uh, can actually make it out into the world and have a positive effect on many people's lives and make uh, industries more uh, efficient and autonomous. Uh, and to support that mission, we've been growing incredibly quickly. So as of right now, we have over 500 employees. Uh, we're going to continue to hire uh, like crazy over the next couple of years, uh, particularly in areas like machine learning, reinforcement learning, control, estimation, planning, uh, as well as other engineering functions. So um, if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, you can feel free to keep checking our careers page. We'll post things as we go throughout the year. Or if any of the things I talk about today are particularly interesting to you, you can feel free to reach out to me uh, directly. So um, at Boston Dynamics, we have uh, three uh, main uh, robot platforms that all kind of serve different functions. So Spot is our first product. And as of right now, there are hundreds of these robots all over the world doing various things. Uh, from serving as mobile manipulation research platforms to um, doing legit inspection and monitoring uh, operations in uh, industrial facilities and construction sites and power plants and so on. Um, Stretch is our purpose-built uh, factory, uh, sorry, warehouse automation system. So this is a large mobile robot that's built to move quickly and in particular load and unload trucks and shipping containers and pallets very efficiently. Um, and so uh, we're ex really excited about the launch of Stretch and, and working with early partners and, and to make this technology really uh, reliable and a game changer for a lot of people who work in this area. Uh, Atlas, which is where I spend most of my time, is uh, primarily an R&D platform. And we kind of think of it as a technology incubator uh, where we, push the limits on both hardware and software, and over time uh, produce technological nuggets that find their way into uh, current and future products. 
but also kind of been growing our R&D mission for Atlas to think about how this type of robot could be used as a uh, real world solution in and of itself. And what does that mean? And what are the new pieces required to really make that a reality? Um, but for the purposes of this workshop, since we're you know here to talk about agility and robots, I thought I'd really highlight one of the main themes, which has been central to our work on Atlas over the past couple of years, is uh, this goal of trying to make creating athletic behavior easy. Um, at some level, we think this should be an easy thing, right? It, 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 but despite that, you know, um, there's been you know decades of work in robotics that has, has made uh, sort of incremental progress towards this goal. And you know, we're at a point in history where we can build really capable machines, and so we should strive for uh, control systems that are able to really operate at the boundaries of these machines um, and, and really have a wide behavior space. Um, and when we say sort of creating athletic behavior, there's sort of many ways you can interpret that. One is, you know, if I wanted to create something like a backflip, ideally over time, we should get to a point where it isn't, you know, many weeks of an engineer's effort and careful analysis of logs and things like that in order to be able to create these behaviors. It should be, you know, something on the order of hours to go from a concept of a behavior to a functioning experiment on the robot. And I think uh, as of right now, we're, we're pretty close to that goal. So. In order to talk about these ideas and different things we've tried, I wanted to just present a very high level uh, conceptual framework um, where at any given time, the robot has some distribution of behaviors that it can perform. And the process for creating these behaviors might be decomposed into a sort of offline kind of design phase and some online execution phase where, you know, broadly offline design could involve, uh, you know, running learning experiments, it could involve running optimization, it could involve people doing careful hand tuning or whatever. Um, and then at some point, there has to be some online planning and control system that consumes some uh, uh, pre-computed objects and turns them into low level inputs to the robots actuators. And uh, the way that we've sort of structured it in our work is to think about this online block is is centered around model predictive control which is a specific type of control that um, aims to reason about the, the time evolution of the robot state and uh, choose inputs now so that the behavior over time is is, is optimal or locally optimal and uh, as you can imagine depending on what choices you make here uh, you, the whole requirements for the entire stack are, are, are can be wildly different so the question for us really was, you know, what what choices should we make here, and what choices could we technically make here? Like, what could we actually achieve in implementation, and uh, how did different answers to that question impact things like um, how hard it is to design a new behavior or family of behaviors? Um, how sort of taskable is the robot online? Um, how you know generalizable is any given behavior? Um, to new contexts, uh, sort of zero shot and things like that. So I'm gonna talk about a few different choices we've made and, and how those have uh, uh, panned out in different co experimental contexts on Atlas. Um, and then I'll, I'll sort of end by talking about how we're exploring learning as one potential answer for the uh, this offline phase. So um, before talking about specific variants of MPC that you know we've played around with, I wanted to just point out some general properties that I think you know are relatively invariant, uh, at least for doing MPC on robots like Atlas. Uh, the first is that um, you're pretty quickly going to just be in a nonlinear optimization space, right? So any reasonable approximation to this robot's you know body is going to admit uh, nonlinear constraints, um, and so you're going to be solving a non-convex optimization problem online in order to implement these controllers. Um, so how do you do that? Well, our approach to doing that is just to iter iteratively linearize and solve convex approximations to the problem, and we never run it to convergence, right? So we're not sitting here like running an SQP solver to get at some local optimum and then sending that to the robots actuators. We never do that. We're always just sort of like, you know, solving one QP per tick, and, and that's sort of good enough. Um, so that's one sort of high-level observation. Um, and even then, I think you have to do a lot of work in uh, creating and exploiting problem structure for speed. So, you know, to get these controllers to actually be useful, they have to run pretty fast by and large. 
And um, doing that is, is, is a lot of work in, 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 in a lot of ways. And the way that we do that is to uh, exploit sparsity. So we write down the problem in a way that encourages the best, most sparsity that we can think of, and then use specialized solvers that exploit that sparsity. And here, this is a, this is a, a cartoon of the sparsity structure of our, of our uh, MPC problem. It's not literally what it looks like, but it's meant to give you the sort of idea. This is one way to do it. You can also just, you know, opt for trying to create small, dense problems and, and get, I think, similar levels of performance that way. Um, okay, so these are some general properties. So, what are what are uh, different choices you could make to actually instantiate this problem? Well, the first thing that we did, which is was a, you know, is is a very common idea in the literature, is to uh, use uh, what people call a centroidal dynamics. Some people call it like a single potato model. There's a bunch of names for this, but basically the idea is the robot is roughly a single rigid body uh, that may be changing its mass distribution over time. And you're solving for um, uh, external forces and um, how those external forces when applied over time impact things like center of mass, angular excursion, linear and angular momentum and things like that. Okay, so that's the robot's notion of itself, right? And in, in, so far as MPC is concerned. Um, and then we subsequently, through some other optimization process, resolve the kinematics of the robot, all right? And that could be done a few different ways as well. You can imagine solving IK problems that are just concerned with touchdown events. So you can make sure that the robot is uh, reaching the ground at the time you expect it to in a, in a sort of kinematically feasible configuration. Or you can do trajectory versions of this, which are a little bit more sophisticated and, and you can get a little bit better consistency between the kinematic motion and the, and the momentum, for example. So there's a bunch of different things you could do here, but the high level idea is that you can separate these problems, divide and conquer, solve simpler optimizations, um, and therefore have an easier path to a fast controller that can hopefully do some useful things. Um, and it turns out you can do quite a lot with this. And this is really the basis of all of the work that we did uh, on dance and, and uh, parkour. So you can get, you know, the offline design phase can be different things. It could be motion capture. We have several things that we did where we just put on a motion capture capture suit um, and just sent that, you know, a lightly processed uh, series of data right to the controller and have the robot do it. Here you see this is a an animator using tools like Maya or, Bl or Blender with a, a model of Atlas to create uh, dance moves that we can, you know, take here, run through MPC in a way I've described and. Uh, get out nice stable behavior that looks just like the animation uh, or you can use offline optimization to do things like front flips back flips running jogging all that stuff um, so here's an example of just running an offline trajectory optimization um, and in this case this was just you know actually the very first hardware experiment we did um, and because mpc is capable it, it's sort of able to uh, stabilize that um, and you can do more than just sort of one-off behaviors, right? So we built an entire system around this where um, we had a library of sort of order hundreds of trajectories that had to do with various mobility strategies, um, jumping, jogging, walking, uh, all kinds of absurd tricks and dance moves and so on. Um, and then you can make these available to an online decision-making system that uh, could be running a planner that is integrating perception information and being able to select and retarget trajectories um, based on the observed local geometry. And then you can take advantage of some of the innate benefits of MPC, for example, that it's looking over a horizon um, and be able to resolve any kind of minor inconsistencies between behaviors as they're running in sequence. So if I have like two, a jog and a jump behavior, and I want to do a jog jump strategy over some obstacles in the environment, um, it need not be the case that the boundary conditions of these two behaviors sort of match really well offline. You can kind of use some uh, smart blending techniques within MPC to resolve a lot of these complexities. Um, so you can you can do quite a lot uh, with this sort of setup. And in fact, this is you know what we did for uh, this this parkour video you might have seen. Um, and this is kind of a perception view of what's going on. Um, so we've talked a little bit publicly about you know how we actually are orchestrate these sort of uh, demonstrations. In this case, you know, we build an environment in the lab with a specific routine in mind, right? It's not the, it's not the case that we would want to design like some kind of autonomous planner and have this library of mobility behaviors and say, go figure it out in the lab and, and hope that it comes up with some really interesting routine. This is very much a sort of thing that we had in mind ahead of time. And so um, in order to actually uh, 
create a video demonstration like this, we've kind of associated a sequence of maneuvers for the robots ahead of time and uh, with a prior map. And then we're using perception in order to localize that approximate prior map with how the lab is actually laid out. Um, and then the robot's able to sort of make fine adjustments to each of the individual behaviors in order to do it. So that, all that stuff's kind of cool. Um, the downsides are really that the uh, trajectory library kind of scales roughly with the number of behaviors you need, right? It's not exactly true, right? So if I have maybe just a handful of like broad jump behaviors could cover a bunch of different gaps and platforms and things like that, that's not that big of a deal. But roughly speaking, you need pretty good uh, detailed references in order to implement these behaviors. You couldn't give it totally naive like keyframes or things like that and hope that MPC is going to come up with a really good answer. Um, so that means that the generalization from the library itself is limited. Um, and, the, and that's because the robots, uh, the control system's ability to innovate in a useful way online is limited. So it leads naturally to the question of how might we do better. And you could probably guess, uh, you know, based on what you know, other people have done in the literature as well, uh, but also the way I've led into this, you cannot separate those two optimization problems, right? I could solve both of these things together. The gotcha, of course, is now my problem is like way bigger. Uh, it's, you know, maybe numerically a bit more challenging to solve. So there's no guarantee that you could actually implement this and have it work reliably or quickly enough or whatever. It's actually a, hard, a lot of hard work to do. Um, but the, if you can do it, the benefit is uh, now you can exactly reason about the full kinematics of the robot with the dynamics. So you're sort of able to coordinate those things exactly. You have real uh, kinematic limits, reachability limits, joint limits, things like that. You can put in collision geometry so the robot doesn't collide with itself as it's flailing in legs, its legs and arms around to recover. Um, and so the hypothesis is, if we're able to actually implement something like this, that we should get benefits in terms of things like robustness, so more innovative, exciting recoveries. We should be able to generalize better. So we should have from a fixed size library, we should be able to do strictly more. Um, and maybe we can get away from having to have really high quality trajectories coming into the system. Um, so, and maybe not even trajectories at all. Maybe I could just give sort of sparse task space goals to the system and, and let MPC resolve all of the uh, dynamic and kinematic details. Um, so we we did this uh, subsequent to the, the sort of parkour work and uh, it actually worked out really well. This is just a, a kind of a fun video showing a, a slowed down broad jump and what it looks like for MPC to predict into the future the, the whole body evolution of that jump, which is just kind of cool. Um, these I, I personally don't ever get tired of looking at these visualizations, they're pretty nifty. Um, and in terms of generalization, we were actually quite surprised with how far we could start to push this. So here is the, the sort of backflip behavior that we run in the lab all the time. So this is kind of a little demo platform and we have people come through the lab, we'll run this for them. Um, so what's going on here is this is, a, a again, a, a detailed trajectory that we designed offline and throw it into MPC. Um, and it was designed for a 30 centimeter platform, right? And that's basically the height that it's on right here. So, you know, modulo uh, transfer problems, this should work, right? This is kind of the nominal setting. Um, now, because MPC is able to think about the entire body, we can actually say, take that 30 centimeter backflip trajectory and just run it on flat ground, right? So we're not touching the trajectory reference at all. We still hand it to MPC, but now we're saying that landing has to happen on flat ground, not 30 centimeters translated downwards. And uh, MPC figures it out. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So we can just have one backflip behavior and kind of run it in a bunch of different circumstances. And what it's actually doing, if you look closely at it, is the kind of things you'd expect. So it's deciding that it needs to sort of tuck more uh, in flight and land differently in order to get its feet around and when they're expected to hit the ground, uh, which is pretty cool. So this kind of like dynamic generalization of trajectories is something we're seeing more and more of. Um, and this also has a knock-on effect. If we create a new type of behavior, the sort of basin of attraction for that behavior is now quite a bit wider. So it actually makes creating the behaviors a lot faster. I and mean, this is exactly why the front flip I showed you in the beginning uh, worked first try is because the controller has sort of evolved over time to the point where uh, we don't actually actually have to iterate that much on the inputs to MPC. As long as they're ballpark pretty good, um, things, things tend to uh, work 
work reasonably well. Um, another sort of extreme example is what if we um, don't even provide a reference trajectory at all? So here the reference trajectory is a sequence of uh, desired steps, uh, which are going from heel toe transitions at some frequency and a fixed body posture that's like a statue translating forward in, in space. Um, and from that MPC can assemble uh, dynamic walking, which is kind of cool. Um, and you know not everything about this is perfectly aesthetically pleasing right like it's doing some interesting arm swinging thing but yeah maybe it looks a little bit odd if you're imagining this to be like human like walking right uh, but we think mpcs do something reasonable here and that it's using these arm motions to uh be able to regulate the yaw moment as it's walking um and you know, one of the things we noticed, this is like a fun observation uh, in this work, is if you actually look at the uh, ground reaction force of uh, of the robot, it lines up pretty well with the kind of double hump profile that you tend to see reported in the biomechanics literature. Uh, and this is certainly not the case for other walking gates that had been developed for Atlas previously. Certainly anything like a ZMP style gate or anything like that uh, would, would not have this type of profile. Um, so I don't know what to conclude from that, but it seemed, seemed like an interesting um, uh, emergent effect. So um, the evolution of our work on Atlas is, is sort of naturally gone from well, let's think about mobility and how to get the robot to dynamically move through its environment. And um, uh, now we're actually thinking about how do we get this, put this robot to work. Uh, so this, of course, creates a whole host of new problems and uh, the robot has to now perceive and know how to interact with movable objects in its environment. Um, now we're thinking about sort of bimanual manipulation of potentially big heavy objects with you know complex appearances and geometries. Um, and we want to do all of this while maintaining the characteristic uh, agility that we've all come to expect from Atlas. So there's a lot of work that we're doing here in this space now. I'm not really going to talk about that. I want to keep zoomed in on this, this problem of control and agility and see how we're thinking about it in the context of this type of uh, manipulation work. So what's the natural extension to MPC when we start to think about Atlas as a working robot, right? Um, well, it, one idea is let's just start to stick object models inside MPC along with all of its body details. Um, so we might include estimates of the object state, you know, mass properties, you know, priors, uh, maybe motion constraints of the objects or the relative constraints between the robot and the object that's manipulating. Um, and then uh, have the robot be able to use MPC to balance what might be competing objectives related to mobility, stability, and manipulation. Um, we also expect that this makes the robot a lot easier to task with things, right? So if I'm able to specify desired manipulation tasks in terms of the state of objects or the desired state of objects and just let MPC resolve it, um, then that makes the sort of authoring problem a lot easier in that I don't have to anticipate ahead of time in some sense what all the manipulation tasks I want the robot to do are. Um, so what do you get when you do that? So here's just some, some kind of fun examples. If I take Atlas's unmodified uh, this is just a 180 jump behavior. And now I incorporate a uh, barbell. Uh, in this case, it's a sort of a 35 pound, 16 kilogram barbell. Um, in the sense that I have perception that's able to detect this thing using the robot's cameras. And I have some grass models that tell me how I should attempt to pick this up. I can then give to MPC, assemble a problem that says, do a 180 while also holding this object in some desired relative body relative location. And so you can take, you know, what is a, you know, two year old basically trajectory and repurpose it for this, you know, fun little dynamic manipulation task. And, th and this only works because MPC is able to think about, you know, how the inertia of the object is going to, you know, affect the, the robot's ability to spin 180 while in flight, right? Um, uh, you can similarly do that with other things, nothing special about barbells. So if we have, you know, a model for this board and we're able to detect it and know how to grasp it, I can tell the robot to grab the thing, use its normal jogging, walking behaviors, do 180s, and drop it and build a bridge. Um, similarly, I could take a, 
a tool bag. And if we have a, a model of how to detect that, we know something about its mass properties. Um, I can tell the robot that I want it to throw the bag while doing its same 180, right? Um, and here, again, we're just giving MPC a reference trajectory that's a 180. Tell that it, we want it to rotate around 180 degrees while uh, at some point in the middle, uh, throwing the bag, which is getting the bag to some boundary condition at the point when the grip is released. It. Um, just as another fun example, so uh, you know we had all these parkour behaviors that we built, of course, and um, here's an example of just running the beginning of the robot's old parkour course while, in this case, carrying a uh, exhaust assembly from a car. Um, and again, this is no no new behavior creation happened here. This is all stuff that we're able to just do online as long as we have you know a model um, for how to grasp and perceive an object. Okay, so let me talk talk quickly about um, learning. And you know, I've mostly talked about design offline as being primarily about creating trajectories and then doing a bunch of work online in order to make those trajectories as extensible as possible. Um, where does learning fit in here? In order to talk about that, I'm actually gonna switch robots on you um, and talk about Spot, because that's one of the platforms we've been using to explore uh, learning work in the past several months. Uh, so Spot, as I mentioned, is our production robot. It's already very good at walking around the world. It's been used all over the place and outdoors, indoors, and things like that. Um, many of you have probably interacted directly with one of these robots at some point in the past. Um, so the question is, okay, if we're going to do learning work uh, with a robot like Spot, um, when is it a good and justifiable engineering decision to use RL uh, on a robot that's already got a sort of production quality mobility system? Um, and is there are there ways in which we should leverage that existing state-of-the-art system to bootstrap or simplify learning in some sense? Um, so one approach is, well, we just continue with the framework, right? And we, instead of learning, uh, we can learn a policy that's a feedback policy that is producing streaming inputs to MPC, right? So MPC still lives here, but now we're building policies that produce smart inputs to it. Um, and so you can you can absolutely do that. And here's just an example where we, you know, train a policy that's getting terrain observations and state observations um, uh, from the robot and uh, is, is streaming inputs to MPC. There are things like touchdown locations and uh, timings and desired center mass and body velocity, things like that. Um, and so you can learn interesting things. I wouldn't say that this is necessarily beyond the state of the art of what the production spot controller does, but um, you know, it, it was sort of an interesting learning experience and we we're continuing to kind of push around in this space. Um, you can also use the same type of framework to strictly extend beyond what current Spot does. So Spot currently doesn't really climb onto big things. Um, it physically can do that. It's just that the production control stack doesn't support it. And, you know, you might want the robot to, in some cases, climb over a rock wall or into a vehicle or something like that. Um, so another idea is, well, what if we learned a sort of episodic policy that, went, that can be activated around perceived tall objects? Um, and you know, stream inputs to MPC in order to climb over them. And the idea is that uh, a single policy could have some basin of attraction that would support a variety of different types of, um, of geometries, and maybe you can vary friction and surface things, and you know, whatever. Um, so it turns out this also works, and you know, we've started to make some progress here, where um, you know, we're able to transfer policies from simulation to the robot to climb over onto things and have some reasonable variability to the initial states and the details of the box geometry. Um, and what we're learning is basically that there's, you know, what we expected was that MPC is going to provide some useful search bias here, right? That uh, RL doesn't have to figure out everything because you're already sort of exploring in a useful behavior space. There's some downsides though, is that training becomes probably more expensive, especially if you're solving MPC problems as part of the environment step, many, and especially if you're running the policy at a lower rate, you're, sending, you're, you're solving many MPC problems per environment step. Um, you're also, you know, and I think many people recognize it's limited by the model inside the controller. So if there's something about the behavior that's outside of the scope of MPC, you're never going to be able to enjoy those solutions because you're going to be bottlenecked for MPC. Um, we also found that the sim to real gap we thought would be better 
uh, using MPC. And in, so far, that hasn't totally been true. In some cases, it is. Some cases, it is, isn't. And uh, so that was has been an interesting observation. So uh, I'll leave with just uh, one last very recent result, and you know maybe just ask who needs MPC. And I know many of you here uh, are probably saying this the whole talk, uh, which is great. Um, why not just learn policies that are outputting at a much lower level, uh, you know, directly to joint controllers, for example. And so we're, we're also exploring that in the context of you know slip recovery, which is a, a place where uh, MPC doesn't do super well because it has some underlying assumptions about the frictional interaction between the robot and the environment and estimating friction online is actually quite a hard thing to do. So this is a case where we think learning low level policies to just solve a, a narrow problem is actually a pretty good idea. And this, of course, aligns with many of the great work that uh, you all have done in, in the context of quadrupedal uh, locomotion as well. Cool. Um, so I think I'll end there. And uh, I just want to thank my wonderful team. So I have the privilege of being able to show up at a, a workshop like this and talk about their great work. Um, and, and this team is really the, uh, the reason why I enjoy my work so much. So uh, I very much want to acknowledge them for their contributions. And, um, and like I said, we have a lot of fun where we're working. We do a lot of crazy things. There's a lot of uh, new and exciting things to come. So if you're excited about working with us or learning more, uh, please feel, feel free to reach out. Thanks. Thanks, Bart. I think due to the time limit, unfortunately, we have to move to the other talk sessions, even though I believe there are a lot of questions people want to ask. All right, now we'll get into the first short talk session. And I want to introduce uh, Matthew Gombele from Georgia Tech and leader of the Core Robotics Lab. Yes, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to get to speak with you today. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not able to be there in person. I, we are expecting relatively soon baby number three, and I don't exactly want to end up out of the country when my uh, wife goes into labor. So hopefully you'll forgive me and we can talk another time. Um, I would like to give you a little bit of a different talk than anything I've ever given before. Uh, this will be fun. Uh, so the talk title today is Towards Robo Federer, as in Roger Federer, Agile, Safe, and Cognitive Robotic Systems. So Roger Federer was definitely my hero growing up, wanting to be a pro. I, I guess I got to be a professor, um, and maybe one day I'll go pro on a tennis tour. But in terms of agility, Boston Dynamics is certainly doing amazing stuff. Um, and Roger Federer, though, to me, is kind of the pinnacle of what humans can achieve in terms of agility, agility, dynamics, and also good sportsmanship. And when I was a grad student, I saw uh, work from across the pond over in Europe by uh, Jan Peters, Jens Kober, Katarina Muehling, doing some really impressive work with learning from demonstration, imitation learning, reinforcement learning with ping pong. And I was like, oh, man, one day I want to be able to do something like that. Um, and more recently, some of my collaborators at Google, who invited me for this, this workshop talk, have done some really cool work with uh, playing ping pong and getting consistent rallies going between a human and a machine, which is really impressive work. Um, and I'm trying to up the ante because I actually want a hitting partner. And so in my lab, we've been developing a robotic platform to actually play tennis with me, either as my opponent, my training partner, or as my doubles partner. And we are a long way away from actually solving this problem. So it's not solved, but we're trying to do a lot of things incrementally on the way to get there so that uh, before I retire, I can take my robot with me and go have fun on the courts. And there's so many facets to actually solving this problem, and I won't be able to cover them all, but I do want to highlight three specific components that I'll talk about today. One, a little bit of a deep dive into robot skill learning. How can the robot actually learn to hit the ball? Second, how can you adapt? This is Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal playing doubles together. They like never do that, and then they almost smacked each other in the face. You have to learn how to adapt to new situations and new partners. And then lastly, I want to share uh, work that we're doing on the human robot interaction side to actually understand how do we design robots to be safe partners for humans in the same space. No humans were injured in the user study that we did. So let's first talk about robot skill learning. 
What I mean specifically is learning from demonstration where we're going to take a markup decision process without a known reward function. And we want to reverse engineer a human policy pi star that takes as input S, the state of the world, say the robust degrees of freedom, where the ball is. We want to learn a policy pi for the robot or pi hat that minimizes some measure of divergence uh, between the robot's policy and the human's policy. And depending on what the expectation is over, you get behavior cloning versus imitation learning. And I have uh, uh, about a decade of work in apprenticeship learning, originally looking at healthcare and kind of more cognitive decision-making tasks where we want a robot to learn from expert charge nurses how to coordinate patient care. And here is a obstetrics and gynecology ward where uh, there's a real problem with birth nurse burnout and nurses quitting and trying to develop robotic student support to standardize that patient care was a real priority of that work in collaboration with Julie Shaw at MIT and our collaborators at Harvard. Um, and we've been able to field that system and actually show that the robot can provide effective decision support for how to manage the logistics of, of healthcare. And why should RL researchers care about imitation learning? Let's just get a reward function and use the greatest, latest and greatest flavor of RL. Well, first, many feats of reinforcement learning are precipitated because of learning from humans. AlphaGo originally needed to leverage human data sets to design the right cotton architectures for these systems to work well, and then eventually we'll learn how to do it, say, without humans. Um, and maybe with Gato as a supervised system, maybe one day we'll be able to get to reinforcement learning from there. But right now, supervised learning provides a lot of benefits. Third, uh, one other point is that we can also use data from humans to create a digital twin with re uh, learning from demonstration and then use RL in a simulation environment to synthesize a policy that a robot can be a good partner with a human. The last point I'll note is that often we use things like model predictive control or other hand engineered controllers for vehicles and then we can distill that into a neural network through imitation learning and then bootstrap RL there. And it's really hard to teach robots. The correspondence problem, the human and the robot have different bodies and we see the worlds in fundamentally different ways. And despite my students' best effort in teaching robots to play, it's not Roger Federer or whoever may be the latest, uh, the greatest player in ping pong at the time, though it's, it's a good start. So what if robots could actually learn our intent when we're trying to teach them skills to play tennis with us and the robot could automatically learn to do better? I'll start with introducing the noise performance relationship originally kind of pursued by Daniel Brown et al. Uh, what if we have a half cheetah domain where we train an RL policy and we just let it run? Uh, so it can run in this 2D plane and do pretty good. But what if we inject uniform random noise with some blending parameter eta and the robot's policy pi? Uh, about a third of the time, the robot's actions are diluted with this noise. And then we get 0.6 of the time it's noise and then 100% noise. You see the robot gets worse. But how much worse is it actually getting? If we plotted the reward signal on the vertical axis, the amount of noise that you injected on the horizontal axis, what, would, what kind of curve would we find? Well, in this case, we compute the reward. It looks like something like the right half of a sigmoid function, actually, which is interesting. And maybe we could leverage this to figure out what would be negative noise on this curve to do even better than the demonstration baseline that we have. And so we developed an approach. This was worked by Leitian Chen in my lab and, uh, and others, where we're using adversarial inverse reinforcement learning, where on the left here, we're going to have a policy that takes in a state of the world, generates a predicted action, and then we compare that to a data set of human demonstrations. We'll pass that through a discriminator, which inside of it implicitly captures a reward function. And in order to predict, is it coming from the robot or is it coming from the human? So we're gonna get a reward function by comparing these trajectories, and we're gonna do RL with our policy to try to fool the discriminator. And then we're going to do these rollouts with increasing amounts of noise. So we have the robot performing the task worse and worse and worse, ideally. And for each of those noise state action trajectories, we can pass that through a reward function to get an initial estimate, a guess about how good that trajectory was. And if you look at the actual curves that we've looked at across a number of OpenAI gym environments and number of RL, uh, learning algorithms, the green curves here are the amount of noise with increasing noise to the right. 
a sigmoid function which we adapted adopted as a low pass filter really nicely approximates that degradation of performance whereas prior work uh, looked at the Lou Shepard rule which did not provide a good fit uh, and did not actually tailor very well to the individual nuances among the task domains so we're going to use a low pass filter uh, sigmoid on our reward estimates from AIRL and then distill that filter back into the reward function to now learn an idealized reward function R that should be able to give us a policy better than the human demonstrator. So we compared different ways of generating the data hours. Uh, we had a noisy AIRL approach that kind of helped with the distribution shift of injecting these noisy trajectories into the discriminator that I don't have time to go into. What we found against prior work is that our approach with noisy uh, data generation with AIRL and our self-supervised reward regression with this distillation of a sigmoid low-pass filter, we were able to generate very high correlations of guest reward against the ground truth reward in a number of um, Majoko or open edge and environments. Where on the axes here, we have ground truth return on the horizontal um, predicted return from our algorithm here. Blue is the synthetic training data that we're generating with our method. Red is the single demonstration that we would have. And then blue is the test data. And we see uh, our work is able to find a nice correlation there. And then you can use that learn reward function to then outperform prior work, uh, synthesizing a policy against it, um, which is really cool. And then we applied this to table tennis and showed that across a number of metrics, first we imitate uh, with AIRL, and then we use SSRR to do better than the previous demonstrations that we had across multiple metrics. And we also have a nice paper that I kind of just point you to at uh, HRI this year that got Best Technical Paper Award from Mariah Shrum and Aaron Headland Body, where we actually characterized the way in which humans were suboptimal in their teaching to account for that person-specific variance and their suboptimality. And they have ongoing work here to show then, can you have robots better teach humans to be better robot teachers? That's going to be presented at Coral. And I would strongly encourage you to sync up with them and hear their talk on that. Briefly, the next point is adaptation, because if you're going to work with a human robot, I don't think my robot's going to be so safe walking around me swinging a racket like that. And so there's no difference between adaptation there and say uh, a robot, a deep brain stimulation robot trying to figure out how person specific variances in their brain might say that you need to stimulate them differently to fight uh, Parkinson's or epilepsy and also airplanes that experience damage are going to need to learn to adapt and fly on their own. Um, and so just briefly highlighting some of our work, we have a uh, nice work by Mariah Shrum in my lab looking at meta learning over a distribution of say tennis partners or in this case different failure cases in an airplane where we can actually train our algorithms uh, to automatically learn how to very quickly adapt to these situations so uh, through an active learning approach and then we can wrap that within chance constrained optimization and the difference is quite stark or on the left you might actually see the robot uh, if it's learning to fail if you have some damage in one case, if you're not actually clever about it, the robot will just learn to crash. And in the other case, we can actually maintain stable control of an aircraft. Lastly, I'll briefly mention that we have some cool work coming out at HRI this year, where we looked at a modified table tennis environment where a human and robot teammate can actually be partners to play. I know those are violating the rules because you have to take turns in real table tennis, but we say, forget it, let's play like doubles in, in actual lawn tennis. So you can both hit. So the robot can actually swing. And if you get in the way of the robot, it should stop and not actually smack you in the face, but that's a little scary. And so the goal for this task was the human and the robot needed to return as many balls as possible. And we varied the robot's performance level whether the robot would have a vocal assertive intention communication saying, I got it. And you could tell the robot, no, I got it uh, right before it would swing. And then we also gendered the voice to be more masculine or feminine. We found a number of interesting factors, but what I really want to hide here is that robots vocally asserting intent to strike the ball decreases perceived safety. And this calls into question, if I want my robo Federer robot to play with me, should it be just completely passive and not assert itself or its goals in the middle of a point? So I think there could be some really interesting finding here that we might need to design robot partners to be different than what we think of human partners. 
And so in future work, I think for us to get to an actual doubles partner, we're going to need to improve performance of onboard sensing. How do we do end to end or fast kinodynamic planning? How do we reason hierarchically about strategy, tactics, and execution in, in tennis? I'd also like to note we want to talk about guaranteeing safety. And so some work by Yue Yuang and Lei Tian Chen uh, will be presented at this workshop, as well as how can we improve skill learning? Um, and I have a number of students who will also be presenting that work. I'd like to thank my lab and all my wonderful students, um, and then Google, among other sponsors, for this work. And we'd be happy to take a question. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matthew. Anybody have any questions they would like to ask? Okay, I have a question. Um, so, in the case of, let's say, boxing, it's very evident that you could overpower uh, a robot to you know immediately knock out an opponent or in the case of tennis you could just increase the power to you know 10,000 watts and send the 100 mile an hour fastball so what is your opinion on balancing robots so that the competition is a bit fair when playing with humans a great question so one of the the reason why we actually used a wheelchair here instead of omnidirectional wheels is that Georgia Tech has a D1 tennis facility and they would not let us bring uh, not legit uh, wheelchair tennis uh, onto their courts. So we had to make it regulation to in, in order to get to use those facilities. I think there also may be some benefits in terms of HRI and, and legibility there. Uh, that's a good question. So I definitely will say that Roger Federer can hit a fast uh, a serve way faster than this bear way mark can. Uh, so I think we're a little way to go before we eclipse it. But I do wonder 10, 20 years from now, if we actually have robots can play these sports, what will it mean? Well, will we ban robots from sports because it ruins the competition? Should we just have it be organic? I think that's a, a really interesting question that we should explore um, and potentially think about capping things. And that's what NASCAR has done. NASCAR has decided that they basically cap the performance of all their cars so that it's more about the performance of the driver than the vehicle itself. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, in the interest of time, I'd like to hand it over to Guan Yashi, who is a incoming professor at the Robotics Institute in Carnegie Mellon. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, cool. Awesome. Just give me one second. Yeah, hey everyone. I'm very excited to be here, even virtually, to present basically my PhD work, Reliable Learning Controlling Dynamic Environment Towards Unified Theory and Learned Robotic Agility. And first, I would like to quickly share some interesting like new capabilities in agile joint control enabled by my research. The first sample uh, example on the left is called a neural lander, where we can achieve this agile landing maneuver and fly in the drone only a few millimeters close to the ground. The, the, the example in the middle is called neural swarm, where for the first time a heterogeneous swarm can fly very close to each other in 3D. And the last example on the right is called neural flight, where uh, I believe the first time we can achieve like three centimeter level precise flight control in strong time variant wind conditions. And the drone in this video is flying through a very, a very narrow gate. And all these demonstrations are running deep neural network on board in real time with sort of some guarantees and which is supported by unifying machine learning and control theory. And today I will go through like some like methodologies and the philosophy. All right, let's start from the motivation. Like as we know, like deep learning has made a lot of super exciting achievement in many like decision making problems. For example, it can play Atari game much better than human, defeat the world championship of the game of a goal and solve a Rubik's cube using only one hand. Uh, however, uh, for real world safety critical systems, especially agile robotics, it is unclear whether we can directly deploy these machine learning methodologies in the same way as those examples in the last slide. For example, like I want to use deep learning to optimize the design, manufacturing, and operation of our aircraft, but I need some guarantees. This is actually from some aerospace director who visited Caltech four years ago. I think besides transportation, there are many other safety critical examples where we need to be super cautious when applying deep learning. For example, like these operations in risky environments such as subterranean, like off-road, or like this power system control, 
and healthcare robotics and space exploration. And for, for those examples, we really need to think about like what is the right way to, to use the, uh, machine learning. So where are the challenges from? So why we need to be pretty like cautious to use deep learning in this real world safety critical uh, like uh, robotic uh, examples. I think there are like pretty much three main challenge. Uh, first, uh, real world systems always have uncertainty and such uncertainty is like often highly nonlinear and non-stationary. For example, like the, the when uncertainty for the drone. And second, uh, I, I think many real world systems need computational efficiency and trackable implementation uh, for example, here's a very small drone called QuasiFly. I use a lot in my research. It is super small, like only 34 gram. As you can imagine, it is very hard to run like large neural network on board. So we have to consider a computationally efficient and trackable way to implement these deep learning algorithms. And the third, is, the third point, which I think is the most important one, is that safety crew systems need sort of some formal guarantees, such as stability, safety, and the robustness. And however, generally speaking, neural networks are not easy to analyze. For example, this is a visualization of a landscape of a deep neural network. It is very beautiful like Grand Canyon. However, it is not really good for control because it is, because it is so non-smooth and so non-convex. And today, apparently, I will not trying to solve all the challenge, but I will try to present a specific example called a neural control family, which combines deep learning and control theory, trying to give some guarantee for uh, deep learning based control and also with some new capabilities. So we will have the following mixed model for robot dynamics. And the Q is the position of the robot, Q dot is the velocity and the Q double dot is the acceleration. And this is basically the standard Euler Lagrange dynamics model plus the F part, which is the residual dynamics, which we do not know. And this F part is pretty challenging because first it is nonlinear, and second, it is time, time variant. That basically means that it depends on time. And in today's talk, we will, we will like present like three like particular examples uh, around how to learn this F part. Like the first example is called a neural lander. And the question we folks is how do we guarantee stability and the robustness if we use deep learning to learn this like F part? And the second example is called a neural swarm. And the quick, the quick question here is how do we scale up learning? How do we scale up from like three or five robot to like 20 or even more? And third example is called a neural fly. And the key question we wanna answer here is how do we do like fast adaptation across different environment? What if this function F change super fast? Can we like adapt to a new like environment? All right. Let's start from the uh, the first example, neural lander. Let's take a like, the quadrant dynamics as an example. Like, what is the F and what is the black part and what is the orange part in this equation? So actually, the nominal dynamics F is the rigid body dynamics in free space. Like, for example, if the drone is flying super far from the ground, it's not moving super fast. We can pretty accurately model its dynamics by just standard rigid body dynamics. And first, it's pretty simple, and second, it is symbolic. And however, if the drone is moving very close to the ground, there's some interesting aerodynamic effect called the ground effect. And this is pretty complicated and hard to, to model because it's from fluid dynamics. So the idea of this neural lander paper is basically we're trying to use a deep neural network F hat to approximate this like, like unknown residual dynamics F. Uh, of, uh, but of course the question is, if we use a deep neural network, like how do we guarantee stability and, and like, you know, like the performance? So it turns out that the key is to have sort of some control theoretic regularizations on deep neural network, and we need to regularize the behavior of the neural network. And in particular, we consider the following like control law. We have a linear feedback term, which is very standard. We also have this nonlinear feed forward term, which is also like standard, just a little more complicated. And what is really important is we augment this control law by a learned feed forward term, which is basically a neural network trying to composite the unknown dynamics. And we have the following like theoretical result. We actually proved that if the Lipschitz constant of the neural, neural network F hat is smaller than one, then we have this exponential stability, basically the tracking error Q minus QD will exponentially convert to error ball. And in the error ball, we have epsilon. The epsilon is the approximation error between the true dynamics F and the estimation of the dynamics F hat. And the lambda mean k is the minimum eigenvalue of the control gain, which is a constant. And the rho is the time delay, which is not a constant. 
So this result is basically giving you a necessary, uh, like sufficient conditions, like when you can trust this neural network for stability if you use the neural network directly in the feedback controller. I would like to point, point out an interesting like, like thing, like basically like neural network cannot give you this Lipschitz property for free. Actually in experiment, we found that the drone will crash without this constraint. So why? Because without the constraint, we actually visualize and quantify the Lipschitz constant of the neural network is super high. It's like 500 and with constraint and we can constrain the Lipschitz constant to be smaller than one. So basically neural network cannot give you this nice control theoretic property for free. And we have to actively control and regularize its behavior. Okay, and here is the examples like what neural lander can achieve. Uh, and first we can land the drone pretty smoothly. Uh, and then we can have this sort of like circle maneuver super close to the ground. Again, the drone didn't really touch the ground. It's like five millimeter. And I believe it is something super hard to achieve by either standard control method or like DRL method. Cool. And I will br briefly like present the next example called Neural Swarm. And very naturally, if we move from single robot to multi -age, to multi agent system, we need to consider like more like complicated dynamics. For example, in this case, the residual dynamics F is not only depending on the robot itself, it also depends on its neighbors. And more specifically in Neural Swarm, we use like this F to model like aerodynamic interactions between like multiple quadrators. I'm gonna play a video for you. This is a performance of baseline PID controller. As you can see, if, 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 if one drone is flying below the other, it, it has a huge downwash effect, which is basically some aerodynamic effect from the top drone to the bottom drone. It is why in prior, prior works, it require a 60 centimeter gap, even for two robot. And our goal is trying to use deep learning to model this F. And again, the question is how we design a control architecture and how we make sure the learning is scalable. Can we scale up from like three robot to like 20? Due to the time limit, I cannot like present the detail, but basically the idea is we encode very important properties in swarm system, which is called permutation invariance. Basically that the permutation, if you permute like the Jones neighbor, it doesn't really matter. And we design a heterogeneous deep set uh, as a efficient neural network architecture to like learn this like F and make sure it is scalable and also make sure it is stable. And here is a uh, demonstrations. And as you can see from the video, and we can control a 16 robot heterogeneous team. And because like two robots are bigger than others, and we can achieve this like pretty uh, close proximity flight. And the minimum gap between like two robots is just 24 centimeter. And it's like sort of three ring like task. Cool. Okay, I will present the last examples like neural fly. Again, the question here right now is the dynamics F not only depends on robot, it also depends on some sort of unknown environment. For example, if you fly a drone in different wind condition, the C is going to be the wind condition. If you have like a quadruped on different terrain, the C will extract actually the terrain conditions. And for example, like here's a PID controller performance. As you can see, we like suddenly increase the wind condition, the drone is like drifting because it can now like adapt to these changing wind conditions. And it's also because the wind effect is pretty complex and interesting. For example, this is like photo showing some like fluid dynamics called a Kármán vortex drift. All right, so what is the key idea of neural fly? This key idea is called a meta adapt control. So basically we decompose this like unknown dynamics F into two parts. The first part of F is a representation shared by all the environment, by all the wind conditions. And it doesn't depend on C. And the second part A is a latent state specific for each condition. And as you can imagine, we are going to use meta learning to learn this shared representation C. And we're gonna use adapt to control to adapt the last layer or like the linear part A in real time. So essentially meta adapt control is a new interface between control learning. So on the control side, Adapt control is super good at handling linear parametric uncertainty given a good representation. On the learning side, deep learning, which will learn such a representation, kind of translate non parametric uncertainty to be parametric. But the key point to make this framework work is for meta learning, we want to learn a fee which can indeed represent multiple environments. You don't want your fee like overfit to like certain environment. 
And on the control side, we want to design a robust and fast adapt control method can adapt A in real time. So this is like briefly how the learning part works. And first we collect a bunch of data uh, in different wind conditions. And here is like, we basically collect six like wind condition data from like zero meters per second all the way to 6.1 meters per second. And after we collect this like multiple wind condition data, we use a like new algorithm called a dominant adversarial environmental learning, trying to learn a dominant invariant representation phi from this bunch of like wind conditions. And after having this learn phi, we use like online adapt control to adapt this linear part A hat. And we will fix the neural network phi. And due to the time limit, uh, I just briefly present the idea. We have two part in adaptation. One part is prediction-based adaptation, which is sort of like fancy version of a common filter. Another part is called tracking-based adaptation, which is basically a fancy version of integral control. And here is some theoretical result. We can actually prove Again, the, the control tracking error is gonna exponentially convert to error bar. And in the error bar, the first term is like from imperfect learning. And the second term is a standard from adapt control. And finally, I would like to pre uh, present some video. And here we can control a drone and through a very narrow gate uh, in time variant wind condition. In this video, the wind condition is changing over time and drone can fly through a very narrow gate. And this is a tracking figure A trajectory. And then we also did a like circle trajectory and the joints flying through two narrow gates. Cool. And finally, we also did some outdoor experiment and even without motion capture system, this algorithm is still like pretty robust, like in pretty, pretty windy day. And we can have like seven or six centimeter tracking error. All right, I think this is all I want to present today. And thank you so much and any questions. Thanks, Wanya. I think in the interest of time, we might have to move on. I also cool. want yeah. to announce that uh, yeah, Scott Quinn Dersmo sure. will be able to answer Q&A questions during the 10.30 coffee break. So feel free to ask questions then. Uh, so up next is Giuseppe Luiano from NYU and he will present some of his work. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good afternoon from New York. Sorry, I couldn't be there in, in person. And uh, today I'm gonna discuss a little bit about our work on learning safe, adaptive and agile flight uh, control. So first of all, I wanna thank my students, especially Guare and Alessandro where that contributed to most of this uh, work, the work that I'm gonna uh, basically present. Uh, so pretty much there's been a lot of excitement in the area of, uh, you know, autonomy for aerial robots. So we started basically from, you know, flying machines in motion capture system, then, you know, really programs that push the autonomy from several agencies. You can remember probably the DARPA FLA program. And, you know, more recently, we've also been contributing into a, a very difficult task of inspecting a nuclear power plant in, during a, uh, the, the, of the Fukushima inspection. At the same time, there has been a lot of, you know, excitement also in the commercial world. Most of the, uh, you know, research has been translated into uh, really uh, successful products. Uh, going from you know photography to autonomy and more recently uh, to the um, you know we were able to deploy robots directly on mars so the idea is that what is really next so in my opinion what's next is what i call super autonomy so we really want to go much smaller you know really go at really tiny scale still keeping you know the level of autonomy that we have reached at, at, up to now and so being agile and at the same time we want to basically deploy multiple robots together so want to be resilient as well as collaborative so this really you know there are lots of challenges from uh, you know going from perception to action that's you know really slow at the current stage from you know the ability of the robot to uh, interpret the world around them and adapt to uh, operating conditions different operating conditions and also in terms of how you work in terms of collective intelligence. So what are the communication constraints and how do you exchange 
uh, efficient information or you uh, basically try to work in absence of communication. So really this would give lots of impact in several applications going from search and rescue, agriculture, transportation and entertainment. So what are the areas we're working on? We're working on, you know, to solve these challenges in terms of, uh, you know, the area of coupling perception and action, uh, learning, lightweight models and representation and collective intelligence. So today I'm going to pretty much discuss mostly of the learning lightweight models and uh, representation. So we've been working a lot on learning system dynamics. So what learning system dynamic means, you know, we want to learn basically this kind of function H, which is a function of the system state, control actions, and basically of some parameters that we denote with the, with the theta. So why we want to do this in a learning fashion? So the idea is that, you know, you want to be able to address a wide range of operating conditions that often are really difficult to model. You may think about aerodynamics, forces and torques, motor dynamics are what we are using are just basically approximation. You have lots of vibration and at the same time you want to adapt to a really a different system configuration. So this will really enable high performance control. Uh, fast modeling of new system and potentially you can scale to uh, any type of platform. So what is the state of the art in, the, in this area? So we have three main approaches. So one is, you know, nominal system identification. The second one is residual learning. And the third one is model learning. So in the first part, we basically use physics-based principle to model, you know, using classic dynamics, the system. And uh, the, uh, the, so the, the idea is that, you know, we really need to estimate the model parameters to have high performance flight control. And in any case, you know, most of these parameters are just an approximation of what's happening really in, in, the, in, in the real world. So uh, um, it's generally very hard to model these parameters. And, you know, some of them, these equations are just, as I said, an approximation. The second one is residual learning. So, you know, it's mixing sort of nominal system uh, dynamics with, uh, you know, learning uh, based approach in a residual fashion. So you basically add the term that uses uh, like data driven uh, information to improve the, 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 the dynamics of the system. So uh, at this point, and this term is obtained from data. So the, the only problem here is that the relationship between the true dynamics and the complex effects is assumed to be additive and well known. And the third one is basically model learning. So in this case, we really extract the quadrilateral system dynamics purely from, uh, from data. Uh, we leverage, you know, deep neural network and the learning based, the really powerful uh, uh, expressiveness of learning based approach. But the real thing is that can the learned dynamic model generalize to data that is outside the training distribution? So what we've done recently, you know, this is just a summary of the different approach. So nominal is, you know, physically interpretable, it's computationally efficient, but it depends on the system parameters and it's just an approximation of the true dynamics. Residual learning is also physics interpretable. It's offer some flexibility in terms of learning models and you know generally when you collect this data you don't need any labeling it's already ready to be used uh, but you know the problem is that it's uh, um, the physics the physics are used as an art constraint and uh, it's a, everything is assumed to be additive while in the model learning it's you know there is flexibility uh, in terms of expressiveness. It's still self-supervised, but you know the main problem is that can we interpret it physically and can it generalize outside the training distribution? So what we have done recently is you know to model this uh, you know from state control to uh, we we try to model this using uh, an history of uh, uh, states and uh, input. We feed we feed that into temporal convolutions. And we uh, we basically then add the multilayer perceptron to estimate uh, basically all these uh, dynamics. So what we uh, so we use really you know the the third approach that we learn everything from uh, from data, but we want still to give um, you know some uh, uh, physical information to to the system. So how do we do that so that you know the network is not only aware of the data, but it keep the network keeps some kind of um, physical meaning. So what we do is basically we couple the mean squared loss with the physics inspired loss. And so we basically, you know, train 
with the classic mean square error first using the entire data and then we we train using also the nominal dynamics so that basically we don't get too far from the uh, from the uh, nominal system dynamics so this you can think about this you know similar to the residual learning but instead of giving an art constraint in terms of you know the residual process this is a sort of soft constraint uh, once we train in in uh, in in this way and you can see that you know it's much this approach is much more robust for example to the effective prior you know the nominal model if you change the inertia or you change the kf of the propeller becomes you know it's it's uh, it's it's not working well the residual performs better but you can see that the error is substantially reduced in the third column when we uh, when we use these physics inspired temporal convolution uh, approach and What's next? So basically, we get this model that is learned and we feed this into basically a model predictive control that runs in real time on a robot. And, you know, really the dynamics is basically, in this case, a complete neural network that it's exploiting, you know, the, the learning um, it's, um, that gets exploited basically by the, the, the model predictive control approach. And you can see here that uh, if you see the performance of the model predictive control uh, is actually much better using the learn model rather than the original, uh, than, rather than the original one. But can you do more, let's say? Yeah, the answer is yes. So what we basically did is sort of offline learning. So we train over a set of uh, demonstration data previously collected. What we really would like to do is to adapt online. So what to do is to online learning. So to adapt during new, uh, in, uh, with the new incoming data, according to the level of operations that the vehicles is experiencing. But can we do even more than online learning? Yes, we can sort of do active learning so we can also actively select the action to influence basically the learning process. So what we do in the next stage, and this is a recent work we've just you know, submitted, it's available on archive. And what we do is that we basically have the same model predictive control scheme with the neural dynamics. But in this case, basically, we use the predicted action and the predicted state to basically compute a feed forward error. And we online optimize the weights of the neural network in real time. So this really gives the ability to do what is online learning. So you can adapt basically to different conditions. Your model gets adapted, and you can use the adapted, adapted model in uh, uh, you know uh, being exploited fully by the model predictive control. But can you do more? The answer is basically. Yes. So what we did is that, you know, we estimate the network uncertainty and we condition the MPC to the network uncertainty. So that's what we did here. So we choose this matrix Q, uh, QX, uh, basically using the, the network uncertainty. So not only we do online, basically, adaptation, but we also select in a smart way the, the, from the MPC, the act, we select basically what data uh, needs, uh, is used. So the MPC basically is sort of conditioning the data that is used for learning. And we can see that, you know, this is, uh, this is uh, much, uh, you know, it's performing very well. We compare to uh, in the paper also with several technique of, uh, you know, adaptive control. Uh, this is basically when the, the system is experiencing the, uh, you know, a load that has never been seen uh, before. Uh, in addition to that, we have also this other one where we, here we start with four different propellers. So the propellers are not known in advance. So we add them onto the robot and the vehicles automatically adapt. And you can see compared to the static case, the increased basically performance. And then we have the third one that's wind. It takes a little bit more to converge due to, and uh, has a let, let, little more oscillatory behavior due to the stochastic effects of the wind. But you can see that after a while, basically the system is able to, you know, go to the to the real uh, uh, to the to, to reduce basically the the error. So why not doing L1 adaptive control? It's certainly complementary. I'm not saying you should not do it, but solving an MPC in in case you use an MPC. And it well one adaptive, it would correct the it would correct everything a posteriori. So you would solve an MPC with the model that is not correct. In this case, you basically exploit the full uh, adaptation of the model within the, the MPC itself. 
I want to spend the last two, three minutes also to speak about not only exploiting data to improve your model, but also exploiting data to improve the control policy. And this is a work we've been doing, you know, on iterative uh, uh, learning MPC, uh, uh, basically for the last ICRA. And uh, what happens is that, you know, we collect some data at the beginning, and then the robot basically based on the data that is that has been collected try to improve iteration by iteration basically the performance so we really deploy this on a uh, minimum lap time uh, problem and so how do we formulate this basically the formulation is very similar to before so at each iteration we basically solve again an mpc which is su subject to the nonlinear system dynamic with full nonlinear system dynamics actuator uh, obstacle avoidance constraint in case you need and then the initial condition and then the idea is that you know the the uh, end the end state is constrained to be in uh, in in a safety set so the idea is that you know you go in a safe region with your end state but going to this safe region you try to do some kind of exploration meanwhile you get there and so this gives the behavior that iteration by iteration, the robot is really improving the performance. In our case, to do the minimum time, you know, we 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 choose this as a cost function, which, you know, the first one, the first term penalize if the agent has not reached the goal. The second term, you know, penalize the control command magnitude, and the third term minimize the time to go to the terminal state. And you can see in this video that basically iteration by iteration. The system is, uh, you know, at the beginning, we collect some data. So it's the system starts from that position, needs to go to the gate, and needs to be constrained in a virtual corridor. So at the beginning, we, you can either pilot manually or you can run your own controller, including an MPC, and then you can collect basically some data. After the data is collected, that's when the iterative MPC basically starts. And you can see that pretty much iteration by iteration, the system is able to uh, you know, sort of cut curves that that was not, uh, and so learns how to become faster and get to the to the final uh, destination. You can clearly see this behavior if you go toward the end, where we are basically in a zigzag track, and you can clearly see that the robot at the sixth iteration basically start to cut the curves so that it goes faster to the final to the final uh, goal. So just to conclude, basically, you know, we show the possibility to exploit data to learn both quadrotor dynamics and control policy for agile flight, instilling physics laws, you know, facilitate network generalization outside the training distribution. And, uh, you know, we can exploit these into a model predictive control, which improves continuously. And the learn dynamics and policy, you know, can be continuously refined. And in the future, you know, right now we're testing everything in Bygon. So we really want to go toward more on the perception side. So using, you know, noise, even more noisy data and uh, try to deploy in, uh, you know, these in different condition and larger uh, environment. So thanks a lot to all the, uh, you know, agencies that are actually sponsoring and helping the uh, funding the lab. And uh, thanks a lot again for the invitation. I'm open to questions. Um, thank you, Giuseppe, um, for the sake of time, because we are just on time for the yes, next yes. talk. You have to skip to the next person. So next no we problem. have Johannes Bet uh, from UPenn. Um, yeah, please feel free to take over. Hi everyone, you can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. And uh, unfortunately, I cannot be with you, but uh, thanks again for letting me presenting online. So, in the next 15 minutes, I want to share with you my research um, where we focus on making an autonomous car drive fast at the limits. So, in the next 15 minutes, I try to give you a short overview of the field of autonomous racing, where I think we can test AVs, autonomous vehicles on the edge. The first question that arises is the question, why should we drive autonomously on the racetrack? And if you look at the task of racing itself, you see a lot of potentials there. First of all, you see that you need to detect the vehicle limits autonomously. Uh, as a driver, right? You, every time you come to a new racetrack, you need to adapt to yourself. Secondly, you need to make decisions at the limits. What you see here in the middle is an overtaking maneuver at 270 kilometers an hour. 
And number three is handling at the limit. And if you combine all these three problems together and say, let's do that autonomously, you can learn a lot. And that's exactly what we're trying to do in the Indie Autonomous Challenge, which was um, a competition that was uh, enduring for two years in total, where the goal was to fully race with autonomous cars against each other. We had 30 universities worldwide participating, but nine teams ending up with an own race car and writing software for this race car only. The race car is an Indy lights vehicle with a combustion engine. You can buy that car, but it was retrofitted with GPS, radar, LIDAR, and camera, and some high computation, uh, high performance computation power with an Intel Xeon and an NVIDIA. So basically, you have here your autonomous race car that was given to all the teams and now was the goal to write the code for it to make this car drive fast. So now you know what we did in this field of autonomous racing. And now the question arises, how can you write this code and how can you make your car to learn drive fast at the vehicle dynamic limits? In our case, we came up with a very generic idea of a perception planning and control pipeline. But now there's a big difference to a normal autonomous vehicle, especially in the field of prediction, planning and control. There were some newly highly advanced algorithms integrated that made our car in the end drive at the limits of handling and ultimately do some overtaking maneuvers at high speeds. And today in this talk, I want to show you exactly these fields of prediction, planning, and control, and show you what we set up to actually make this car drive fast. The first thing we will have a look to is the prediction. The highest complexity, of course, when we need to correctly predict the other race car's trajectory. Unfortunately, the current only offline trained algorithms are not considering individual driving behavior based on weather, the vehicle type, or in our case, the personal driving style, for example, an aggressive driver. On the left side, you can see our solution to this problem by presenting an algorithm for vehicle trajectory prediction that is using online learning. The fundament is a neural network encoder decoder architecture that is trained offline and predicts the trajectory. What is new here is that the algorithm uses specific vehicle observations during the inference to optimize the underlying offline trained neural network at runtime. On the right side, you can see one of the results by predicting the trajectory of five vehicles here in a street scenario. Based on current observations, we retrain the deep neural network and therefore basically overfit to one specific vehicle and its personal driving style. And with this approach, we can have a long-term prediction of about five seconds and adapt to specific behavior of 10 vehicles simultaneously while only having a processing time of 10 milliseconds per optimization step. And with this approach, it's possible to predict online complex vehicle behavior of other adversarial uh, participants with less uncertainty. With this knowledge, we move on to the next part, to the planning, which in our case is splitting between a global planning and a local planning. The global planning is where we plan our path ahead in a static environment. And in the local planning, we are focusing on a dynamic environment. The global planning is an optimization um, a problem that we solve. In our case, it's an optimal control problem, a nonlinear problem optimization, which has the goal to find the minimum lap time. So this is something quite usual and was done many times. But in our case, we integrated real specific new knowledge. What does it mean? It means that we have a friction, the coefficient between the tire and the car, which we need to predict. In our case, this friction limit gives us the absolute limit. And this limit is presented with exactly this value, the friction coefficient. Unfortunately, you cannot directly measure this friction value. So what you see on the left side is our approach to define this value, which we call the tire performance assessment module. We were using two different software modules for that. Firstly, we estimate the value based on physical models and state estimation and vehicle sensor data. Secondly, we predict the value for the future time steps by using vehicle camera sensor data in a convolutional neural network. Afterwards, we fuse everything together and discretize a so-called friction map. On the right side, you can see the results of this algorithm displayed in a map that has various friction coefficients integrated. 
This value can now be further used in either the path planning, what you see here on the left side, we avoid low friction error. This is very important. But also, we can use that in the velocity planning. And you can see in this image created by my research colleagues that the vehicle is avoiding these low friction areas, and therefore we are driving a safe path, but also a fast path. But a fast path is mainly created by the velocity profile. What you can see here is now two different trajectories, two different velocity profiles on two different setups. One has a constant friction coefficient, and the other one has a variable friction coefficient. So what we see now, if we have this aggregate friction value, we can see a later braking in turn one due to a higher friction. We see a same velocity profile or nearly similar in turn number two, because the friction coefficient doesn't matter here that much. But in turn number three, we see less braking and less acceleration before and after turn three, which means in a low friction area, we need to be much careful. But now we know ultimately how fast this car can drive in an optimal behavior. But this is only a static version. This is a, a theoretical problem. In our case, we want to drive with this car in a real race. So local planning becomes more and more important. Due to the multiple agents, this is a non-convex problem. And we want to have a trade-off between a high quality solution and this global optimum I just explained to you. So what we decided here is to have two approaches. The first one is doing a local search in a graph-based approach, and then we do a re-optimization with a special MPC. So the goal is to drive in all these environments with obstacle around us, no matter how complex it is. And this means for us, we want to have a feasible and a dynamic trajectory that drives the car reliable and safe. On the left side, you see our idea of this so-called graph-based trajectory planner, which is split into an offline and online part. In the offline part, we create a state lattice and then connect each node in this lattice with blinds. This basically creates the graph. In the online part, we now bring everything onto the car. And based on cost values we have created before, the algorithm searches for the, opti for the shortest path. Afterwards, we calculate the final spline for a path and a velocity profile for correct acceleration and braking. On the right side, you can see the final execution of this graph search in a simulation while overtaking another vehicle. What you can see here is that the car is planning dynamically around this vehicle and finally overtaking it right before the turn. This planner is real-time capable and was tested on the car and achieved a velocity of 273 kilometers an hour while having an acceleration of 22.5 meters per second squared. Now we are coming to the final part. We want to control now our vehicle, but because we're using an MPC, we need to have the right model parameters. Normally, we create a physics model of our vehicle, which are implemented with a handful of differential equations. By knowing the vehicle parameters, the vehicle states, and the control inputs, we can estimate the vehicle dynamics behavior in the next time steps. Unfortunately, for cars, we need a lot of parameters that need to be very accurate. And especially when it comes to tire dynamics, this is getting more difficult. On the left side, you can see that in this research, the physical model was replaced with a deep neural network. We were choosing here a recurrent neural network as a main architecture, define a hyperparameters, get the data and the vehicle in different environments to train the network. And what you can see on the right side is that we are outperforming this classical physics model and the new neural network in gray is much better in predicting the vehicle dynamics. These vehicle dynamics we now need in our final part, which is an MPC controller that refines our path. The MPC in this case is so-called tube MPC that can handle uncertainties and disturbances. And by providing this uncertainty tube, we can guarantee that this vehicle by replanning the path and refining the path is actually staying inside the tube. With this, we can guarantee that our vehicle is not going beyond the vehicle dynamic limits, which you can see here in this plot, which shows the lateral and longitudinal acceleration. And all the calculations, everything we get is inside this um, uh, area that defines us the maximum lateral and longitudinal trajectory. This um, MPC is also capable of running at the 100 hertz because the vehicle dynamics are much more condensed in the neural network you've seen before. Ultimately, we wanted to operate at the vehicle handling limits and 
in further or to further handle unmodeled effects and the new system quality, we will try to close the gap between the plan trajectory and driven tra trajectory even more. To mitigate this gap on the left side, you can see a concept that includes a learning control approach on a method of Gaussian processes for nonlinear regression. And this additional algorithm learns online via your driving how big this gap is and then tries to close it over time. We were creating a so-called scale factor, which serves as an optimization variable to maximize longitudinal and lateral acceleration. And on the right side, you can see some of the example results. The plot shows that the learned control error for a standard setup and miscalibrated brake actor, which Mike can happen on the car, and shows here that we can figure out this gap and close it over the time with this um, approach. With this algorithm, we now have the possibility to reduce the control errors while driving and adapting our controller to the environment where we are right now. So now I'm coming to the last part of this talk because now I just gave you the high level theory and the algorithms of how we made this car, uh, bring this car alive. But ultimately it comes down how to verify the robustness and the trustworthiness at 270 kilometers an hour. In our case, we were using heavy parameter optimization over the whole software stack, which runs in a software in the loop um, simulation setup. We evaluate the performance of the car all the time in different racetracks and then do a never grad um, model and parameter optimization for the whole software stack. We were using different simulation environments. For example, this is what you can see here is an ANSYS simulator that was given to us and where we were doing our test drives of the whole software stack. Ultimately, it comes down to how good we are in real life. What you see here is actually in both videos, you can see the exact same racetrack, the exact same vehicle and the exact same behavior. Once in a simulation on the left side and once on the real track on the right side. By defining additional 2D and 3D environments, we are able to create automated software tests and evaluate the autonomous driving algorithms and benchmark their behavior. These simulations are modeled on a sophisticated level, so we can actually draw conclusions for the real world behavior. Finally, all the work I just displayed was tested on the real vehicles to evaluate, verify, and validate the developed algorithms. What you can see here, is one of the first overtaking maneuvers we did with our car. What you can see here is the whole software stack running on this vehicle, doing the overtaking maneuver, unfortunately at a lower speed because this was the first test. But ultimately it came down to one of our last races. And that's what you can see here is an actual race, two cars racing against each other on the racetrack completely autonomously. The blue car is the car from my team at TUM. The green and white car is uh, the car from our opponents from Italy. And this was a very tough race, but actually what you can see here is the whole software stack. I just explained to you the software of prediction, planning and control actually running on this car and then reaching in the end a velocity of 270 kilometers an hour. Unfortunately, this is not the end because we still have a lot of things to learn. Weak dynamics and road friction estimation is very important and especially controlling at and beyond the limits. Ultimately, you wanna work with real hardware and that's time consuming and very tough sometimes, but I think uh, we showed already that it's possible and we will gain more experience with that. One last thought before I end here, because this is about learning, right? This is a robot learning. Um, sometimes I get the question when we race against a Formula One driver. And my answer to that is that an F1 driver is a more sophisticated driver uh, than the normal guy. He learned to race since he's like five years old and stepped up in different classes all the time. And an F1 driver is more than just a person. It has a big company. He has a big company behind them and race engineers he can talk to simultaneously all the time. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to write me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Johannes, for a nice talk. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. We are right on no time worries. for the next talk. Um, Shue Su Xiao from George Mason University will be presenting now. Um, yeah. Thanks. 
Um, we cannot hear you right now. Yeah. Uh, is it good now? Can everybody yes. hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Atil, for the intro. So, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Shishu Xiao, assistant professor with the robotics lab at George Mason, and I'm also a roboticist with Everyday Robots. So today, I'm very excited to talk to you all about our recent work on learning agile ground maneuvers for both highly constrained and also and off-road conditions. So uh, personally, I'm a field roboticist by training. So we work with robots in the field very often, and especially in the context of disaster robotics during my PhD. So for example, we built snake robots to search for victims in the Mexico City earthquake in an autonomous manner. We built unmanned surface vehicle to autonomously drive to drowning victims in the Greece refugee crisis with the help of an unmanned aerial vehicle from the sky. We also built uh, unmanned ground vehicle and aerial vehicle teams for the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster decommissioning task. And the autonomous aerial visual assistant is tethered to the ground vehicle and provide visual assistant feedback to the ground vehicle's tele operator for complex navigation and manipulation tasks. So as someone who works on disaster robotics, so I'm particularly motivated to improve robot agility for those time sensitive tasks, for example, to save human lives. So I'm going to focus on ground maneuvers today only. So the dictionary uh, definition of agility is quick and well coordinated in movement. So agile robots need to precisely coordinate movements within the environment, such as accurately avoid obstacles to no matter how challenging or how adversarial the environment is. So today I will talk about two challenging conditions caused by the environment. So first one is highly constrained conditions where the robots need to squeeze between obstacles. And second is off-road conditions where the vehicle terrain interaction is unknown to the robot. So, but before we dive right into the first challenge, the highly constrained conditions, I would like to first introduce you to the barn challenge and data sets. So an effort from us to benchmark agile ground maneuvers in highly constrained obstacle conditions. So the barn challenge took place at ECRA 2022 last year, so this year in Philadelphia. And it really showed that such a problem is still very far away from being solved, especially when the obstacles are right next to these robots. So the robots need to really squeeze between them. So our barn, uh, the, Barn and Daniel Brown data sets shown here are both open source tools for us to investigate a robot agility in highly constrained conditions. So free for free to use them. And I invite you to participate in the Barn Challenge in 2023 in Accra in London to test out your robot agility. So the line of work to address such highly constrained conditions is called learning from hallucination. So the motivation for LFH is when facing highly constrained conditions, Robots need more computation to draw samples of all perform optimization iterations with classical methods to find agile maneuvers. Or, or it, it can use learning as well to learn such agile maneuvers, but high quality training data is always more expensive to acquire through human demonstration or trial and error using reinforced learning in those highly constrained spaces. So learning from hallucinations inspiration is that robots can comfortably perform a variety of very agile maneuvers in relatively or even completely open spaces. And those maneuvers in open spaces can be optimal for certain highly constrained environments. So by generating or we call hallucinating those spaces, we can acquire many, many training data in order to learn an agile motion plan. So I'm going to briefly go over three LFH methods, but let me first explain uh, them from a very high level with some graphical illustrations. So given a set of obstacles or an unreachable set for motion planning terminology, the robots need to generate a sequence of motion to get to the goal. LFH motivation is to squeeze every bit out of an existing motion plan from previous deployment experiences or from random exploration in open spaces. So if I ask you, does the same red motion plan in the middle also work for this obstacle configuration? Does it work for this one? And also how about this one? So apparently the red motion plan in the middle is feasible and even optimal for all these different obstacle configurations. So the three LFH methods we are going to briefly talk about today are first to hallucinate the most constrained or we call the maximum obstacle configuration during training and also generate a runtime hallucination during deployment. And second is to hallucinate a minimal obstacle configuration and then randomly sample additional obstacles. And the third is to learn the obstacle distribution in a self-supervised manner, which makes the motion plan, the red motion plan in the middle optimal, and then sample from the learned distribution. So a bit more formally, a robot navigates from a current configuration CC to a goal configuration CG without a collision with these obstacles. From the perspective of motion planning, we need to find a motion planner as a function F that maps from an obstacle set to a motion plan. This is very difficult when obstacles are highly constrained and you need to find P with limited onboard resources in real time to enable online agile maneuvers. But for LFH, we investigate the other way around. We are looking for a function F inverse that maps from a motion plan to an obstacle set. So hallucination is actually the inverse problem of motion planning. 
However, one issue here is that this inverse function is not well defined. So you remember all these different obstacles where the red motion plane is always optimal. So what we really want is the set of all these obstacle sets where the red motion plan P is optimal. But apparently this is not feasible because there are infinite numbers of uh, obstacle sets in the set. And so we need ways to approximate such an infinity set. So the first way is through the most constrained unreachable set C obstacle star. So I won't go over the formal definition for the sake of time, uh, but the idea is that the most constrained set is the set that includes all sets where the motion plane is optimal. Then we can train a functional approximator, for example, using a neural network to map from the most constrained unreachable sets to the optimal plan. But during agile deployment, since the robot has only been trained to deal with the most constrained conditions, we need to seek help from a coarse global plan to generate what we call it runtime hallucination to trick the robot to think it is always in the most constrained space and to be extra careful. Then we can query our learned G inverse function to produce agile maneuvers. So a natural question you may ask is, what if a course global path is not available here? And wouldn't the robot be too conservative when the real environment is not that constrained? So the inspiration of our second learning from minimal hallucination approach is that in the most constrained obstacle set, not every single obstacle is required to make a plan optimal. You can very safely drop some of your obstacles and still assure the plan is optimal. Therefore, what we can do is we can identify a minimal enrichable set and then randomly sample obstacles in addition to this minimal set during training. And then we can deploy without this runtime hallucination. We call it hallucinating learning and sober deployment or HLSD. So instead of the most constrained obstacle set, we define a minimal enrichable set for which we cannot remove even any single obstacle without invalidating the already optimal plan. So I won't go into the details again, but just to give you an idea, why would a point mass polynomial robot which locates at CC and wants to go to CG not choose the green straight line, which is obviously the shortest path, but takes a detour through some point CN? It is because of some obstacles. For example, this black line is an obstacle set that blocks the green uh, shortest straight line path and also blocks any shorter path on the, the other side, such as this yellow path. So the other side, CE, will need to be located on the ellipse whose focal points are CC and CG to make sure there's no shorter path than the red optimal plan. As you can see, if you drop any of the obstacles on this black line, you can go through that drop obstacle C and have a shorter blue path than the optimal red path. So you cannot drop any ob obstacles on this black line, and therefore this black line is a minimal obstacle set. So we also developed like approximation techniques to make this um, work on realistic or robots with a actual footprint. So these black little lines are the minimal uh, real world obstacle sets, which must be obstacles. And other places can either be obstacles or they can be free. They don't really matter. Then we can instantiate LiDAR scans based on the minimal set and sample between the minimum and the maximum LiDAR scan values defined by the minimal obstacle set and the optimal plan boundary showing blue here. So we can also bias the sampling based on speed, such as the faster motions of the red motion plan P, we can bias towards the maximum value, and for slower motion, we can bias towards the minimal value. So this wraps up our uh, first two LFH approaches from a very high level. So I have a feeling that you may already get lost at some point, but I don't blame you for that. So it is indeed a lot of work just to manually design and also prove all these hallucination techniques. So motivated just by that, we have developed the third hallucination approach, learning from learned hallucination or LFLH. So this time we can simply learn a hallucination function in a self-supervised manner without manually designing anything. So we use an encoder decoder structure to reconstruct the motion plans from previous deployment where the encoder is learnable, a neural net, but the decoder is a static, differentiable classical motion planner. So we are enforcing the latent space in the middle to be the distributions of obstacles, which makes the existing motion plan optimal. Then by sampling from this learned distribution, we can generate an unlimited amount of obstacles to train a learnable motion planner. So I don't want to go into details for the sake of time, um, while you can find very extensive tests and comparisons of all three hallucination methods, both in simulation and in the real world in our papers. So these videos show the LFH performance in real world cluttered environments. So remember that the robot has never even seen any of those highly constrained spaces before, but it learns to navigate through them by hallucinating on previously deployment experiences during training. Note how close the robot is to the obstacles in some of those frames. So these places will require classical sampling based and optimization based method, a lot of samples and optimization iterations on board until it can find a feasible motion plan. But for LFH, the computation is simply constant and it can maneuver through those challenging spaces without any problems. And if you think designing 2D hallucination is complicated, you probably cannot even imagine how difficult it is to design for 3D, especially for long horizon and for high dog planning. 
But our last LFLH approach is able to learn such 3D hallucination and extend from 2D ground navigation to 3D area navigation. So this wraps up our first challenge. So from highly constrained conditions. So the second challenge for agile ground maneuvers is off-road conditions, where the robots does not know the underlying vehicle terrain interactions beforehand. So high speed, high accuracy, and off-road conditions, three things combined will make ground maneuvers very difficult. So in the second learning inverse kinodynamics line of work, we learn from self-supervised robot environment interactions. So formally speaking, the objective is to navigate a mobile robot to track a reference trajectory during deployment as quickly and as accurately as possible. This is to minimize the cost function J, which includes both total time and accuracy of trajectory execution. So remember, we need to do this on unstructured off-road terrain whose features are now known a priori to the robot. So putting this under a standard uh, closed loop control framework, the encoder takes a uh, desired trajectory as input and output controls to be executed on the robot. So with a forward kinodynamic model, the robot state changes in its state space. However, the difficulty when doing this at high speeds on unstructured terrain is there is also this word state W that will influence the kinodynamic function. And this word state W is unknown before agile deployment and very difficult to model in beforehand analytically. So our approach utilizes an onboard observation function of onboard sensors. And then instead of discrete terrain types, we directly learn an all-terrain model based on the observations from vehicle terrain interaction during deployment. So the robot learns an approximate inverse kinodynamic model. We call it F theta dagger here to approximate the true underlying model F inverse. One critical difference here is while F inverse is conditioned on the unknown word state W, our learned IKD model is conditions on, conditioned on the observation Y. So in the first learning IMU IKD work, we picked the observation Y to be the onboard inertial readings from our AMU to capture the underlying kinodynamic responses. And the vehicle control U for the occupant steering vehicle is linear velocity and steering curvature. So we use the neural network to approximate the learned IKD model. So the last 106 dimensional IMU readings from the last half a second are embedded into a latent space. And Y is our learned observation embedding. Concatenating with the desired vehicle state rate change at delta x from a global planner, the learned IKD model outputs the controls to be executed on the vehicle. So we deploy such a system in the complex off-road terrain you have seen in the previous figure. So there are like cement floor, grass, mud, leaves, tree trees, exposed roots, and or many different combinations of them. So we don't treat them as discrete terrain types, but learn a continuous altering model to cover all of them. So as you can see in the video, even on the very extensive disturbances from different terrains, the robot is still driving at very high speed, but also maintaining high accuracy. So on this off-road track, we experiment with 10 different speeds with three different models. So red is the handcrafted model, um, mostly for homogeneous terrain indoors and also for slow speed. So blue is a model for ablation study in which we use the same training set, but remove the dependency on the onboard observation one. So green is our learned IKD model. So the colored circles at each term from T1 to T8 indicate how many times the corresponding model fails at that term, either collision or getting stuck. As you can see, at low speed, green navigates the closest to the reference trajectory showing black, and the red um, baseline deviates the most. And then with increasing speed, the red baseline becomes less consistent and starts to spread around, while such trend is less obvious at the beginning and only slowly emerges for the blue and the green models. So the smaller size of the green circles also shows a lower failure rate and more accurate navigation. So here are some failure rates achieved by our model in green and two baselines in red and blue, both in the scene terrain and the generalization test in an unseen terrain. So uh, in general, green outperforms both blue and red by achieving the lowest failure rates at different speeds and at different turns. But I want to highlight one point here. If you look at this turn eight, so our learned model actually performs worse than the baseline. This is because when transitioning from grass to cement, the robot tires moves from a low grip, low friction to a high grip area. When you're on grass, the learned IKD model chooses to oversteer to compensate for the low grip. But due to high speed and actuation latency, it ends up oversteer when it just entered the cement as well. But a suddenly increased high grip with oversteer command will make the robot turn too much and collide with the inside wall. Therefore, we will need our observation Y to anticipate future kinodynamic changes, which cannot be simply captured by the IMU alone. So therefore, we have a very recent follow-up work called VR IKD, so Visual Inertia Kinodynamics, where we extract image patches of the upcoming terrain and learn a visual representation space in order to anticipate upcoming kinodynamic changes. Combined with vision, the VR IKD mo model is able to overcome scenarios such as this turn eight in this off-road track. 
So as shown in the video, IMU IKD only uses inertia and deviates too much from the global path at terrain transitions and fails. So, but this VR IKD model is able to anticipate the terrain changes in addition to the underlying IMU chemodynamic responses and can navigate at high speed, but also follow the global path very accurately. So with this, uh, I would like to thank all my collaborators who contributed to building these agile robots in this talk from UT Austin, at, from Texas A&M, and also from CMU, who all contributed to, to we have covered in this talk. So I don't know if, if there's time, but I will be happy to take any questions either now or offline. Um, thank you, Shuesu, but we don't have time for questions. We are two minutes behind the schedule. So next, um, Laura and David uh, from uh, Google will present their work. Um, can yeah. folks hear me okay? Thank you. Yes, we can. Okay. Is there a connector to add it to the screen? I could share the slides if that's oh, yeah. okay. easier. That actually works. Okay, perfect. This is this is one benefit of hybrid presenting. So I am hello everyone. I'm Laura. And while we get set up, so David and I are going to be co-presenting this talk in person and online. Okay, super. So, um, so uh, we've been uh, our talk. So David and I, uh, we both work at Google, and very happy to be here. And we're going to talk about what happens when you're forced to move fast. Lessons learned from robotic table tennis. So we've been working on this problem for a number of years, and we've gone through a lot of struggles uh, and had some successes. Uh, and so at this point, we thought we might have learned some lessons that are generally interesting to the agile robotics research community. Um, and also, I think uh, hopefully this will provide a nice compliment to the fantastic talk from Matthew Gombele, who opened the session uh, talking about tennis. So now we're talking about table tennis. Uh, so with that in mind, um, our goal in the talk is twofold. So, so first to talk about why we think table tennis is both difficult and interesting uh, as a test bed for robot learning research. Uh, and then also to talk about uh, a number of factors that we found accelerated our research. Uh, next slide, please. So table tennis is a hard game for humans to play. And we just wanted to show this amazing rally from the 2008 Olympics, which gives you some sense of the speed, dynamism, and finesse that is required for high level play. Next slide, please. However, if we think that table tennis is a hard game for humans to play, uh, it's even more difficult for robots. And uh, our policies have failed many, many times. Uh, and so we wanted to share a few examples, uh, mostly of hardware failures. Uh, so everything from kind of drifting on the top right to the robot randomly stopping on the bottom left uh, to a very painful paddle re uh, reset where the paddle gets crushed on the bottom right. Uh, we also experience failures from vision where we have uh, false positives and we have very entertaining arm movements when the, ball, the policy ends up chasing hallucinated balls. Uh, and since this is agile setting, when our policies fail, they fail fast. So perhaps you can relate to some or all of this. Next slide, please. However, even though it's difficult, uh, we actually think table tennis is a great test bed for uh, agile robotics research. And uh, the reasons for that is like, a few fold. Um, I guess I'm gonna need David to help me click here. So first thing is that uh, it requires speed, high acceleration and precision. I think probably it's easiest if we just click through all of it and then I can talk to it. So um, to give a couple of examples, a slow ball moves at two to three meters per second. Where and five to six meters per second is pretty common for amateurs. And this by robot learning standards is pretty fast. Uh, so I think this means that it's like a great stress test for the existing robot learning algorithms. 
Further, once the ball is in play, uh, the robot can't react on its own time. It can't start and stop, which means that there's this requirement of like, extended dynamism over a a sort of an extended period of time. It's also a highly structured task. Uh, there's always a ball, always a table, always an opponent, whether that's a ball thrower, uh, a human player, or a robot. And I think this is important because it makes the task tractable. Uh, the task difficulty can also be varied from beginner to expert. So you can kind of build up the difficulty uh, in this quite continuous fashion. And then finally, it naturally involves human robot interaction. So as a result, several research groups have developed table tennis research platforms. They do some really great work. And uh, the, the, we've just put a few examples on the page of um, really interesting projects from these groups. Next slide, please. Uh, and as for us, we've been exploring a few different things. So uh, cooperative, uh, cooperative human robot play. Uh, so this is the project on the left-hand side. And here we were interested in leveraging the power of simulation to develop robotic policies that are proficient at interacting with humans upon deployment. Uh, and then the project on the right, uh, this is, uh, it, and here we were interested in goal targeting. And we wanted to take a kind of minimal unstructured data set of examples and then develop a system that could continually improve on top of that from using self-supervised practice to get better at goal targeting. And with that, I'll hand over to David. All right. Um, yeah, so we've seen a lot of examples of agile robots today. Um, and so we just kind of wanted to go over what that means to us. And I mean, in some sense of the definition, it can just be you know, a robot that moves fast or can react fast or both. Um, but the, the like concrete uh, definitions in our setup are what we've got here. So it's a six degree of freedom robotic arm on top of a two degree of freedom linear actuator. Um, and all of these things are running at fairly high frequencies. And uh, I think as Laura will get into later in the talk, they're all running at different frequencies, which poses lots of fun challenges. Um, so that's the moving fast. And then the reacting fast we have, uh, we use a gym API to do our simulation and in the real world, and that has to run fast as well. So it, uh, we've got it down to like one to two milliseconds and that needs to be fast in order to give us budget to actually run inference and run our policies. Um, so that's what the system kind of looks like, but we got it kind of working. We've got some interesting results and we've learned a lot of lessons along the way. So we kind of wanted to just, you know, share what we've learned, what we've experienced, the, tri the successes and failures and, and get feedback from folks. Um, and so, these are kind of six essential components that we found were really useful and accelerated our research. And those are the uh, safety simulation, accurate and fast vision, processing speed, debugging tools, environment design, and accurate simulation. Uh, and we'll just hop right into them. So the first one, safety simulation. So we saw in the first couple slides, uh, if you've got a really heavy robot that's moving really fast, it has the potential to do some uh, unfun things. And so thankfully we're not in the situation that Matthew is in where he has to avoid, he's working with a human, uh, our humans on the other side of the ping pong table. Uh, but we still don't wanna be smacking into uh, other parts of the environment or the, ourselves. So safety is super important here. Um, and one approach we tried uh, to, to you know, move around safely is using uh, trajectory planners like reflexes, but they were having a lot of difficulty in our system um, you know, constantly replanning at 100 hertz. And uh, in ping pong, you kind of need to constantly readjust. And so we ended up going with a solution where we have a simulator running, where we take our commands that our policy generates, we run them through this simulator, which is PyBullet, and use the resulting um, simulation state to generate the command that we actually send to the robot. So this has a lot of advantages in that it lets us um, kind of join our sim and real uh, environments together, but it also produces a, a useful command that avoids collisions. And the most important part is these red boxes on the side here. Um, we can create these like danger zones where the robot is not allowed to go and the simulation will just naturally keep the robot out of them. And so we've got the simulation, it works great for the robot, but there's another component to our environment and that's the ping pong ball. Um, 
And so in the sim, we know exactly where the ping pong ball is at all times because we can just query the simulator. But in the real world, uh, we have to put in quite a bit more effort because, uh, well, we can't even instrument the ping pong ball because it's so light and so small that any changes you make to it will drastically affect how it behaves. So we have to rely on vision. Um, and so we learned quite a few lessons about that. And just at a high level, one of them is picking the right equipment and the right um, positioning and configuration for that equipment. And so uh, Shimea is not paying me, but these Shimea Shi-Q cameras are what we settled on. They were really nice. Um, they have really low latency and really high frames per second. One issue that we ran in with other cameras is they advertise high frames per second, but really uh, terrible latency. Like you wouldn't be able to get the information out of them fast enough. <clears throat> and another key component to the vision is that you know, we tried working with a lot of standard off the shelf tracker models and they didn't always, they had edge cases that would fail or they could be just too slow to run in real time. And so we just ended up building our own. Um, and there's lots of fun details that went into that whole procedure. Um, uh, I can't go into them right now, but like just to give you a flavor, we're using the like raw Bayer input of the cameras as opposed to an RGB image. And that means we can get um, things a lot we can get the information much faster to the model uh, without having to do any post-processing. <clears throat> and so we can sense our environment really well now um, and really quickly, but the robot also has to respond to it really quickly. So processing speed is also an important thing. If your robot's going fast, your code has to be fast. And the kind of really straightforward, simple solution to this is you know, just get better hardware. And we did do that. Uh, so we bought, you know, some fancier GPUs and magically our vision processing time got cut in half. That's great, but it doesn't work for absolutely everything. Sometimes you really need to get deep into the weeds of the software engineering, understand various trade-offs. Um, we did a lot of benchmarking to identify bottlenecks in our code um, and just kind of understanding, you know, various trade-offs that need to be made. So for example, Python is great for rapid iteration but you can only run one thread at a time because you're, you've got the gill. And so basically the key idea here is understanding the kind of balance between research accessibility and the performance needs of your system and trying to make them both as, as useful as possible. And so now we have a very complicated system with lots of things talking to each other. So inevitably uh, something's gonna break and you need to be able to debug that. And so agile robots make this even harder um, because you know sometimes things can only will only break at when you're running at top speed or something like that, uh, and so you can't just set a breakpoint and like slowly step through the code. Uh, so one of the major major things that we invested in was logging and visualization. So on the right hand side here, you can see a, a visualization that we use to kind of debug our system. Um, so it shows information about the robot state and the vision state and the environment state and all of this get we can step through it as we need and it's really, really useful. So I would definitely encourage folks to log as much data as frequently as possible. It may be a large upfront cost, but it, it, I feel like it definitely pays dividends. And finally, we run um, a lot of regular targeted tests on the robot and this is basically to help us isolate failures. Um, so not only do these tests help us just make sure the robots are running correctly and on time. Um, it, so when we come in in the morning, like we can actually be confident in the tests, but if they're not running correctly, we know at least have some idea of where they're not. So if we have like tests for specific subsystems, and so one might be just running, you know, simple joint position playback. And if it can't even do that, then we know that we don't have to even think about what the vision system, it's gotta be a lower level problem. Um, and so I'm going to pass it back to Laura to talk about the environment. Great. So one uh, of my favorite problems to, to work on here is the environment design. And this, uh, we eventually landed on this consistent API between simulation and the real world. And it's the Jim API, which will be familiar to many of you. And it has substantially accelerated our research for a few reasons. Uh, so first you get much faster sim to real deployment uh, because the, it's transparent to the policy which environment is actually operating in. Um, there's much less hardware specific knowledge that is required to actually test a policy on the robot. So more people test things more often. Um, 
it reduced our sim to real gap because it aligned align things conceptually uh, between simulation and real, the real world. And that's the first step to then drilling down into these different components and making sure that all of them uh, are matching up as much as possible. Uh, and then finally, prototyping and simulation is much more relevant uh, and transferable. And so on the, on the right hand side, we have a, a sketch of what this actually looks like. And uh, in yellow are the components that are simulation only. Uh, in green are the components of the, from the real world only. And the purple is what's shared between the two. Uh, and then we've, David mentioned that we uh, did a whole design, a, a set of design on the different processes that things need to run on. So if you're interested, I just labeled which uh, processes the real world system sits in. And <clears throat> uh, we can, if you're interested, I'd love to talk about this in more detail, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of interesting challenges. Uh, so the first is to actually, like the state machine <clears throat> models the semantic state of the table tennis game. And this is a really core part of our model. Okay, great, I, I'll wrap up quickly. Um, <clears throat> and it, it, the semantic states can be like, oh, the player one hit the ball or the ball just landed on the opponent's side of the table. And it takes in ball collisions uh, as the kind of primary input here. But in the real world, there's no collision detection. Uh, so our solution to that is kind of analogous to our safety simulation, which is we run an instance of PyBullet and pass the, the real world state to uh, PyBullet to handle the collisions for us. Um, there's a bunch of heuristics on top because the real world is noisy, but the output from that is collisions in the same set, the same format that you would get in PyBullet and that can go into the same state machine. Um, the other really uh, interesting, feature is that the simulation is discrete, the real world is continuous. Uh, so how do you make the, a continuous multi-sensor, multi-frequency, as you saw, real world look like a discrete, uh, the discrete simulated input that the policy expects? And so our solution to that is to take periodic interpolated snapshots of the real world. And so the data interpolation kind of component handles that for us. Uh, and so that way the, the real world policies get to um, the input from the real world kind of looks like this discrete simulated world. I was going to talk about accurate uh, simulation, which is the kind of last component um, of, of our talk, but I think this is already pretty familiar. And so to probably everyone in this room that there's a lot of challenges here. Uh, there are some additional challenges in table tennis. Uh, however, um, it would be great to chat about this with you offline. So maybe David, we can skip through to the conclusion. All right. So yeah, uh, just to wrap it up real quick, uh, agile robots have very unique challenges and there's no like simple way of, there, there's no like predefined way of, of implementing a an agile robotic system. We've identified several components that were key to our system, but we really want to understand, um, we want to like start this conversation. like. Are you experiencing similar challenges? Are there challenges you know we haven't even begun to face that you are, are dealing with? Um, did we do something really interesting that you want to talk to us about? Or did we do something that you need to correct us about and we're not doing it correctly? Um, or yeah, we just kind of want to start this conversation about like what is the right way and what are the, the challenges that folks are still facing? Um, these are the contributors to our project and uh, thank you. Thanks, Laura, David. And just uh, before the poster session, uh, Scott is, should be able to have a few minutes to have some Q&A. And we also have a short announcement for the poster room position. There are going to be 036 and 038B. Right. So for those who need to set up the posters, those are the two rooms. And given that, let's see if Scott is back online. Hey, Scott, are you there? Uh, yep. Is my mic working? Yes, that's perfect. Great, great. All right. I'm pretty sure, you know, after seeing the amazing demos in the morning, there will be, be a lot of questions from the audiences. So here is the chance for you to ask Scott. And Scott ha does have to leave in maybe in like 15 minutes. So, you know, keep in mind of that. All right. Cool. Um, thank you, Scott, for the awesome talk this morning. So my question is regarding the the models for like barbells and this. So when you showed like the the robot does all that and you include that in your MPC. So are you kind of doing like some sort of modeling in this abstract like object space 
uh, and then that's how scalable is that if that's what you're taking if not what is the approach that you're taking yeah so in, inside mpc right now every object is approximated as a single rigid body so um we have uh you know a more descriptive geometrical and you know mass uh including mass parameter representation used for things like um, grasp library generation and so on but inside of mpc really only knows things like an, an object coordinate frame and some inertial distribution around that and then some um, object frame relative grasp points that it's trying to um, attach to i see cool thanks Hi, Scott. Thanks for the very inspiring talk this morning. Uh, I have an, another question. So I think you remember in your talk that you, you, you show that MPC can adapt to a lot of things. You can adapt to like a, a backflip from like a 30 centimeter high step to a like in-place backflip to like carrying, a, carrying some obstacles. But like, what do you think is like, so like, but on the other hand, then you also require a reference trajectory that's very precisely defined offline. So what do you think is the job of the predefined like, offline trajectory and what is like, the benefit of MPC? And, what, and more generally, what should we design offline and what can be adapted online using the state-of-the-art algorithms? Yeah, it's a really interesting question and it's hard to give a, a single answer to it. Um, there are some general observations here. So it, it, for behaviors that are really riding like many of the physical limits of the robot, um, it the sort of quality of the reference and the having it match MPC is pretty important unless you're able to put enough of that those limiting um uh, limiting features into MPC itself so that it's able to reason around them um so for you know some behaviors I didn't quite have in my talk but like some other kind of like gnarly or multi-axis flipping type things that we've done um those tend to ride some of the limits like the back like yaw rotation joint analysis in particularly strong and so really threading the needle there is pretty important and the robot just doesn't have a lot of margin to generalize that behavior too much um but for a lot of things that are you know much more useful than that like just running around an environment and like you know crossing gaps and walking outside and things like that um, I think that we've seen the ability of MPC to kind of generalize a relatively sparse library for these things to be pretty good. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Any questions from the audience on this side? Okay, here. Uh, just a question regarding like seem to real, because uh, since on Atlas you have, you both you do both, both manipulation and also locomotion. Like, where do you see like the biggest issues with seem to real? Is it more like the manipulation side and like you know throwing like objects around or more on like the the contacts that you're making while running around and jumping? Like, what do you see as the biggest challenges there? Yeah, I think a, a lot of the sim to real transfer for mobility is actually pretty easy. Um, we don't see like a lot of real challenges there. Uh, manipulation is definitely more challenging and again the details matter right so if i'm you know picking up a barbell then doing that in simulation is not that different probably than doing it on, on the real robot but if i'm you know doing a conforming grasp to some you know complex object where the details of getting that grasp right really matter and you've trained a grasp strategy in a simulator and you're trying to run on the robot then yeah that can actually be quite hard and i think this reflects you know basically people's experience in the in the broader community too so i really don't think we have anything that's like you know particularly um groundbreaking in our ability to do sim to real transfer um but we definitely do feel like we're able to successfully leverage simulation uh, on all the ways we develop behaviors for atlas or for spot whether they're totally learned policies or um behaviors that we're sort of developing through more model-based techniques thank you I have a question regarding the long-term outlook that Boston Dynamics has in balancing MPC or optimal control approaches with reinforcement learning. It seems like they both have their pros and cons. Um, and it seems like Boston Dynamics has leaned very hard into the optimal control route. I'm curious going forward, if you think reinforcement learning based approaches will start to 
become more prevalent in your stack, or do you think there's always going to be a predominant place for optimal control in Boston Dynamics? Yeah, it's a little hard to predict. I, I mean, I, I don't see any reason why control is is sort of special and you know and different than other other areas where we've seen you know large models and data driven techniques start to just become the state of the art. Um, I think there's a this sort of more challenging data problem here, and so there's maybe just a question of time constants of when things to become more and more data driven, and whether that happens sooner or later. Um, I think the questions we're sort of grappling with right now is they're a lot more pragmatic. So we're interested in RL as a um, an efficient way to do engineering development of behavior for robots. And so what does that mean? That means maybe it's we're able to um, create behaviors that would be hard for our engineers to design or manually program solutions to. So it's kind of a different way to program. Um, so I think there's opportunities there. Um, and you know, or or maybe if it is something that we could program, but we don't want to have you know smart engineers spend weeks toiling away at code, and we can set up the circumstances for an RL uh, agent to solve some subcomponent of a what is an otherwise model based control stack. I think we're really interested in that as well. So I think short term, we're we're finding the right ways to let RL exist within an ecosystem where there's already quite performant controllers. But long term, it's it's sort of hard to predict, and I wouldn't be terribly surprised if uh, you know learned components start to subsume more and more of uh, control stacks. Gotcha. I guess one follow up question to that is the new AI Institute uh, that I think Mark announced a while back. Is that still going to take a predominantly robotics or optimal control route, or will it be learning heavy? Um, I think that they're interested in a, in having a broad research portfolio. I should say that I'm not really um, associated with the AI Institute. I, I'm still at Boston Dynamics proper, but my understanding is that they're, uh, you know, kind of going to have a, a broad look at, you know, I think looking at a lot of learning approaches um, and how those could be used to improve robot behavior. I don't think that they're starting from a point of view of, uh, you know, a particular set of techniques as being the kind of core of their work. I think they're taking a bit broader and longer term view in their work. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So Scott, I have a question about the manipula manipulation part that you show. So right now is manipulation behavior hard coded or is it optimized through MPC? And do you use any kind of contextual sensors for that part? Yeah, so we the robot has uh, six axis force torque sensors in its wrist. Um, the, in the videos I showed, it has pretty rudimentary hands. They're basically like super strong claws that we use to grab big, heavy things. Um, and uh, so the manipulation behaviors that you saw are largely coming about online. And the way that we're um, specifying them to the robot are in terms of um, you know object relative grasp strategies. And so the robot has to detect and localize the object online using its perception system um, and then be able to find, you know, kinematically feasible ways to grasp within known feasible grasp regions. Um, and then these get fed in as inputs to MPC, which are in the form of um, either world relative or robot relative end effector goals. Um, and then there are planned transition events when the robot becomes sort of attached to the object. And then the MPC dynamic model changes because the robot now is in uh, working in concert with some potentially heavy object that it has to reason about. So um, a lot of the details of the motion that you saw in the videos I showed is, is really arising purely out of the MPC um, and the ways in which the manipulation tasks are being specified uh, is, is relatively sparse in terms of things like you know grasping and moving objects to um, uh, desired poses and things like that. Cool. I think, you know, one question a lot of people are interested in when they see the Boston Dynamic video is like, okay, you shot a successful video, but is that like one success out of 10 failures or you have a mm -hmm. relative pretty high success rate for all the things you've shown like 90%, 95%. So what's the yep. reality of there? Yeah, I, I think for the the um, all of the manipulation ones specifically, I would guess those are sort of in the 90th, 90th kind of percent thing. Um, when we would tend to see failures, I could tell you what a failure might be. Um, so that could be 
something like we have calibration drift in the robot and um, its hand isn't quite where it thinks it is and it like smashes its fingers into something, right? Like this is the kind of failure that might happen occasionally. Um, or, you know, the, the the gripper sort of like slides in a weird way as the ro robot's running around or whipping around and um, the object state estimate isn't quite right. And like the robot starts to go lopsided while it's carrying the barbell, right? These are the kind of things that happen and, uh, you know, we're sort of working on it. Um, for behaviors like at this point, like backflips, I would say the success rate's like 99%. I would, I would estimate we ran that behavior like uh, hundreds of times in the past year, just for people coming through the lab and things like that. That's not really um, that challenging to, to, to do anymore. Um, but I think these sort of more like interactive perception driven things that involve objects in the world. I think there's lots more room for error and that's why it's an exciting research problem to focus on. Cool. Do we have more questions? Okay, so one. Hi, Scott. Thanks. Really fascinating stuff. I was wondering about the MPC part. So it used to be a problem to um, optimize through the contact switching and so on. And, and you guys seem to have no problem with that at all. So maybe you can sort of tell us what is the, what is your approach? Is it soft contact models or how do you, and then what kind of optimizer yeah. actually using to do that MPC thing? Right. So in our, in our case, the contact sequence is always given to MPC. So um, that is coming from like that planning problem assembler block somehow, right? Uh, the MPC has full ability to like change time constants associated with each contact event and things like that. So it's it's actually quite flexible, but the robot's not uh, coming up with contact sequences inside of MPC in our implementations. Got it. Thanks. All right. It looks like so. That's pretty much the questions here. And we thank you so much, Scott, for being flexible and then staying uh, like later here. And let's just uh, thank Scott again. My pleasure. Thanks everyone for the questions. It was fun being here. Wish, uh, wish I was there in person. All righty. And so I think that will conclude all the talk sessions, uh, the, the, the first set of talk session in the morning. And our next talk session will start about in about 12 minutes. Yep. So we'll start sharp at 11 here. And so we still have a couple of minutes for people to, you know, grab drinks and yeah. Yeah. The poster sessions. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, uh, welcome to our second keynote. It is uh, with great delight that I am introducing Jan Peters, who I'm sure actually needs not really much of an introduction to anybody here, but still, uh, I would just like to give some details on, on Jan. So he's a full professor of the Intelligent Autonomous Systems at the Computer Science Department of TU Darmstadt. He's also the department head uh, for the research department on systems AI for robot learning at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, he has won many different awards, uh, including the uh, RSS Early Career Award and the Robotics and Automation Society Early Career Award, as well as, uh, and as, well as a number of best paper awards. His research is wide ranging, and he has also uh, nurtured a number of outstanding young researchers uh, in his um, role as an advisor. And so with that, I am delighted to hand it over to John. All righty, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, yeah, today really made me feel, well, old actually. Um, I saw so many problems again, which I've seen before, and it's kind of, yeah, amazing to see. So let me start with something even older. So this year is the first ever robot commercial. And it's the one thing which, despite that it's not very agile, it actually makes me always super embarrassed when I'm telling anybody that we are doing robotics and we're doing robot learning and um, we are hoping to well actually make robots well bring robots to the capability of humans now back then they had the excuse of course that these things were bulky they were expensive they had little computation um, and well they had very very bad sensing but at the same time like well, most of this stuff, um, which we need in robotics, was there in the, in the labs in the 1960s. 
And in fact, even machine learning to some extent um, was much more ready back then in, in robotics and much more present back then in robotics than we actually think today. So if you look at imitation learning, the first approaches were applied to robots in the 1960s already. So this makes you super embarrassed, especially when you see how society has moved on. We are not, it's so anachronistic to see that couple um, in the, that form. And we are nowhere close to having these robots instead. Um, but yeah, well, that's, I think, the really important thing to first of all realize. And it's, it's kind of, of sad because, well, we have been promising that we can change this all with robot learning for, well, quite a while. And I think we've made our life too easy. So, I mean, first of all, I think classical robot engineering for well, doing online motion planning, whether you call it MPC, whether you call it it's um, just online replanning, it's, it is, works really, really good with analytical models if you um, do the right kind of adjustments to the models, if you have actually created the proper simulator. Well, in robot learning, we typically would have to, well, refer to lots of expensive data. And here, this shows my very first robot learning experiment in my life. Um, actually, not actually one of my first, my first reinforcement learning or experiment in my life. And um, well, putting a ball on top of that stick that in the T-ball scenario, that is actually well, spending down, I don't know, several thousands of times. Then basically, well, if you can learn in a robot simulator, well, you don't actually need robot learning. You don't need reinforcement learning. You don't need imitation learning. We can actually, again, revert back to robot engineering. So the whole sim to real question for me of, in terms of saying, oh, well, we, we should just have a good simulator and then create the data, again, seems to be flawed big time. And well, it wasn't mentioned today so far, but things actually break in robotics. Um, and especially when you're talking about high speed, it robotics and well whenever you need high speed perception whether that is actually in table tennis or whether that is just during re-grasping an object well this is really really hard right if you look at all the amazing insights from gel sites and in tactile sensing they have the exact same problem we had in table tennis and it was really actually quite amazing to hear from and Laura's and David's talk a moment ago that you were again talking about exactly the same issues about ball tracking which we had already in 2007 where we implemented the first um, ball tracking system for table tennis on a, on a GPU back then which we had to do hard coded in CUDA which was very very painful and it is just incredibly hard to do this and it appears pretty much all over. Again, another point which I'm I'm totally missing always from the discussion is that generalization is actually not so straightforward when it comes to motor skills. So there's a really amazing motor to, um, uh, well, human motor control person who actually can uh, explain to me at one point really, really well why, how, why for humans, golf does not actually really help hockey and that generalization in, among human skills is actually very, very poor. And it's something I've also seen whenever we've designed the robot learning system that, well, that kind of generalization from even from um, just going from table tennis to squash in badminton was actually not straightforward at all, and which is one of the reasons why we never ended up uh, doing more squash or we did only very, very little badminton in the end. And then finally, well, most of our learning algorithms are not actually tuned in for real time. Quite on the other hand, we are quite limited by, well, if you want to have onboard computation and well, computer, I mean, all kinds of communication energy limitations. So in other words, I don't think that robot learning is such a straightforward solution. Instead, I think what we really need to figure out is, well, what are the right um, robotics inductive biases? So let's remind us quickly what inductive bias is. Inductive bias allows a learning algorithm to prioritize one solution or interpretation over another, independent of the observed data. Inductive biases can express assumptions about either the data generating process or the space of solutions. 
And for us, that basically puts in the big question, well, what inductive biases from robotics do we actually want to uh, use? Which ones are, are offered and how can we actually use them to improve robot learning the best? And so my outline is rather straightforward in this talk. I'm going to talk about six inductive biases. And the first one is, I think, well, pretty much obvious to anybody but in this audience, but, and Matt also mentioned in his talk, imitation learning is, of course, is always considered always easier than reinforcement learning. And on paper, that is actually true, since Michi and Chambers came up with the first model-free behavior cloning, which basically boils down to matching your, your state action distribution with a policy in a state distribution in a completely model-free way without any constraints. So just treating it as a maximum likelihood problem, basically. It already in the 1960s, these were the boxes-like approaches. And in the 80s, that was already the, well, popularized by Samut and, and many others. And, but actually bringing in constraints then is a relatively new um, approach. So I would mention Peter Engler there especially, but you could also mention um, works like the Dagger approaches and such kind of things from coming from Drew Bagnall's lab. Weirdly, we have focused so much on the dual problem to that, so the problem of inverse reinforcement learning, um, which in general may not actually be such a good thing to do because the dual is, if you read up in Putaman, guaranteed to be harder than the primal. It only makes sense to do the dual if you bring in, again, additional knowledge, like, for example, minimal physics. And that could give you things like motor primitives. Now, we have developed, I think, altogether 11 different table tennis um, learning systems. And the last one, which actually had very nicely uh, integrated both perception and action into one learning framework, was done by Sebastian Gomez Gonzalez. And um, he actually managed to learn in the nearly learn the whole left or whole right half of the table from just six demonstrations um, by well um, by just using imitation learning with no further uh, reinforcement learning needed and with a performance uh, as well, which was better than any analytical player we've developed as well as any other learning player. And by directly using the, the primal program in this form here. Yeah, but in, in this form, but then with the right kind of EM algorithms and, and assumptions onto it. Now, that obviously brings us back to, well, reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning, well, we already directly recognize is actually an ill-posed problem, right? We are actually dealing with something which in its nature, if you write it down as the optimal control optimization problem, well, does actually not contain any notion of data. So you have to you have to go through one of the duals, like either the value function with the Bellman principle of optimality, which is actually the true Bellman equation, or you have to go via the um, we have to go via the RL for linear programming formulation, and thereby then extract the right kind of value function formulation. Weirdly, well, given that it has no real data in there, uh, we have to typically fall back on heuristics to then take either the our, well, the primal program of from our linear programming or the Bellman equation and, um, well, fit it with the data. This And this no natural notion of data, well, that obviously brings us to my first inductive bias. Oops. We should always stay close to our training data not for two reasons. For one reason, it makes combines imitation with the reinforcement learning, but also it gives us the wonderful technical uh, details. Since, well, if you have imitation learning and reinforcement learning, the, some of the constraints are redundant, and you can actually move the objective into an additional constraint, which is which basically objective from behavioral cloning and to, <clears throat> into a constraint. And voila, you actually get a program which has a notion of data in it. And 
it is actually a generalization of a lot of algorithms we know very, very well, which you can all derive from that perspective. So ranging from SAC over entropy regularization, natural policy gradients, NAC TRPO, they're all basically either approximations patients or the, the original thing. Now we came up with this program and we actually discounted it for a long time before we actually made it work on real robots. We made it work then on, in um, around 2000, 2007, 2010. And it turns out that when you want to learn juggling, it still is actually best to take the formulation which were from back then. And well, Kai here, he made juggling work right out of the box. And um, he actually made it, made, he's actually done a pretty amazing thing. Since in one-handed juggling, in, he learns from, well, 56 minutes of robot experiments and he can juggle afterwards for 30 plus minutes without a failure. After that, we typically turn off the Barrett WEM because the cable drives start to overheat it when, because you're relatively close to the eigen frequencies. Now let me fast forward a bit. Here you basically see that all the different parallel rollouts results give you you equally good performance. Now I asked Kai back when well when he showed me this results live. If so, what about um, so what about using both arms? And I expected him not to come back within the next uh, I don't know month or two months or something. Instead, I find on this video in my inbox the absolutely next day. So that gives us our first inductive bias. Let's stay close to our training data. The second inductive, second point is, if you talk again to a human motor uh, control person, they will actually tell you that either they will tell you movement is generically composed out of strokes, or they will tell you that movement is either composed out of strokes and uh, um, or rhythmic behavior. So, if you take that into account, well, you recognize, of course, that when you're doing robot learning, you really want to record one very very long demonstration and um, then have the learning system do the complete rest of things. And Rudy Lutikov was actually the one PhD student in my lab who drove this the furthest. He took the robot by the hand. He showed it a very well, showed it a game of table tennis. And then he took this one single long uh, modular trajectory and well, Turned did an over segmentation first, and then using an EM based algorithm and learned well both a movement primitive library as well as as a probabilistic a probability distribution over all the potential trajectories you could generate from that. So that brings me to well, kind of my second inductive bias, since we should use this modularity for generic. Should we should try to extract obviously the modularity from the data and use the modular policy structure for composition and not a monolithic uh, uh, kind of policy structure. Now, in the moment where you get a modular uh, control policy structure, you get something you see many times, and that is that you typically have a gating network, like in a mixture of experts, uh, it's like approach where you would select many different options, unlike. The options in reinforcement learning, you don't exit them randomly, obviously, but you have to do this in a very safe way. And you can take the program from before and, well, do the one step again or do one step more now and introduce the options in there. Now, this is a naive extension of that learning algorithm, but it turned out that, well, it sufficed for us to learn table tennis and that included back then even opponent observations already and um, well dealing with many different strikes now, obviously being nailed to the ceiling is a much much harder problem than and, well if you can sidestep like a human being so i'm really amazed by the that people are finally like at Matt and Laura and David, that you're all going for mobile bases and thereby you will only need very, very few strokes, but you can optimize obviously much better. Now, when it comes to, unfortunately, the naive approach of just plugging in your different sub policies, well, you end up with a huge problem that learning algorithms typically 
don't want to specialize is if they can get reward either way. So Chris Daniel came up with the idea of basically saying that we should force our motor primitives to for a limited responsibility by, well, bounding the entropy of the gating network. That gave us actually a much higher performance one more time and uh, the ability to reduce the number of, of primitives in a very principled manner. So second important um, uh, bias, second important inductive bias, we should really always try to go for modular policy structure for composition. And well, then of course, at some point, you always need models. And in robotics, we know models can be very, very powerful, but errors in models are nearly always exploited by reinforcement learning algorithms. And my PhD student, Michael Luther, who's now at Boston Dynamics, I just re recognized him on Scott's slide. I was happy to see that. Um, well, he really explored this, this whole area of, well, how can you well, use learned models? How can you learn models in the right way? And he, he found basically the two most, um, well, the, the, the two best ways of balancing between, well, between uh, phys a pure physical model and, well, minimal physics assumptions. One of them was the differentiable Newton Euler algorithm and with the learned components in it and where he well did a pure offline learning and well you now compare um in comparison to black box models on the right and well nominal uh, a nominal model on the left you basically see that it extrapolates to unseen states much much better and that the well that you actually can deal with the transfer to different string lengths and new scenarios is even um from just four minutes of data babbling, which is, I find, pretty amazing. Now, Michael really explored the whole space between on the far right, a black box model, which has no physics in it, and on the far left, um, a, model learning, a model engineering approach, as any of us has learned in their engineering education. And I think the, I think he is, he is by now, he, he figured out the two delimiters on the perfect solution, since either you want to have really well that you have at least Lagrangian physics in it, ideally Newton, Newton Euler based physics because of um, the well, efficiency in it. And, um, but well, in between you're at the lowest, um, the lowest number of assumptions which you can place um, into the scenario of modeling learning. So, another inductive bias for us, please use physically consistent models and integrate them properly into your learning process. Now, that's typically not enough in simulation because there's a lot more wrong about simulation um, and training and simulation. One of the worst things about training and simulation is the simulation optimization bias. And that bias basically says that the true solution is guaranteed to, well, be underestimated by the optimal solution from the sample. So the, optimal, the estimator is always going to think it's going to do better than the true solution. Um, with the result, on the, uh, which is a very easy intuition, in since basically if you make mistakes, it can easily push you out of the, um, out of the zone. And, and well, you're, you can, you're always guaranteed to maximize when you have a mistake. So we're guaranteed to be wrong. And well, Fabio could show very nicely that you can actually figure out algorithms that um, quantify how big that SOB is, and um, that they that you can compute control laws, which are in fact um, dealing with the various kinds of. So this is always a ball, but the uh, always a ball, but it's a table tennis ball filled with different things like paper clips, paper sand, um, some kinds of tiny balls. And um, the control law is robust against any of the potential fillings, despite the, co the complex dynamics behind it. And he also made it work um, for pole balancing in, and well, many different um, kind of poles. 
So that brings me to the second part here. So second active bias falling out of making models work. Well, if you want to use a model, you need to really control your optimization bias. Now that and allows me now to go for one more thing. And I think I'm talking to, well, I guess I'm talking to just you know, to 30 roboticists, I believe in the audience. Um, I think you all know the fastest way to destroy a robot system is by exploration. And in fact, I think the first person I've met who, uh, the person I've met who did his first, any form of, of reinforcement learning on a real robot once told me that um, he was always asked when he came out of the cellar to, after his experiments, the first question was, how many parts of the robot do we have to repair this time? And that guy was actually called Winfrey Ilk. And um, well, the fastest way to destroy a robot is by exploration. So what do we need? We need safe exploration. And uh, my current PhD student, Puzulu, and my uh, postdoc, David Tateo, actually figured out one really important part, and that is that the objective in reinforcement learning is typically not actually so important when it comes to safety. It is, it is actually the constraints from the robotics problem um, where the difficulties are typically hidden. and to some extent, rightfully so. So what should you do if you want to do safe robot learning, especially in agile and high-speed robots? Well, you really would should use these constraints to direct your exploration. And um, now they figured out a very, very cool algorithm. They basically figured out that you should construct a constraint manifold and then on this constraint manifold, you need to determine the basis of that, that manifold, of the tangent space of that manifold. And if you have these bases, well, you can actually safely sample to safe exploration in the tangent space with just a tiny curvature correction and an error correction in order to maintain staying on the safe manifold. Now, this gives you a safe learning process, which you can do at pretty high speed. In fact, um, I'll show you the real robot experiments in a second. They only created one hole in our table 10, in our uh, air hockey table. And they did pretty cool, different um, kind of movements. So the most amazing I find down there, um, the, how can I, yeah, the dynamic hitting, hitting down there, since, that is something I could not, I'm pretty sure I could not pull off, nor could any of my PhD students or postdocs pull off of hitting a ball first from the, in, the side really fast and then hitting it while being uh, poked, not an air ball, uh, while being in motion. So these are all learned behaviors from that safe, um, if reinforcement learning approach. And you can even spot, if you look um, for the dark spot, that's the where the puck is at at the moment at the dynamic hitting. That's the one time they actually destroyed, the, well, made a hole into the table and we had to glue it up together again. So that brings me to one last part. And I found it so amazing today because, um, well, um, seeing Laura's and David's work, I was reminded of a talk I gave in 2012 in Sydney on robot table tennis at RSS. And I basically said that there are three big problems for table tennis left. One is the workspace is too limited. One are the arm accelerations are too low. And one is the limited reaction time. Now the limited reaction time is actually, well, to pretty much solved, at least if you play with humans because Ji Kun Wang managed to very nicely then predict how well, humans play ball, uh, table tennis balls. And therefore we can, we actually get a, well, we get enough time that we can choose between a forehand and a backhand and optimize the trajectory. Even before the human has touched the ball, we can already predict whether it's gonna be a forehand or backhand sufficiently accurately, just from the human movement. So problem three is, was already, well, it was already solved. Um, but at the time of, of that RSS. But um, the first two problems were the things, well, I had planned and well, you know what is plans change. Um, so we didn't work on problem one um, of um, using the multi-axis system, but we are much rather focused on problem two. 
and that is the one of the arm accelerations since if you look at it well at the Barrett Wham as a robot which we have which is nice for high speed movement and high acceleration movement because it's cable driven and doesn't have gearboxes but nevertheless has a two kilogram wrist for example and is generally too risky too bulky for agile high speed movement um while if you look at the at david's and, and laura's robot well, you directly see basically that it has gearboxes um it's an, it has an abb a classical industrial robot and well gearboxes are also again for high acceleration so well, mechanically a really really bad choice so we basically start to focus on problem two and it gives i think a very very important it, it comes with a very very important bon mot from which any sports teacher will tell you whether it's skiing whether it's table tennis and any agile movement they will tell you let your body go with the flow and that means you also should build the best bodies for learning. And uh, well, my PhD student Dieter Büchler and I, we well, I've, I think I designed the first robot of that type already in 2010, but that we never got to high performance. And then Dieter sat down and he really got we created the high performance version of it. So a robot with really high accelerators strong actuators and very very small moving masses and antagonistic actuation so that you both can prevent damage for to the robot so that you can go out of the room and um and actually let it go on learning without having to worry about it hitting itself or its environment since if it hits it it's fine but at the same time, you also have compliance and you can actually create catapult like like accelerations, which are much, much higher. So you really build a robot for performance and not for feedback control. Now, Dieter and also the, our master's, the master's student of ours, Simon Guist, our back then master's student, he's now a PhD student. Um, well, we started to learn then table tennis with a act with a muscle-based setting. And why is this not okay so one important part is we tried to bring in a minimal amount of simulation since we really didn't want to uh, collect balls again um with the result that well you see here the simulated ball with the real robot but so this very lightweight but muscle actuated robot and um let me fast forward here yeah um, here for highlighting, there's a copy in sim this, this, in this here is not simulated, that is real, but the ball is simulated. And um, well, real ball trajectories are used, but um, well, the, tra the training, the movement, me, the movement is initially starting with motor babbling, so not even imitation learning. And well, the robot sometimes accidentally hits a first ball. It keeps moving, it keeps moving, and well, after a few hours, you actually see then proper hits where it starts to return balls to the other side. And well, after 14 hours, and um, yes, you actually get proper returns to the other side. And it even works nearly out of the box, so only with a very, very little additional training on the um, with a real ball. And um, well, here you see the performance. And if you, well, you can actually get it that well that it, let me go for, oh, this, this is twice. In, okay, you can go for smashes and all kinds of balls. So let me just highlight in the end um, the, the highest. You can really get re really high speed balls that way need to be returned and actually the finest strokes i have so far seen from a robot table tennis system so that gives us the last um, inductive bias and that is that you should really let you the natural dynamics of your robot be involved in the learning process we really need to build robots to have high performance if you want to be agile instead of um, building robots well, just instead of just taking off the shelf ro if robots and um, then let the natural dynamics of these robots guide the learning process so our conclusion 
here are six important inductive biases and well i thank you for your attention and sorry if i went over time oops thank you thank you so much dan uh do we i think we have a few minutes for questions is are there any questions from the audience um so a quick question, Jan. I think in the first slide you just said something like, if you use simulation, you don't need RL. Uh, I, I didn't yes. really fully understand. <clears throat> Can you clarify, if, please? If you, have a, if, if you have a good enough simulator, there is no need for reinforcement learning. You can use planning, and the planning guys are good. Um, they can do um, main, most of the things. things. I mean, the, the reason why RL is so... Um, how to put this so interesting in games is that planning in games is due to the combinatorial problems really really hard but we are talking in robotics typically not about combinatorial problems we're talking about continuous problems and there you can make uh, so many planning methods work the big problem just is we typically don't have a good enough simulator that um, it makes sense to um, to do planning and that basically brings us again to the need of dealing with the little data and data from the real system instead of um, of data from instead of well being able to train in simulation. So in a sense, I think Rodney Brooks, who at in the 1980s stated simulations don't count, and um, he should be back on the podium and yelling that at everybody. Peter, I uh, I have oh, there's a question of him. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question regarding your uh, point about safe exploration. So, mm -hmm. on the one hand, I work a lot with robots and I see how exploration breaks robots, but. On the other hand, if you look at all the latest advancements in reinforcement learning, like there's mm -hmm. a lot of work where you just by pure exploration with some like, like maybe reward of only entropy or something, you can learn very diverse behaviors. Uh, do you think mm -hmm. like maybe we can leverage some of those results on a real robot, but then also not like making the robot break so often? No, I think we, 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 I mean, we have, we have, there's been a lot of progress in, in, in safety and robustness, and no doubt about that. And obviously that will all help. Um, but I think we, we're still a far, far way off um, when it comes to, well, if you really want to drive robots close to the edge of what they can do, and you don't want to have a human limiting things, um, that um, we can trust these algorithms. And I still think this this approach, which Puse and Davide chose, is 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 an extremely good one for problems where you're doing high speed and you touch the environment occasionally, at least. That's I think probably still the best approach I know. Thanks. Great. So I, we need to move on to our next session. So I would just like let's thank Jan again for a fantastic talk. Thanks. Okay, and with that, I think we're going to move to the discussion session, which Carolina will lead. This is the mic that works. Mm -hmm. Oh. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Carolina. I'm one of the leads in Google Robotics. Um, so the next session, we're just going to essentially be a discussion session around what are the main challenges that we all encounter with uh, agile robot learning, as opposed to just robot learning for the rest for all the other applications. So that's what I'd like to focus on today. Uh, this is not a talk. It is a discussion and we have a pretty small group. So I think it should be it should be uh, pretty easy to get a discussion going. I do know that we have some folks online, so I would like to make sure that they feel welcome to send questions here. Are they allowed to do live questions too? Okay, cool. Awesome. So yeah, so I have some assistance to make sure that we listen to the folks that are online. So um, just to start the discussion, uh, what I would love to hear from all of you is basically all of the stories about what are the challenges that you're encountering around agile 
robot learning. And I'm sure that there are many. What would be like the main, like let's just try to get to the top three themes um, for challenges for agile robot learning. Who wants to start? Yes, Atil. Do we have another one? Or if not, I can repeat. We have another one that might help. And we have about 30 minutes, I, and I'm very aware that I'm between you and lunch. So yeah, let's get the discussion going. If it doesn't work until it's cool, I can just get my steps in. Yeah. No, it's just uh, actually one keyword. It's uh, sim to real. I think is one of the biggest um, challenges with agile learning because in simulation, it's fairly yeah, easier to train very agile things because we don't have the safety of worries and stuff. But once we try to transfer that, that gap, especially with latency and stuff, is a, one of the obstacles there. Um, we will basically try to get the first, the first 15 minutes focused on all of the different challenges. And then we'll, in the second half, we can start learning what's working for folks. Any other thoughts? Uh, I would love to add uh, under actuation because if you really want to go for agility, like whether it's like hitting a ping pong ball or like if it's robot jumping or even like drone flying, like you don't have like full control of your audio degree of freedom for most of the times. If, for example, if the ping pong ball, like after you hit it, like you cannot do it do anymore with it. If you're jumping a robot, once you like leave the ground, it cannot control much. And you really need to like make use of all your control capability when you have it and to ensure the long horizon behaviors. Awesome, that, that also, remind, uh, I, I really love the previous talk by Jan Speeder, um, where he mentioned, let's build the best bodies for learning. So that was very relevant. Go ahead, Panak. Um, other general challenge I feel across agile robotics is um, model size and the generalization capabilities. So a lot of machine learning is going towards large models but since we have a need to act fast, we have very low inference budget. And that kind of means not so big models. And that also means like less generalization capabilities. So that I feel is uh, one of the obstacles. If we can solve that, that will kind of help us. Awesome. Any other suggestions? So I have sim to real challenges under actuation, latency compute constraints. Other thoughts? Perception, what about perception? Well, I don't have too much experience on perception. It's very much our talks yet, but I remember when I first started with perception for leg robots, I just can't forget how blurry the images are because the robots bouncing all around. And if you, I think a lot of things like I mentioned this morning is about like table tennis where they need to track the ball at a very high frequency with like very low latency. But that's like, I think like an extra level of perception challenge compared to like standard computer vision task where you just have a static image or a video and you want to track something. Awesome. So motion blur, the perception um, um, due, to the, due to the agile behavior. Any other thoughts around perception? Yes, or something else, Panak? Um, this is not on perception. If this other people have perception, we can take that first, maybe. We'll okay, my, my general kind of other thought I was like, how to mix uh, this planning-based methods or MPC-based methods with some reinforcement learning. I, th I think like Jan mentioned, if you have like a perfect simulation, probably things like MPC and things build on top of that, like SQP work very well, given that you have the right optimizer. But there's always some soft body. There's always some kind of high, high speed kind of collision that is very hard to model in simulation. And that's where like RL or some other talent error based techniques, learning based techniques can really help. Um, but I, I, at least so far, we haven't cracked the problem of how to combine them in, in a good way so that we don't need a ton of data on the real robot. So something like that, uh, I feel is like a good challenge for this. So do you mean because the planning algorithms are not fast enough for the agile behaviors and 
that's one problem. And another problem is there might be parts of the system that might be very hard to model, uh -huh. like say soft bodies or very hard to model collisions. Cool. Um, what else do, any, any other thoughts that, anything that has not been mentioned that you think is important that we list in the top five? Uh, challenges. Yes, until um, I can say the latency of latency. Hardware. It's because we need to have very specialized hardware controls, and latency becomes a big deal because if you want an agile, you want robot to react and responsive and controls. Um, it's very sensitive to latency. So yeah, I put that also uh, uh, within phrase budget. Any other? Yeah. Just, uh, I think uh, one more thought related to the sim to real is that it seems like baselines are really strong in simulation, but I'm curious, sometimes you see a very interesting hardware platform and some interesting results, but you can't get access to the hardware platform or you can't, you don't have all the details to reproduce it or it'd be too time intensive. I know that there are standard arms and quadrupeds, but maybe for drones or more unique uh, one-off hardware platforms, that's just a challenge you don't, you can't always get access to the hardware if you want to try to so we can build on each other's time. work exactly yeah yeah and is that particularly you're saying that's particularly hard for agility yeah. for like yeah for i building. guess you could either be trying to do something agile with a conventional platform or you could mm -hmm. try to be creating your own unique robot for a specific uh, application and then it's very hard to compare it with others cool thank you one more also, Nathaniel, I was actually curious if you think that there's more heterogeneity in agile robotics as a like subdiscipline of robotics com or compared to say like navigation or manipulation. Yeah, I th I think so. I think it really depends on. I mean, we see these ping pong examples, which I think are a great example, and I think a lot of people. There are some very common core attributes across, but there are also some differences. I think with drones, I typically see with flying vehicles, there's a lot of variety. People seem to, there still doesn't seem to be a strong consensus on the best platform that everyone should be using. So I think it depends, but maybe more in agility than in other areas. Yeah, that's a very good point. Cool. Any other last, yes, Alex, over there. Yeah, I think in that same vein, uh, there's a need for benchmarks in robotics that are just not accessible to most people or are not standardized. So I think Mujoko accomplished that in the simulation space where you can you now test on the DMC suite or um, you know, the maze environments. But in robotics papers, it seems like everybody's testing their algorithm in their own uh, proprietary hardware. And it's kind of hard to compared to other techniques when the platform is changing underneath you. Yeah, I, I didn't think of that when I was like brainstorming about ideas, but that's a very good point. And agility is especially hard, right? If everybody has their own platform, super hard to build on each other's uh, algorithms. Yeah. Yeah, and, and for agility, it's especially important because all the industrial robotics, they are not built for agility. And if you want to use anything, you know, regular, an arm or a quadruped, you know, um, it's much harder to work with. Um, not only the capabilities is a big deal, the, when you try to experiment with it, if you try a backflip with a 50 kilogram robot versus 10 kilogram robot, it's very different right? um, experiment wise, uh, the work you put there. So that makes it pretty much um, everybody building their own specialized uh, hardware and try it. Yeah, I mean, that's an awesome theme. I think that that's definitely worth like a, a further discussion. I think we could probably have like a dedicated workshop on like what benchmarks should we be using for agility and what platforms should we be sharing? And yeah, that sounds super interesting. Okay, any, any other big themes? All right, if not, let's switch to um, just, I would love to learn from everybody in this room because there's a lot of accumulated experience here on what is, what is working for each one of these themes. So right now I have sim to real uh, latency compute constraints, 
challenges with perception, such as motion blur, and how to combine planning with RL for agility. And then we have those two themes around like platforms and benchmarks. So we could start with sim to real, for example. What is, um, I think that we could all learn from each other here. That's the main, uh, that's, that's the main benefit of this part. What has worked or what has not worked that has helped you make progress in your problem in terms of sim to real for agility? Yes. Tell me one. I, I think I really like when young Peter said the real world data is that's the one most important thing if you uh, want to cross that gap. Uh, and it's very hard to collect, but it's it's very important. Thanks. Any other oh, over there? I guess for seem to real like domain randomization, I think I'm always surprised how how much we can push it. Like it seems we keep going crazy with domain randomization, and, you know, <laughs> and it just keeps working, uh, which is kind of surprising. Like we... there's a question. There was another hand over here. Yeah, in addition to uh, domain randomization, I just want to add, highlight a bunch of other works that in the recent years, especially like the RMA work, where like you don't just try to watch train one policy that's like robust against all the randomization situations, but like you try to be adaptive by like extracting embedding or doing online system ID and combine those ideas together. And I think those may be like leading the next trend of same to real, but we, we need to see. Any other thoughts on the sim to real theme? Yes. I think this relates to maybe the next problem, but I think at least for us, when you're dealing with the ping pong robots, for us like modeling the noise and the latency well, uh, I think was like a really important part of the sim to real that, that had the, the biggest impact on uh, the out of the box performance. So you said modeling the noise and the latency yeah, as part yeah. of the simulation. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Basically, run some experiments on the hardware and getting like a good range of the latency. And by noise, I mean some of the noise, the perception, like because we don't have ground truth data, we can't put mocap on everything if the objects are light. So then having some sort of noise estimate of the, the actual trajectory helps you model that. And then, uh, then you can either be robust to that or to be adapted to that. But Having those two models well was like a biggest factor in getting a good performance out of SIM. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Also, uh, yeah, if anybody wants to send me some questions through the chat, please feel free to do so. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a crack at this. So I guess in my group, we've, we've actually spent quite a lot of effort on making our simulators better. And I'd like to throw out this idea that um, I'm getting this from a lot of what everyone's saying is maybe um, we should be thinking more about real to sim. How do we take a little bit of data from our robots and uh, bring that back into the simulator? I think this applies to latency, it applies to actuator models, it applies to contact modeling, but like, why aren't we trying to make the simulators better, right? Why are we just trying to say, bridge this gap by collecting a little data on our particular robot platform and then, you know, making our policy a little better? Why don't we try to actually work on, on the simulator and, and um, Think about physics a bit more and think about models a bit more and how we can actually uh use data in the simulator to make the simulator better that's yeah that's what i got fully agree yeah ken has a question over there thank you uh, i mean i guess nobody complains about a better simulator i guess everybody wants a better simulator but at the same time there's also like faster simulators and like, you know, parallelization, like, you know, you're on GPU or in our, or on TPU or whatever, like you get massive parallelization and like, it's not clear yet what, what is the right approach. Is it like more data or just like high fidelity simulators? Uh, so I guess we're going back and forth and like, yeah, I wouldn't mind like an amazing simulator that runs on like a GPU and has like super high fidelity, but it's kind of hard to do. Yeah, also to quickly add into that, 
uh, in some sense, this real to sim can be viewed as improving the simulator, right? You're kind of thinking back to that. Um, so that's one part. But also other part is that, can we actually get to the state where the simulators are, are, are really, really so good that we won't need any fine tuning at all on the real robot? In that case, uh, I think it is good. But if there is always some fine tuning needed on the real robot anyway, so then that kind of caps the effort that you have to be able to put to improve the simulator, right? Because then you only have so many resources. So that's kind of the trade-off I feel uh, in, in terms of like putting more resources on improving the simulator versus putting some resource on getting it to a place where we can make it work. There's a response on the side on that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree with everything everyone's saying, right? Um, I think uh, my take on this is that the current batch of simulators that we're using in robotics, uh, Mujoko, Bullet, et cetera, um, leave a lot to be desired in, a, in a several kind of ways. And, and in a lot of ways from like a physics perspective are quite naive and are not doing as well as we could be doing. So I think there's that aspect. And then there's also, um, uh, I think we're not bringing data into the simulators for like one example of this would be uh, data driven contact models right contact is always nasty friction is always nasty. Why am I not collecting I'm we're collecting data on the robots already right say if, if I've got my quadruped simulator right i'm driving the thing around i'm collecting data great. Why don't I take that data and and build a data driven contact model that includes deformation in the feet and weird you know Strybeck effect friction, why can't I do that I actually if I did that. I could have a little per foot model that could be a very, very small, you know, data driven model. And I could probably train that up with a, a, you know, 30 seconds worth of data of my foot messing around, right? And now I have like a really, really good model of, of what the foot's gonna do on a given terrain, right? Um, I think there's like all kinds of places to insert tiny amounts of data into the simulator in parametric ways, in ways where we, we know where the hard parts are to model, right? We know where the, the big residuals in our model are coming from. Um, usually it's things like, you know, the motors do weird things uh, as a function of temperature and, and whatever. And in all these cases, right, the, the rigid body physics that's in the simulator already, it's probably 80 or 90% accurate. There's this last 10 or 20% that we're missing, and we're not bringing the data from the robot back into the simulator in an informed way to make the simulator that 10 or 20% better, right, to close the gap. And we absolutely could be doing this. Um, but like you said, right, I, I agree that there's there's hard parts in there. Um, but it, it would take, I think, an effort from us um, caring about this particular sort of set of applications. And it, it's absolutely tied to the agile thing, right? Like we're pushing the hardware limits really hard. So this last 10 or 20% uh, when you're underactuated, right, when you're pushing the, the torque limits is absolutely crucial. And we could be getting that last 10 or 20% into our simulators with I think a lot less data than um, than it would take to do a lot of these other things, right? That, that's basically my take. Is like that last ten or twenty percent, we can get there with like really smart, small amounts of data in specific places where we know where the problem spots are. Um, and anyway, that's that's what I think we should be doing. Thank you very much. There's a couple more questions over there. Thank you. Um, I wanted to highlight something that Laura presented, which is uh, leveraging perception to help with the sim to real gap, like factoring out those things from uh, like sim to real uh, that can be solved by perception models. Like um, her team solved this like tracking of the ball training a, a perception model that takes, you know, the raw inputs of the camera. And basically that helped with the real domain where in SIM they had like the perfect information. And I think this is like very effective because it reduces the, the search space of like what we're trying to, to learn. Sounds great. Tignan, I think you had your right hand raised or was it somebody else? I kind of want to talk about the real to sim. So usually the simulators, they solve without the context by performing some sort of optimization, like solving local QP, etc. And of course, with the recent development in the either like a learnable optimization stack, I think this is becoming more and more possible that we can do that. 
And I do think, so maybe for locomotion problem, there's gain of that. I, we don't know how much we will gain from that, but definitely for manip manipulation problems, the gain will be huge. Right now, a lot of the manipulation contexts, they are pretty bad, especially if you're dealing with like soft or other you know, objects. Well, we will see, you know, where this leads to. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. I wanted to switch to um, a, what are your thoughts on the latency and compute constraints? Like, how are we addressing that? And uh, what's working for, for different groups? Because that's obviously, I think multiple people mentioned that. Yeah. Well, my high level, like, start on this is hierarchy because like human brains have limited compute as well, but we don't solve everything at 500 Hertz. I think like maybe some motor control or some low level tasks that like requires higher frequency, but they are not that complex, but some of the more complex tasks don't require that much frequency. So if we do define a hierarchy or like maybe learn hierarchy in a proper way, like I think compute is not gonna be a huge bottleneck. And that's like my first intuition. And second, like, I think like, I mean, like I had a very good time like trying to use the Mac mini M1 processor on my robot. And I think just like, I am amazed by latest hardware development. So that even if like we are worried about compute right now, I think the compute problem, I mean, more storage at its end, but I think compute will still develop in some way. And I hope that can alleviate the problem as time goes. Laura? You wanted to say something? I don't know. It's just like <laughs> just movie. Anyone else? Throw more compute at it. Okay. <laughs> One more. Um, I wonder if a potentially out of scope solution space to this is in the hardware area where you know the people like Neville Hogan at MIT are always going on about uh, we should be doing more impedance control. And um, Jan Peters just talked about using kind of antagonistic activations of pneumatic controllers to uh, get um, a, as a solution to the ping pong problem. And uh, in Hogan's case, he makes the argument in terms of uh, humans, like he, he uses the metaphor of humans control bandwidth is uh, like controlling a soccer player through a GPS link. Um, both in terms of, of latency and bandwidth. And the way people seem to work around that, at least for sort of forceful manipulation tasks, is uh, impedance control in the sense of having a set point, but also dialing in the stiffness. Uh, that's also, the stiffness is um, not uniform around the set point, but uh, shaped. And all these things contribute to being uh, uh, robust to not just model errors, but also being able to deal with um, uh, sort of the mechanical constraints of what you're pushing so that you are stiff in the, in the direction that you want to apply force to, but also loose in, in, in directions that you care about. Um, and none of this is really, as far as I know, implementable with sort of off the shelf actuators and, and the sort of things that we reach for first when designing our robots. And I guess that that's why we all implement our own hardware. Um, but uh, I wonder if this more sort of biomorphic actuator space is, is part of the solution. Any other thoughts around um, along those lines or, or a new thought around uh, compute constraints? All right. Um, let me switch to the perception perception challenges. I know that not everybody here works on perception, but <laughs> I think just dive a little deeper about what are the main challenges and perhaps um, understand what's working or what new research threats we need to probably start to address them. Yes, Atil. Um, I have one thing about perceptions that um, we cannot necessarily treat it completely separately from the actuation problem. Normally, you know, Navigation setting, I think that's how they, you know, you just take a perception, you just get the info from it, process it, and you behave based on that. But if you are looking at agility, really some details are very more important than the others. And 
what is important, what is not, depends on what you are intending to do. So it's um, it's not completely isolated, and we should treat it not as as isolated. I think. Any other thoughts? Yeah, uh, let me put out a little bit controversial topic here on the perception. I feel like it probably is the best way we move more towards raw sensors instead of using a pre-built stack like a SLAM. Let me give an example in the case of the light age of locomotion tasks and where you know, a lot of the state estimation with the assumption is that you have a fixed contact at the point field, so you can do a proper estimation and you can construct the terrains around it. But maybe if you look at a lot of these more challenging tasks, that the robot dog or you know climbs with non-typical contact with elbows and all these things, they put a lot of you know taxation on how this you know, estimation can be done. So in the so basically, if the robot is doing something very agile, your reconstruction will suffer a lot from the dynamic movement. But on the other side, you know the raw sensor they usually don't suffer as much because you know and they also have a very low. Uh, sensory latency compared with you know a post processing a heavy post processing stack like a slab. Any other thoughts on perception? So basically, uh, you're just saying like uh, taking off the shell perception models is not the best way to go about this. <laughs> Whether you learn directly from raw pixels is another question, right? So one direction I think is super underexplored is uh, active vision. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of deal with problems that are, to my mind, side effects of the lack of that, such as motion blur. Um, and part of that is because we don't have sort of off the shelf things that, you know, pan tilt cameras that are fast enough to track a ball and that sort of thing. But um, there's no clear reason why that shouldn't be an off the shelf thing that <laughs> maybe we should be focusing on making those and sort of opening up that space so that, um, you know, if you're a tennis player, obviously it helps to keep your eye on the ball literally. And um, then you, and it completely changes the learning problem where instead of memorizing a full mapping of every possible trajectories across your field of view to the appropriate arm response, you just have this one thing where the ball's always in the center of your field of view. And, uh, you know, once you canonicalize the input actively, then the output, uh, it, the appropriate output to map to that is a, seems like a simpler problem. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, uh, let me I let me summarize what I have so far. There was one other topic uh, on how to combine planning and RL for agility. Uh, let's let's spend five minutes on that and then wrap up. Are there any thoughts about that? Main challenges in combining RL and planning for agility, or maybe we're not doing that nearly as much. Well, I think we have had some success in combining like planning with RL or like using learning for control or like all those kind of lines of work, but I don't think we have reached to a conclusion where like say this way of combining RL with planning is going to lead to like benefit in like a general case of problems. It's more like, for example, if we try to learn a cost function for planning, and then we show that like maybe on this task is working great, but like we, it's not like, for example, we know domain randomizations is a great tool for sim Um, I think this kind of leads to the other thing we talked about, about the benchmarks or about like a universal frame, a universal like set of tools that people can access to. So it's, it's more like, I feel like so. On the one hand, I do believe like uh, combining uh, planning with uh, combining control with learning is a good direction to go. But like, on the other hand, we need to explore a lot more and reach some like general consensus to really like like push this forward. Yeah, one of the things I took away from Scott's talk is it seems that there's no single solution that is best under all circumstances. So it, it struck me that there's some cases in which you, they're using pure MPC, then there's some cases when they're using RL plus MPC, and then there's some cases where RL alone seems to be uh, the thing that works best. And so 
perhaps it's interesting to explore like under how do we figure out uh, under what circumstances like how much control to give to RL how much to MPC I think that seems to be an open question uh, at this point over here Uh, What's think, your name, sorry? Uh, I'm Brian Jackson. Brian. Uh, I work with Zach. Mm -hmm. um, I think another challenge uh, in this area, um, coming from more of an NPC background myself, is I've seen a lot of bad NPC implementations that um, are very like computationally inefficient. Um, and I think it's too easy to ride them off at, um, because it does take a lot of effort to put together a good like NPC model-based optimization stack. Um, so I think this ties into the last point of having more uh, like repeatable results. If we like consolidated more around good implementations of things like ILQR or like uh, QP and PC, all these things that like everybody kind of like homebrews their own versions. Uh, and it, I think we'd be surprised at how many of us are making really bad implementations of these and uh, hence our comparisons are bad. Um, so yeah, just a couple of thoughts there. Thank you. That's a great point. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think we keep coming back to this, that like as a community, it sounds like we could be sharing more, basically. Otherwise, we're spending a lot of like a lot of cycles just repeating each other's work or creating better implementations and then not advancing the field. Go ahead, Panang. Yeah, um, I mean, some of the things that we have tried in this domain but hasn't worked very well is uh, in, the, in the context of catching, we are trying to kind of have two separate things. One was like an mpc based solution, just quite general to new throws but it won't give us the same asymptotic performance. So we tried to kind of feed an RL policies output into an MPC, basically using RL or something like black box to tune the parameters of MPC. We tried that. We also tried to kind of have uh, a, a, like an extra controller, which would like switch over from, from MPC to, to RL policy to, to their strengths. And we tried to even train that policy. Some of those things kind of did not work for us. And we also try to kind of take the output of the MPC and feed that as an extra input to RL. So we tried different combinations uh, with the hope to kind of cater to the strengths of each. Um, but somehow even that was not kind of, uh, or so far hasn't worked for us. So just to kind of give people some, some attempts that have failed for us. Yeah, that's really helpful. One more over here. I, I will. I guess, be the broken record on this topic that I think that um, what you just said, I think is, is absolutely true, right? Your MPC thing can work really well, but the asymptotic performance at this long tail problem of like, you want it to be able to get better with more data. And I think this comes back to the, the real to sim thing again, like model based, you know, it's MPC, it's model based, right? And the model is really ultimately the limiting factor there. And um, I think there's a ton of ways to glue these things together, but like a simple one is to, improve your model with data. And there's tons of ways to do that. Um, but if you already have an MPC controller that's kind of working and, and you're just trying to dial in that last 10 or 20%, doing some kind of like model residual learning thing is, is I feel like a really easy thing to do that, that can get you a lot of the way there. Awesome. Uh, so is there any last minute addition to that? Okay, I thought I saw a hand. Um, great, thank you so much for the discussion. I think that there's definitely a lot of interest in like sharing, uh, sharing what we know works and potentially sharing a lot more like benchmarks and hardware and especially in the agility case um, would be really impactful to the field. So the, um, I'm, I'm happy to send notes from the discussion. I think this is being recorded as well, but the main things that we, that I gather is like, we talked about SIM to real challenges. Essentially there, there was a lot of discussion about bringing real to SIM and how to leverage data as we interact with the world to make that those models better. Um, and also we talked about leveraging intermediate representations uh, to actually not learn everything, um, especially in the case of agility that, that might bring a lot of gains. We also talked about latency and compute constraints. There was a discussion around hierarchy using hierarchy in compute and also just simply modifying our hardware so that it plays better for agility type tasks. Um, and then on the perceptions, on the perception challenges, um, we talk about active vision using raw sensors rather than off the shelf or modify those, those algorithms to work better for the agility cases. And then finally on combining planning and RL um, 
mainly we are trying lots of things. Some things are working, but not in all cases. So we have to figure out how to best combine them and um, how to tackle that problem at the tail end. Um, but overall, I think that there is a lot of interest in just sharing more platforms, more benchmarks. So I think that there's an opportunity there. Thank you so much for the discussion. Bye, everyone. All right, before uh, we all head out for lunch, there's a small announcement for the slight changes in the program. So as we have uh, in the morning, there are some time being dedicated to Scott to have the Q&A, so there are less time for the posters. So what we decided to do is to, instead of starting the, post, the PM poster session at 1.30, uh, we're going to start it around one o'clock, but you, know, you can just come there at your own pace. And also we're going to cancel the food discussion session, which is after five. I know some of you probably fly there and jet lagged. And we also are going to allocate that time as a free poster session. So if you want to you know, discuss things over there, you're, you're very well welcome. Thank you so much. And we're going to see you soon. Yeah, maybe we can get started and people will trickle in. Um, welcome everyone back after the opening session of the main conference. It is my pleasure to uh, have Anima uh, Anand Kumar here. Anima is a brand professor at Caltech and senior director of AI research at NVIDIA. She received her BTEC from um, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, um, and it's one of the uh, top institutes in India, and her PhD from Cornell University. She did her postdoc at MIT and an assistant professorship at UC Irvine. Um, she has received several honors, such as the IEEE Fellowship, Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship, NSF Career Award, and faculty fellowships from Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and Adobe. She is part of the World Economic Forum's uh, expert network. So it is my pleasure to have Anima here for a keynote. Uh, please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Panag. And, uh... Yeah, I'm certainly feeling a lot of FOMO of not being there in person. So I hope you're enjoying the event. Uh, uh, I know, for instance, uh, you can do uh, from my team at Den Media is there. I don't know if he's in this specific workshop since I cannot see the audience. But, uh, you know, do uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to talk to him. Great. Let me get started. Um, yeah, so I know this. The uh, workshop is about agile robots, right? And so this is a broad title I have about, you know, what aspects of artificial intelligence can we embed for agile and dynamic robots? And, um, you know, how do we still maintain aspects like safety and stability, right? Especially in dynamic non-stationary conditions. Uh, this is a lot more sensitive compared to some of the static tasks or, or slow changing tasks that robots may be doing. So this is a lot more challenging. So I'll give you some ingredients and some ongoing work on this. So one aspect at Caltech that we have to test such agile robots is this uh, wind tunnel. So it's not really a tunnel per se, as you can see here, in this video, it's an array of fans that are programmable and we can generate all kinds of conditions, right? So really high speed and variety of shapes of uh, and uh, directions of wind. And so what you see here is a work called Neural Fly that uh, we did with Sunjo Chang and Lee Song Yu here at Caltech. And of course, the students in our groups uh, uh, where we are able to handle these kind of uh, wind conditions and fly. So if you were to just use the standard controller in drones, that would crash. But what is enabling uh, the drone to do this is to learn the features on a set of such uh, data available uh, beforehand. So offline feature learning and online adaptation, because online it's trying to figure out amongst all the wind conditions known, right, what is the coefficients as an interpolation of those features that uh, you want to, uh, you know, adapt online and make sure it is still able to fly and not crash. Um, so I see that as a starting point to many of the 
things we are doing from now on because uh, yes, these uh, wind conditions are uh, really fast, but we also want to further go to even much more highly turbulent conditions. So here, the turbulence is from the drone itself, but what if we want to like go to near buildings, right? So there you will have like lots of like uh, vortices and shear layers. So if we want to one day have drones fly near buildings, uh, we need to be able to handle that. And so again, like thinking about inspiration uh, from uh, the natural world, we know like uh, birds and fish, they have a lot of flow awareness, you know, the sensors on the skin can uh, detect the flow and the turbulence and they are very agile in being able to handle that. So our our flying objects are much far, very far from that, right? So, and what you see here is one of the experimental setups who we uh, did at Caltech where we are now able to generate very high speed uh, conditions, uh, very turbulent conditions. Uh, I think Reynolds number of about 23,000, uh, which is very challenging. Uh, so much more than what you saw in the fan array uh, that I showed in the previous slide. So one question is how do we get machine learning to handle these kind of turbulent conditions? You know, should it be offline learning? So you pre-train on a set of features, should it be online adaptation? Should it be reinforcement learning? So we'll see all these aspects come together uh, in this work. So as a uh, showcase of what we've done so far, uh, uh, we started with water. Uh, one reason is because you can get this laser measurements and it's a, a lower Reynolds number, right? So it's a good starting point for testing our methods. And uh, what uh, we are able to do is to get uh, real-time fluid flow prediction uh, of these turbulent conditions. And uh, what you can see here is the along the... Uh, y direction, like, you know, under different hearing conditions, right? And then this is the learned versus, and this is the error plot. And so, of course, if you do that over a long time, the error will eventually build up. But what we need is kind of for a period of time to have good flow prediction, and then we'll get updated measurements from sensors in any online flight. And we can uh, uh, this way continue to maintain good trajectories and be able to predict the flow accurately. And uh, we can also see that it uh, does quite well compared to baselines like convolutional neural networks. So I wanna tell you what is this Fourier neural operator and how does it enable us to track these turbulent flows very accurately. And it's able to do very fast, right? Like you wouldn't be practical to use a uh, very refined uh, computational fluid dynamics or CFD solver, uh, traditional solvers, they don't work in real time, they're too slow. And uh, whereas these models, this Fourier neural operator is real time and at accurate. And so that's what we want to, you know, figure out uh, some principles of what, what makes them different from standard convolutional neural nets or other uh, machine learning models. So to get a bit more into what neural operators are, so they are really right, designed for solving partial differential equations and other settings which map functions to functions. So in partial differential equations, uh, the input can be the initial and boundary conditions. And they're really functions, right? So you're giving the uh, input or the initial condition at different locations in space, and that can be a continuous domain. And the output is the solutions at various locations. If we were to use a standard neural network that is not appropriate for this task, because that only guarantees learning at a fixed resolution. If I train images in one resolution, I can only guarantee you that you will get a good testing error at the same resolution at a similar distribution. Right. Whereas if you change the resolution, that's a big distributional shift and uh, there is no guarantee that it will work well. And in fact, you know, your learning filters and other features that are very specific to one resolution. So there's quite a big degradation uh, in other resolutions. 
So uh, that is assuming even if you were to do simple interpolation on top of uh, standard neural networks. On the other hand, what neural operators can do is to be discretization invariant, meaning once they are trained, you can test it at any resolution. So it gives you valid outputs at a uh, resolution higher than the training data, right? You could also do it under different meshes or grids, uh, depending on your problem. So how is this possible? Um, because this sounds like magic. If I've only trained in one resolution, how can I predict at a higher resolution? So the reason is that because we are framing this as learning an operator which directly maps one function space to another. So by design, we are making it output uh, functions and not just a fixed dimensional output. So as a simple uh, first step to have intuitions of what uh, these neural operators are doing, let's go back to PDE 101. Right, so, and think of like linear partial differential equation, like the heat diffusion. So if you have the heat, uniform heat diffusion, right, it will kind of like uh, uniformly in this uh, disk uh, propagate. And uh, in this case, we can write down the temperature at any point as um, a convolution with a certain kernel. We call that the Green's function, right? So depending on the kernel, if it's uniform, even this kernel would be uniform, uh, but if it's non-uniform heat dissipation, in general, this can be anything different, right? So you would like integrate this and come up with the answer. And so this is integration over the continuous domain. And that's why you can now input a function, which is the initial condition of your heat diffusion, and then once you integrate it from the kernel, you get the output of like, uh, what is the right resulting uh, uh, heat dissipation. And uh, so given that we know this, right, this is well known, there's no learning here. Uh, we, in many cases like heat diffusion, we already know what the kernel is. We plug that in, we do the integration. But what we wanna instead ask is if I were to learn this, I could learn the kernel and I could learn the integration with the kernel. And that way I can get now an integral linear operator. So the input can be function, output can be function. So it's not just limited to one discretization. You can now uh, ask query at a different location that is different from training data and it will still produce an output based on what it has learned of what the kernel is and how to integrate that kernel with that kernel. And so we can do the same, right? So this is discretization invariant, but we wanna extend it to general nonlinear operators. Like fluid dynamics, what you saw is nonlinear, right? So what we do is we learn now an expressive model that consists of compositions of linear integral operators with nonlinear activations. So now you can do different nonlinear activations like GALO or uh, others, right? So you can choose your nonlinear activation here. And by this composition, now you get an expressive model. In fact, um, the uh, neural operator we show is universal approximator for any continuous nonlinear operator. So it can capture solutions of any partial differential equations, which may be even nonlinear, like fluid dynamics. So we have a nice approximation guarantee similar to neural networks in finite domains that we are able to capture complex tur turbulent flows uh, and uh, capture this universal, I mean, because it's universal approximation, we can capture any kind of such uh, phenomena that are described by partial differential equations. And so what? how do we do a practical version of this, right? So what is a special case of neural operator that is practical and works very well? What we did was to take the integral operator, a special case as convolution, and you learn to solve the convolution in the Fourier domain. So if you recall signal processing 101, convolution becomes multiplication in the Fourier domain. So once you take the Fourier transform, 
you learn the weights in the frequency domain and you can come back to the spatial domain. And so what we do in these models is simply a nice Fourier space learning. So we are learning in the frequency domain. We come back to the spatial domain. We do nonlinear transformations and repeat this over many layers. Right, so it's kind of like nicely marrying some of the classical aspects. You know, people solve partial differential equations in frequency domain. This is classical, right? So we are using some of that intuitions here. But at the same time, uh, we have like nonlinear activations just like in other uh, neural networks. And so that means it's a flexible and expressive model. You know, e even if, um, let's say it has like discontinuities, it has aperiodicity, we can still capture it because of these nonlinear activations. So you can prove that, uh, uh, in fact, one of the recent work showed nicely that it captures even uh, a discontinuous phenomena uh, nicely because of this uh, flexible learning. And so that's what this model is. At the end of the day, it's a lot of what we already know, right? So, um, you know, we can uh, capture the learning in the frequency domain. So that's a nice inductive bias. Uh, in a way, convolutional neural networks learn the filters and do convolution on specifically those filters, but that's limited to one resolution. Whereas we can do the Fourier transform at different resolutions, you know, you can, now do this in any resolution. And so this way we can take inputs of different resolution and still give you valid output answers. And so that's what, um, you know, is the benefit of doing Fourier transform over standard convolutional neural networks that are limited to just one resolution. So, yeah, so I, uh, you know, uh, so this is the nice aspect of neural operators making a discretization invariant uh, that works very well for capturing uh, uh, not just phenomena in one resolution, but also at a higher resolution without the need for retraining. Yeah, so coming back to this, uh, sorry, that was a, <laughs> quite a bit of like, uh, sidestepping to tell you what neural operators are. Uh, but in this framework, we are able to show the ability to learn uh, these uh, turbulent flows uh, across a range of conditions. So we have results across a wide range of Reynolds numbers. And we're directly learning from experimental data, right? Which is also nice. You don't have to go and solve the complicated Navier-Stokes equation first with the solver and uh, train the model. You can directly train it uh, based on this experimental data. And the other benefit we also see is, you know, these kind of like, uh, um, like here cylinder and those, we can, you know, even generalize if we kind of have multiple cylinders, we can generalize, right? So it nicely generalizes even beyond what it is trained on, uh, which is a nice feature. So it's capturing general aspects of uh, in turbulent flows and near the uh, cylinder, how the flow changes. So it's able to capture that well. And so I think this is a nice stepping stone uh, towards uh, designing uh, uh, flights in highly turbulent conditions. So I wanna showcase also another work where we are uh, learning to stabilize under much more turbulent conditions than what you saw in the previous work. They are in different regimes. And, but in this case, the benefit is we are doing online reinforcement learning. So uh, this work called Falcon is model-based reinforcement learning. And what we show is it is much better than model-free reinforcement learning, right? It um, requires an order of magnitude, fewer samples, and at the same time, it can stabilize very well. So this variance is something you need to pay attention to, and it's able to uh, stabilize much more effectively. And as you can see, the PID uh, solver uh, is even worse. Without learning, it's not able to stabilize well under these highly turbulent conditions. Yeah, so this is saying that we're doing this model-based uh, reinforcement learning by 
learning uh, on Fourier based features. Again, the same intuition that the Fourier domain is a nice inductive bias. And we're learning coefficients in the frequency domain. And on top of it, doing uh, uh, model predictive control and uh, updating the coefficients in a loop. So you have this first model updates and then MPC and then repeat again. And with that, we are able to do this very effective learning. Uh, as you can see, this was, uh, you know, very high Reynolds number. Sorry, I even got a zero wrong. So it's <laughs> 230,000 Reynolds number, not 23,000. I was thinking, oh, that's low, but uh, I got that, I missed a zero earlier. So I think this is, uh, and in fact, this is slowed down just for visualization. In practice, this is extremely fast and turbulent uh, winds uh, that we created uh, in the wind tunnel experiment here. And um, yeah, so we are able to, so this is a little bit more, right, of how we're able to like kind of simulate a wing and you can see that it can flap quite a bit because it's highly turbulent. And uh, as I said, capturing the standard deviation and how we can minimize it is so important for stability. And that's what we are able to do here. So as you can see, this is like gusty level winds. And uh, at the same time, we required less than about eight minutes in the wind tunnel to get reinforcement learning to work. And so that's an order of magnitude fewer samples than what model free reinforcement learning does. And so I think that's also the benefit like in conditions like this where a lot of physics can be nicely captured by model based reinforcement learning, we expect that to have benefits compared to model free RL, uh, which is I think a nice showcase here. Yeah, so in the remaining few minutes, I want to also show you some of the works where we are also enforcing kind of safety requirements, right? Like for drones and these agile robots, it's very important to maintain safety. So what are some principles to uh, enable us to do this? I mean, there's so many scenarios, right? Especially with drones, uh, this is important. So this is a work uh, we did uh, called Neural Lander with Sunjo Chang and Isong Yu, uh, where you know we learn to land safely. We also learn to do very careful uh, trajectory tracking close to the ground. And the idea is here we are learning the ground effect with a residual term using a neural network, uh, but we incorporate Lipschitz bound, so we make sure this. Uh, neural network uh, is spectrally bounded. And that way, you know that any perturbation in the input is only limiting uh, the perturbation in the outputs, right? Because the Lipschitz constant is bounded. Yes, uh, you know, this is still like say 13 dimensional inputs, right? So it wouldn't work with a very large domain and high dimensionality to have uh, a bound on spectral um, regularization in neural networks, but in this setting it does. So it's really about, again, designing the appropriate neural networks for different regimes. And here, because the safety is so important and we need to have a guarantee that any perturbation of the input only has limited impact on the output, uh, we saw that was very important. So we also wanted to like go beyond and ask can we do manual, instead of manual data collection where an expert flies the drone, can we safely explore automatically? Can the drone itself figure out, can it try to land faster and faster, but still be safe, right? And so over time, it learns to explore by maintaining safety. And this is all a huge issue, right? Any kind of space exploration or unmanned exploration requires the notion of right uncertainty and based on that, the decision to go beyond your training data, because you need to go beyond the scenarios you're already aware of. And so what we did here was to use what is known as a robust regression work, where um, we are doing adversarial risk minimization. We are saying uh, by allowing some bound on the kind of distributional shift, but looking at the worst case distributional shift, what is it? you know, can you come up with an uncertainty quantification? 
right? So in this case, unlike, uh, let's say, Gaussian process, uh, which, you know, based, based on Gaussianity, right? Here we are thinking of it as adversarial risk minimization. And for safety critical scenarios, that is much more effective where we show Gaussian process uh, in these higher dimension fails, whereas these methods succeed. And as you can see here, uh, you know, in the beginning, it only like tries to land slowly because it's very careful, right? It, it has high uncertainty and it doesn't want to go beyond the safety envelope. It has some safety requirements. So, but over time, it gradually increases the speed. It learns from it and hence you can uh, get it to ultimately land faster uh, with no manual intervention. And so this we've done in simulation using real drone data, but I think these kind of concepts can be very useful in so many in the wild scenarios. And so this is also something we took further to um, safe planning. So for trajectory optimization as well, we can take these uncertainty bounds and incorporate that into the sequential convex solvers and be able to safely plan. So you want to optimize for tracking a certain trajectory, but you also want to, you know, use these uncertainty bounds to maintain safety. And so we can do this kind of like, uh, uh, you know, optimization while keeping safety in mind. I think the notion of adversarial risk minimization is a very important technique to enable this. So just as a final note, I know this workshop is more about agility, right? And uh, so that means we're thinking more of maybe the low level control. Uh, a lot of what I talked was like, how do we go and handle turbulence, you know, compared to low level controllers today? How do we use machine learning to either augment or even entirely replace it to get better handle of turbulent conditions, for instance, or to maintain safety in a better way while capturing uh, more of the turbulence that isn't possible with a standard controller. Uh, but on the other hand, at some point, we need to bring all this, right, low-level control to even high-level reasoning. And so some of the work uh, that we've been doing that, you know, Yuko, if he is there, uh, will tell you a lot more about is how to build these generalist agents. And, um, you know, the difference is this open-ended objectives, right? So you can give it lot, a variety of commands and you need to harness the world knowledge, like you need a world model. And so MindDojo is a framework that um, we are very proud of, uh, which is based on the Minecraft environment. And um, it also recently got the outstanding paper award at uh, NeurIPS that I'm uh, very proud of the team. And so what we did here was to, you know, think about, open-ended tasks, about 3,000 tasks here. But at the same time, you're not going to solve that from scratch, right? This is not AlphaGo Zero. Uh, we're going to use all the internet scale knowledge and that to multimodal, whether it's text-based or video-based like YouTube. And using those, can we now solve these open-ended tasks? And you're going to give instructions as text prompts. Uh, so how can we enable this kind of generalist agents? And uh, so to me, like, yes, we have some starting points there, but this is still very much an unsolved domain. So I encourage the community to look into this as a great framework of how to combine, right, pre-training, reinforcement learning, uh, open-ended learning, all that together in one framework. And ultimately, I think all of this has to come together, right? So we had looking at low level control in the earlier part of my talk, this is all like more high level reasoning. Ultimately, uh, we need to bring all that together into generalist agents that can adapt as well as be agile. At least that's the dream. So yeah, I think uh, I'm out of time, I realize. So I'm gonna stop here. I don't know if there is time for questions, but yeah, thanks for listening to my talk. Cool. Thank you for cool. an awesome talk. Maybe we have time for like one quick question. Not sure question, yeah? question. That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm interested in this um, Fourier networks or this uh, place where you say that you are learning the 
for your components. Sorry, I lost um, most of it. It was broken. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, I was interested in this uh, learning the neural operators. You say that you can learn sort of independent of scale, which is really cool. For and some reason, it's just okay. cool. And the mic is on. Hello. Uh, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Is the connection okay? Can you hear us, Anima? Anima? Yeah, I think that... it's very. Can you say something? Uh, can you hear us now? No, I can't hear no. anything now. No. Okay. No. It's. I think the yeah. mic is breaking up. You just like. Yeah. There's some audio issues. Yeah. I don't know maybe if anyone let me can try type other mic the with chat. Maybe let me try with. Hello, can you hear this better? Nope. Maybe you can type the question quickly in the chat. In the chat. No, the mic is just not coming through for no. some reason. It's just like a little bit in the end I right hear, and that's it. Never mind. Never mind. It doesn't. Somebody's even, typing here. Like you type? Okay. So, okay. so Tingnan is typing the question. In this Fourier domain, you can limit your frequency spectrum to a to limited number, right? It's not, it's not dimensionless either, right? You have a certain frequency spectrum that you are having as a spectrum as your operator. So, uh, as, sorry, as your parameters. How did they select that sort of the range of frequencies that they have in the, in the frequency domain? Sorry. So, so, so maybe we are, like, we are having sorry some technical issues. So maybe are some, we are having. Yeah, I think there's some delay, unfortunately. There's some delay. So maybe in the interest of time, should we kind of uh, end here and then maybe take the question so, offline? Because I think we are probably running a little late for the next session. Late for the next session. Super weird. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you for the great talk. Maybe... Thank you for the great talk. Maybe... Yeah, I think it's like a lot of delay. Sorry. Yeah, nothing is like so. It's also weird hearing my own voice again after that. Cool. Shall we start the next session? Oh, there's going to be posters here. Okay, now there's going to be like uh, half an hour of posters. Okay, and then we'll come back for the next session. Thank you. With that, the first speaker, Professor Pulkit Agrawal from MIT. It's going to take it away. Yeah, thank you for having me and thank you everyone for coming to this talk. I'm going to talk about, you know, athletic physical intelligence. So today, you know, we have quadrupeds. Is this a screen or does it get bigger? Or is that the right size? Cool. I use this. Yes. Is this good now? Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk about, you know, athletic physical intelligence. So today we have quadrupeds, which can walk on diverse terrains and, you know, they do pretty well. On the other hand, you know, we have quadrupeds, which can run very fast, but they run fast in very limited scenarios, right? For example, in a treadmill, they're externally powered, so on and so forth, right? So in some ways, what we have are things which can do well in the wild, but are conservative or things which are very fast, but only operate in limited scenarios. And the question is, you know, how do we get to athletic intelligence? Right? So how do we get there? So the first question is to understand, you know, why is agile locomotion challenging? And we can break it down into a couple of things. The first thing is that most of the systems I showed you previously are blind. So they are reactive. So if I can see something 
you know, in front of me, maybe I can be faster, which is anticipating the future. The second thing is, you know, we make approximations in our models and these approximations show up as, you know, reduced order models if you're doing model predictive control or if you are using learning based methods, they show up as, you know, gap when we are transferring some simulation to reality. And a third possibility is that maybe there's something bad with the hardware or the hardware is suboptimal. So let's look at these aspects one by one. So first, let's look at anticipating the future. Right. So we looked at this work from, you know, Sangbei's lab, which seemed pretty impressive, you know, jumping over these obstacles. And we thought, hey, you know, this works great over obstacles which are fixed, but can we generalize it and make it work in a more general way? So what we did was, you know, we created a, a gap world environment where now instead of having obstacles at fixed locations, you know, we can have obstacles which vary both in the difficulty and in their position. Right. And, you know, the way we approach this is to say, I have a depth camera on the robot, which looks at some observation. We're going to predict some commands, which is how fast the robot is moving and when it makes contact with the ground. And then we're going to leverage a model based controller, which predicts the joint velocities and a PD controller, which makes sure we can track those joint velocities. So we can take, you know, state of the art MPC controller, fix it and you know, pretty much focus on the high level part, which is using vision to see what is there in the future to, you know, to perform this agile task. And turns out, you know, if we train policies using reinforcement learning, we can in fact, you know, get this agile behavior in simulation, right? So now we can also transfer these policies on, you know, on the real robot, which can you know, start jumping across gaps. And we can try to quantify this, right? So on the y-axis is the gap crossing success rate. On the x-axis is how wide the gaps are. For context, the robot's body length is around 40 centimeters. And if you look at, you know, how big of gaps we can cross in simulation, which is the blue line, right? We can go beyond the robot's body length, right? Which is good news. But then if we compare it to the best real world performance that we get, you know, we only can cross gaps up to 26 centimeters, which is way lower than what we can do in simulation. So the question is, you know, why does this gap actually exist? So then, you know, we probed this question and what we found is that the model-based controller that we were using, you know, it relies on the body velocity. And this body velocity actually relies on the assumption that there is no slip between the foot and the ground. But if you are pushing the robot to run fast, it's always slipping. So this assumption gets broken and therefore the transfer is not as good. But it's just not this, right? If you're going fast, you know, motor dynamics are very different. If you push them to the limits, you know, there are other factors like friction and stuff which, keep, which change, right? So it's a long tail of things which become different as we go on and increase the speed. So, you know, we were trying to get agility by incorporating vision. And what we found is that, hey, you know, the MPC models which were there are good, but for slow locomotion, they're not appropriate for fast locomotion. So that prompted us to go and say, hey, let us try to see if we can improve the low level controller. Now, one possibility is to tweak the MPC, which one can do, but it takes a lot of time to do it. And the other possibility is we can collect large amounts of data and by doing that, we can reduce the amount of human effort required to build a more robust controller. So then, you know, what we can do is, you know, we can leverage simulation where we can collect lots and lots of data, right? In three hours, we can collect 100 days of experience, which is great, right? So now once we've been in simulation, we want to deploy these policies in, you know, different kinds of terrains. Right. And typically what people end up doing is this idea of domain randomization, right? For example, they'll vary the friction coefficient so that the robot can walk in conditions which have different frictions, right? But the challenge with domain randomization has been that if we randomize the domain parameters, then we get more robustness, which is shown in the red line, but the peak performance is different. And the reason this happens is because you ask the robot to perform well, no matter what the terrain is, but it doesn't know what the terrain is. So it learns something which works across everything, 
suppose I told you, hey, you have to walk on ice and you have to talk, walk on carpet, but I don't tell you whether you're on carpet or ice, you will learn a walking strategy which is very conservative. Right? So you get this trade-off, now which is bad for doing agile locomotion. Right? So you know, what has happened in the past couple of years is that you know, people have managed to push this gap. Right? And the way this has been done is using online system identification, that you identify what are the right parameters of the terrain that you are in. And you know, there are several works you know, which have you know, uh, pursued this idea. And you know, if you do this, you, know, you end up getting you know, these robotic systems which can you know, robustly walk on diverse terrains. Right? Now to go on to you know, some details of you know, the system, the way they work is they have the state, which is coming from proprioception and some other sensors, and you have some commanded velocity, and you predict the necessary actions. So let's consider you know, what happens when we command different velocities. So here is my robot. You know, I want it to run fast, but maybe I also want it to spin fast, right? which is trying to be more agile. So now what I'm showing you is the distribution of velocities that we're going to command. So if we command you know, small velocities, then everything is great and we get this slow walking behavior, right? But if we try to increase the range of velocities that we command to enable fast running, what we find is the training fails. Right? And the reason this training is failing is because you know, there's a fundamental limit that either you can run very fast or you can spin very fast. You can't do both of them simultaneously. The reason is that there are going to be centrifugal forces which are there, right? So what ends up happening is, you know, because of this, you know, physical constraints which exist, you know, there is a region of command which are feasible. Some things are infeasible, and if we blindly keep on increasing the velocities that we command the robot, what might happen is that most of the commands that we're giving to the robot are infeasible. What that means is it doesn't get rewards for these commands. So if you don't get rewards for most of the commands you're giving, the training is going to fail, right? And that's why you know, just commanding fast velocities doesn't work out of the bat, right? So what you want to do is, right, you want to increase the commands, but while following the physical limitations of the system, right? So what we did was to develop a method which could automatically figure out what is feasible and what is infeasible. Right? This ensures that a system can now learn how to be agile, right? And you know, and if you do this, you know, we can, you know, break the speed record on you know this particular you know quadruped, the mini cheetah. But now it's not just you know in in the lab setting, but we can really take it you know outdoors in challenging scenarios. For example, over here, it's you know slipping over ice, but it's still performing the task. Or you know, if we use a controller that I was showing initially, the MPC controller, if you're going on gravel, you know, it struggles. But this new controller, you know, now that we have trained, is able to navigate these challenging terrains and you know, still you know, be robust. Now it's not the most elegant gait, but it gets the job done. Right? And sometimes, you know, when you're deploying the system, not everything works out as expected. For example, over here a screw from a motor came out. So what you will see is that this robot is now limping, but it's still working. Right? So that's the kind of robustness that you really want from real world systems. So while this is good, you know, the question is what happens if I get a new task? Right? So you know, in, in previous things, you know, we hadn't anticipated you know, big obstacles. So if you now try to climb stairs, the robot fails. Or what happens if the robot has to go under this bar, right? So now there are things that we did not anticipate during training time, so we didn't design them. So now if you have to do these things, the robot fails, right? So the, the problem is when you train in simulation and say, hey, we're going to transfer to the real world, what does the real world actually mean? You know, does it mean you know, climbing stairs? Does it mean going under obstacles? Does it mean walking on sand? It could be any of these. Right. So, you know, one paradigm is that, okay, if you fail in the real world, maybe we can do some, you know, real world fine tuning. 
you know, some people are pursuing this. I think this is an exciting direction, but there are many challenges in really doing the real world fine tuning, right? So, you know, alternatively, if you were to stick to this paradigm of sim to real, right? You know, the kind of questions that people ask is, you know, what are the tasks that I can train for so that I can transfer to, you know, different conditions? You know, how do I choose terrains? And, you know, how do I set other simulation parameters? The problem in coming up with these choices is that, you know, it is unknown what the real world is going to look like. So what happens is if a policy fails, you go back and tweak something in your training paradigm, and then you deploy it. But this process often takes, you know, hours or days or sometimes weeks. So this is, you know, very slow, right? So can we do something to prepare for an unknown future? And you know, one idea that we have you know, pursued and to make this be very extreme is to say, hey, if you train on flat ground, can we now start walking stairs or start crouching under obstacles? And the idea is that instead of learning how to solve the task in one way, what about we learn how to solve a task in multiple ways? Right. So, you know, to make this more concrete, you know, what we learn is, you know, different ways of walking, right, which is shown by these different gates. Right? And what's actually happening over here is, you know, these different gates are, you know, parameterized and these are, you know, different behaviors. And, you know, we can control these behaviors and, you know, in, in a continuous way, we can change the contact timing, the swing motion, the body posture and so on by providing them as input. Then the human can actually tune them if the robot fails. So now the tuning can happen in a matter of seconds instead of hours or days, right? So for example, over here, the robot was failing to climb stairs. What we can do is we can adjust the foot swing. And if we adjust it, now it you know, starts climbing over stairs. But now if you have low foot swing, you go on you know, a slippery terrain, you can you know, fall over. Right, because if you are slippery terrain, you want to walk so that your you know feet make frequent contact. So we can go and change that, you know, again in a matter of seconds, and the robot is successful. Right now, similarly over here, you know, we can change the height of the robot so it can crouch, and you know now go under this obstacle over here. Right, so the point being that hey, you know, we don't know what the future is going to look like, but what we can do is we can provide some knobs you know, that one can tune. And by tuning these knobs, you know, we can start traversing over challenging terrains, right? So, okay, so what we, you know, now did was we wanted to be agile. We tried doing vision. We ran into the problem with the low level. Now that we have fixed the low level, we can go back, you know, and start doing more perception stuff, right? So for example, now, you know, we have our robots, you know, like playing around with a soccer ball, you know, everything is happening on board. And, you know, you can also have a human, you know, who is, you know, dribbling the ball and the robot, you know, follows the ball, it dribbles it. We can go into more challenging scenarios. It was snowing in Boston a couple of days ago, you know, and, you know, we can have a robot which can, you know, dribble balls, you know, despite the snow. So, and then the last thing which comes is the hardware, right? So if you look at, you know, all the quadrupeds I've shown until now, they have these balls in the foot. And the reason they have balls is because balls make point contact with the ground. So if you're in the model-based, you know, pipeline, it's easier to write down the model, right? But imagine if you have to run fast, but you didn't have, you know, ankles, it's going to be really hard, right? So, you know, what we have been doing is, you know, saying that, hey, well, if we are going to really be doing learning, you know, we don't have to care about how complex the model is going to be. So we can actually deal with complex models and enable innovations in hardware, which may not be possible, right? So for example, we can go and manufacture ankles that we can now put on the robot and then, you know, try to learn, you know, policies which work with these ankles, right? So in some ways, you know, you know, really going for agile, you know, tasks require a full stack approach where we innovate on control, perception, and the hardware to push the limits of agility. I'm out of time now or pretty much. Okay, great. So, you know, maybe I will, you know, stop here and maybe I'll just leave you 
with one thing that, hey, you know, you can do these things for control, but you can pretty much apply the same framework for doing a bunch of manipulation tasks. But I'm out of time, so I, you know, won't have time to discuss this, but, you know, I'll just show, you know, one video of the kind of things that we can achieve, right? So for example, if I want to reorient this object to the goal shown on the top right, right, we can start doing these kind of reorientations, which requires, you know, dynamic and agile control of objects. You know, with that, I'm going to stop. And, you know, thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Well, next speaker gets set up. Maybe like one very, very quick, big, quick, quick question. Does anybody have a very short question? Uh, for the case when you had built those mechanical ankles, um, I guess one challenge is you have to sim be able to simulate that as well. So I guess, how do you overcome that? And do you have results on those uh, new hardware as well? Uh, great question. So I, I think it's, so we have to simulate so if you look at a lot of the problems here in building these new sort of models with work there. So we are able to bounce out that problem. And so that's that's the main benefit from learning. It's not that we don't need the model, we need a model. But maybe connecting data to the model is easier than optimizing to that Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Henny Benamore from uh, Arizona State University. Please take it away. Okay. Perfect. So test test. Um, okay. So hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Henny Venamo from Arizona State University, and the talk today is on timing. So timing is everything. Phase estimation for agile and interactive robotic skills. Um, maybe a little bit of a background about myself. Um, I lead the ASU Interactive Robotics Lab, and roughly speaking, the kind of things that we do at uh, my lab are exactly the topics um, of this workshop today. So agile robots that do things like learning to play basketball, um, learning to manipulate objects, but also locomotion, crawling, that kind of stuff. Okay, so today we've heard already a lot of things about robot learning. So I don't want to kind of repeat what my colleagues have been showing uh, so um, nicely today, but rather focus on sort of a, a different sub aspect, namely timing and phase estimation. And the main argument that I'll be making is that timing and phase estimation can substantially improve motor skill execution, and in particular also generalization to new situations. But for that, let's first understand what do I actually mean by timing? So if you think about a lot of agile tasks in the real world, we often have some sort of internal clock or metronome that sort of dictates the flow and timing um, of the actions that we're going to execute, right? Uh, so things like, for example, sports, you typically think about you know, timing very carefully if you're you know, a professional sportsman, but also things like, uh, for example, um, you know, jumping over ropes, so rope jumping, you have to synchronize your actions with your human partner, right? Um, so there's often this idea of synchronization, adaptation of phase and timing. However, if we look at the typical motor skill learning literature, in particular in imitation learning, which is what I focus on, um, so quite often it is assumed that we can actually control time or that we have some control over time. So um, here, for example, we have some uh, you know, very famous papers in imitation learning, Eisberg, Kober, and Peters, uh, so Jan Peters gave the talk today also, the invited talk. And so quite often the assumption is that we have a phase variable that is sort of our internal clock. Um, and so the phase variable is a number between zero and one. Um, so for example, it could be um, zero at the beginning and one at the end. And we assume that it's monotonically decreasing or increasing. So there is some form um, of um, a human provided guidance on how time is going to evolve. However, that's not necessarily true. Oftentimes we need to adapt our timing to environmental conditions, right? Environmental conditions, for example, the object we're manipulating or maybe the human interaction partner and so on. So rather than de defining the phase, I'm basically arguing here in this talk that we need to do joint 
inference, joint estimation of time and space uh, in order to you know, generalize our actions and create robots that can really um, execute behaviors uh, with the right kind of timing and according to the current environmental conditions. Just to make this a little bit clearer, here's an example. So what we see here is just roughly sort of a depiction of a robot performing peg insertion. And so we see on the right side, sort of the, the bracket that needs to be inserted. And we see on the X axis, we have a, just a rough visualization of the temporal phase. So zero would be at the beginning. And then at the end, the assumption is phase, the phase variable would be one. Um, and in instead of just um, sort of hand coding that, pre-programming pre that, the assumption is we really need to be listening to an, our environment. So for example, one thing that can happen, uh, let's actually go, oh yeah. Uh, so one thing that can happen is that as we execute the task, the robot creates or has some contact with the environment. If that happens, then we need to slow down our temporal phase progression and say, well, we, we are still at this point in time, we didn't actually move forward. Similarly, there could be you know, physical contact with a human or you know, the object slipping away and so on. So what we really need is to adapt and adjust or basically reevaluate our internal clock and our internal metronome according to environmental conditions. And so that's called phase estimation. So we try to estimate the um, phase variable phi according to environmental factors that we're currently seeing. So here's a visualization of that. Um, we can see here basically our current estimate of phi, that's this blue line. And as the robot is executing a task, our current estimate of the time is constantly readjusted. In the beginning, it's just monotonically increasing, but then um, whenever there is some sort of pushback from the environment, it gets potentially even um, readjusted backwards in time. Okay, so, so how can we do this? Well, in our specific framework, the way we do this is through Bayesian uh, recursive Bayesian filtering. Um, so uh, pretty straightforward. We take observations from the environment, so multimodal observations that could be, for example, force components, vision, meaning, for example, where an object is right now, um, the current uh, internal state of the robot, so the joint configuration. And then we try to generate a posterior over the true robot state um, at the current time step. And so in our specific case, the robot state is actually defined through both spatial and temporal components. So the parameter theta here is a spatial component that defines the trajectory of the robot, whereas phi and phi dot define the temporal components. So the current phase and the phase velocity. And so just roughly to visualize what's going on. So we have a set of basis functions. We multiply them with a spatial component that gives us a trajectory. So that's how our pink line here. And then we take the current phase as currently estimated and push it forward using the phase velocity. So we have both estimates over the current trajectory of the robot as well as the current. Okay, so now let's put all of this into practice. So here we, for example, we see uh, a task where a bimanual robot is executing the insertion task as seen earlier. And in this kind of situation, we actually have different types of synchronizations that need to go on and different adaptations in time. So one of the things that needs to happen is that both arms need to be at all times perfectly synchronized. Otherwise, they might also get out of step, right? The other type of adaptation is adaptation to contact with the environment. So for example, as you are inserting the bracket, the robot may actually be jamming the object into uh, the pegs and, and not really moving forward. And so there again, we need to kind of slow down our temporal execution for the robot to have time to autocorrect and refine its actions. Um, here's a, a video of this, all of this running really on a real robot setup. And you can see that we can do this very fast. Uh, we actually slowed down the execution here just to show, to be able to show what's going on. Here in the left upper corner, you can see that one of the pegs is basically uh, jammed and then the robot kind of nicely kind of fiddles it in and, and gets it inside. Okay, you may be arguing that's not necessarily a really super agile motion. So that's why here I'm showing a different example for throwing and catching. Um, again, keep in mind that this is an imitation learning approach. Um, so here what we did is we had one student throw a ball and the other one 
teaching kinesthetically the robot how to catch the ball. So that's how we collect the data. And then the idea is after that, the uh, student, one of the students would be throwing the ball and the robot would be catching it. Um, in order to estimate the state, in this case, we're actually using a number of multimodal sensors. So for example, the ball position, motion capture from the human, but also forces measured from a smart shoe sensor. So once we take all of this data, we can actually again perform the same process and then catch the ball as it's been thrown. We also asked the student to blindfold. Um, yeah, we, we blindfolded the student and had him throw the ball and the robot would catch it. Again, a key ingredient, kind of the special sauce here is temporal estimation. And we can see here in the left upper corner again, our current estimate for phase, it moves from the left side to the right side. And, and please also notice that we also have uncertainty. We have the variance over uh, our current phase estimate where we think we are in time. And maybe as a final example, um, this is now from the field of uh, walking and prosthetics. Um, so obviously human walking has different phases and this has been studied in uh, you know, motor uh, control for quite a long time. So the uh, swing phase, heel strike and so on. Um, and when it comes to using prosthetics, the robot's phase needs to be adapted to that of the human wearer. So if you have an amputee, you need to make sure that the robot actually matches the uh, synchronization or synchronizes its uh, phase to the phase of the human partner. And so that's what we did in, in one of uh, the studies that we had in an NSF uh, funded project. Um, by the way, here in the picture you'll see, so for this specific video that I'll be showing, we had actually an able-bodied person. Um, and in this case, we used a bypass in order to attach the robot um, prosthesis to the person. So again, we use the same framework um, and achieve basically, oops, let's go backward. Let's start the video. So again, we use the same framework in order to synchronize the motions of the prosthesis to that of the person. And uh, you can see here that we um, get sort of a, a nice synchronization between the two. The phase of the robot matches that of the person. And just to kind of wrap up my talk, I'd like to show this type of chart um, anyone recognize this or kind of know what this is? No? So in animation, which is you know, the traditional art of creating life and creating motion, before anyone starts to animate anything, they create this type of time chart. It's actually a very precise timing of when to perform which kind of action. And it turns out some of the best animators are not those that can draw the best, but those that get the timing the best. And in animation, there are quite a number of books on timing for animation. And it's really not only an artistic process, but really well thought through process of how to create timing so as, so as to achieve a certain uh, effect and a certain motion. And so with that, I'd like to finish my talk here. Also a couple of other examples. Um, and if you ever want to have a teddy bear hug you, please come visit me in my lab. Uh, we have a robot that learns how to hug you and adapts its style to you. Uh, I'd love to show it to you. So again, as a summary, timing and phase estimation is really important. I think in the field of robot learning, we don't really think about explicit phase estimation too much. And that would be great if we can all think a little bit more about algorithms for explicit temporal reasoning. With that, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Um, well, next speaker gets it up. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? I think we have time for one question. Yeah, so thanks for the nice talk. I'm curious, so this this whole like phase idea, right? Implicitly in there, there's this notion that you're tracking a trajectory, it, it seems, right? Exactly. That's pre, predefined. So I'm wondering, like, in my experience doing trajectory tracking online, you you can, I, I, I totally agree with that this timing phase thing is important, but also if you get knocked sufficiently far off the reference, yes. um, you know, all, all manner of bad things can happen. So I'm wondering, like, um, what are your thoughts on this? I guess basically like, this notion that you're kind of always tied to a particular reference trajectory that you're following and how far off from that can you get and when does it make sense to sort of just okay. replan from scratch? Yeah, absolutely right. So uh, first of all, this is a probabilistic approach. So we actually have a number of training demonstrations that we use. Um, so at least we'd have an envelope, right? But even then you can actually get outside of the envelope. Um, but I think we are also explicitly modeled all of this as a probabilistic approach so that we get uncertainty bounds and 
use that to basically then say, okay, right now we really can't kind of trust any of this, right? Um, so, so that's kind of our mechanism that we've been using so far. But I think ultimately I agree with you that this is sort of a more general topic. When you use these kind of approaches and you're knocked out of the um, kind of envelope of probability that you have right now, what do you do then? Um, that's a more general question that we have here for which I don't have an answer right now. Thanks so much. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe we could take one more question because we're setting up the Zoom. Um, we have time for one more question. Perfect. Does anybody have another question? Um, no. Okay. Just <laughs> let's say speak one more time. Thank you. It should be. Oh. This is a record. Okay. Uh, uh, my name is Heon Park uh, from KAIST Mechanical Engineering. Uh, today I will talk about agile legged locomotion with uh, MPC and RL. So today uh, I will mainly talk about these two robots. Uh, the first one is KAIST Hound. Uh, it is supposed to be uh, supposed to run very fast. And then the second robot is Marvel. Uh, it's a climbing legged robot. So the the first, the KAIST Hound uh, is actually developed uh, in my lab. And then uh, we do a uh, uh, motor module design with a planetary gear design. And then the gear, number of gear test is chosen by uh, running some mixed integer nonlinear programming. And then uh, it's a specification is, uh, uh, as shown in below, it's a 45 kilogram robot. It's pretty big robot. It's bigger than uh, Spam Mini. And then uh, it has a uh, tremendous amount of uh, the motor, motor torque. The second robot is a uh, uh, Marvel, uh, and then it's a uh, 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 climbing robot uh, on ferromagnetic surfaces. And, uh, and of course, we need the radiation force to the uh, steel surfaces. So we designed the magnetic foot, which can provide the radiation force enough to provide a uh, very dynamic uh, climbing locomotion. <clears throat> and it's made with the uh, electro permanent magnet. So we designed the new electro permanent magnet. And this electron permanent magnet can switch on off state within uh, five milliseconds. And it does not need uh, any energy to hold on the on state, uh, unlike the permanent magnet. Uh, by the way, the, this robot uh, design is published in Science Robotics just in, in today morning. So if you are uh, interested in, uh, take a look at our paper uh, published in Science Robotics. <coughs> So this uh, marble robot uh, has uh, some unique feature that can pull with, uh, pull with uh, using uh, some uh, conventional technologies to design uh, controller. First of all, uh, there are no dynamic engine currently support simulation of this robot. So this can pull with using over reinforcement learning. And there is no motion caption data uh, from animals because there are no animals uh, work on like climbing on the ferromagnetic surfaces. So imitation learning could be difficult. And there are no good solutions in biology because the gecko uses totally different audition. So they have a different uh, motions. <clears throat> so bio-inspired or bio-imitated approach uh, could be difficult to use in this robot. But uh, so these two robots, Kai Sound and the Marble has a has a really uh, close similarity in terms of modeling because uh, they are uh, they uh, can be simplified simplified to uh, single rigid body dynamics, uh, which is in the in uh, which is shown here, but different to uh, foot contact constraint. Okay, so because they have a different uh, design of the foot. Okay, so we decided to use a uh, model predictive control uh, to control this robot, these two robots. So if you look at the dynamics carefully, uh, this rotation matrix uh, evolves in manifold. So in, you know, in usual control design, they actually replaced with the oil angles and then to redrive the equation of motion and then formulate the problem. <clears throat> but as you know, uh, oil angles has a problem when we have very large errors, as well as uh, some singularity uh, in uh, caused by some uh, vertical pitch angles. So usually this is no problem uh, when we design controller for legged robot working on flat ground, but this map marble uh, will uh, do vertical and inverted climbing. So 
uh, we will have some singularity problem if we use oil angles in our formulation. So this is a uh, uh, nonlinear MPC on SO3. And this, uh, this is a tracking error. And this is a port force constraint. And this is a state variable. As you can see, rotation matrix evolves on SO3 manifold. So we have to take into account this when we uh, formulate our MPC problem. So <clears throat> that uh, optimization formulation turns into optimization on SO3 manifold. So we use retraction mapping utilizing the exponential coordinates. And then we redrive the optimization on vector space utilizing the exponential coordinate. And then uh, to run the uh, MPC very fast, we need the analytical gradient and Hessian over this optimization problem. So we use, utilize uh, Jacobian derivation in, on SO3 manifold. And we drive uh, Hessian matrix and gradient uh, vector uh, very efficiently. So with that, uh, we can run this MPC in real hardware uh, with 100 hertz, uh, 40 hertz of sampling time. Uh, in, in real robot. And we use our own QP solver to solve uh, this SQP problem. So this is uh, uh, Mabel, uh, uh, Kai is running with the three meter per sec. And this is push recovery uh, from the kicking. So, sorry. Um, so the, the, the video is not playing well. And this is a slow motion. And then you can see that uh, because of the slippery uh, block, wooden block, something is uh, not right. Yeah. Okay, let's just keep this. And uh, so the, the the gate I showed so far is actually a uh, trotting gate, but you can actually control the different gate sequence, trotting, pacing, and bounding, and galloping using the same model uh, MPC. As you can see here, this is a trotting, and this is pacing, and this is bounding, and this is galloping without changing any parameters. We just change the uh, gate sequences uh, uh, only. And then now we can transfer this uh, control algorithm to the climbing robot by only changing uh, the foot, con foot con uh, constraint. So there are two failure modes uh, in foot, con uh, foot contact. The first one is sliding. This is actually the same as uh, just uh, uh, the normal uh, walking robot. And then we have additional constraint uh, peeling off uh, failure modes. So these uh, two modes actually uh, provide the, the two inequality constraint. So our inequality constraint is an intersection over these two uh, inequality constraint. And then we impose that inequality constraint in our MPC formulation. <coughs> so as you can see, let me show. So this is a, a pacing gate, a vertical climbing pacing gate. The fact the, the maximum speed was uh, uh, 0.7 meter per sec. And the interesting, interestingly, in vertical climbing, the pacing was the pacing was faster than the throttling. And then this is inverted throat gate, which uh, uh, its maximum speed was 0.5 meter per sec. Yeah. And if you see the slow motion video, sorry, my computer is very slow. If you see the slow motion video, it looks kinematically same to normal gate, but it, it shows different ground direction first. So MPC actually can figure out this automatically yeah. with, a, uh, with just change of uh, foot contact constraint. And it can actually handle uh, two kilogram payload. And then uh, it can handle three kilogram payload in inverted uh, working. And you can uh, overcome uh, obstacles, like okay, you can see here, with a uh, very well planned motion. And you can trend, make a transition between horizontal 
or to body curl from body curl to uh, ceiling, inverted ceiling. Anyway, so you can see the video uh, in, uh, in our paper. And we tested this robot to a uh, water tank. And it's actually uh, covered with a very thick paint and then uh, rust and dust. So, but it can actually uh, climb the uh, water tank with 0.35 meter per sec. So this is the kind of a world record of uh, climbing leg of the locomotion robot. Yeah. But anyway, so 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 far MPC has been uh, used to, uh, in uh, these two robots, but there are actually some cases that uh, MPC has some limitation. As you can see here, the it actually step on the boundary of the uh, the treadmill, and then it can actually it could not change its gate, right? It should change its gate to recover from this. So. <clears throat> As we uh, as we already know that right, MPC need uh, well planned foot sequences as well as uh, some motion for very complex, you know, motions, right? So maybe reinforcement learning uh, could be a good solution to this. So we tried the uh, reinforcement learning as well, and then this robot can now uh, run with three point nine meter per sec and four point six six meter per sec now. With the reinforcement learning, and then, uh, but <clears throat> real function shaping is kind of a complex and then a long time uh, process actually. And we actually uh, discovered that it can actually handle that corner cases where the robot is actually step onto the uh, <clears throat> fixed uh, fixed the you know, boundary of the treadmill. Okay, so. But you you probably found out that the learning gate is actually very unnatural. I mean, it, it, at least it looks unnatural to me because the animals never use this kind of a gate for very fast running. And it actually looks like this unnatural uh, gate to me. I mean, when uh, the animals do this, when they feel happy, I mean, but we actually did not like optimize the happiness of the robot, so we don't know why. So one thing I discovered uh, uh, learning the reinforcement learning is actually it's actually a bit difficult to discover the gate with the pitch oscillation, nice pitch oscillation. <clears throat> so uh, we are now currently uh, pursuing the three different approaches to remedy the limitation of the MPC. The first one is. Uh, Contact implicit uh, model predicted control, uh, where you express, explicitly add a uh, contact model and then its gradient in MPC formulation. And second one is uh, imitation learning over MPC and then uh, reinforce the uh, imitated policy. And then last one is uh, uh, motion library. Uh, we can build the motion library from the fast track optimization and then kind of run. Uh, train the generated model and then add the reinforcement learning there. And then these are all very preliminary results. And then I will only talk about the first two approaches that we are currently uh, pursuing now. The first one is uh, contact uh, implementation model predictive control, which was published in IROS. And the, we are all, all only given this very trivial reference trajectory. And then the cost is just following this uh, trivial uh, reference trajectory. And this is a kind of this kind of discovered motion with the, the proposed MPC. And this is a continuous flipping. And this is a reference trajectory. And then we don't give any gauge sequences. And this robot, uh, this MPC auto automatically discovers the full sequence online. And this are, these are the uh, comparison between different uh, way of uh, analytical gradient. So if we use just analytical gradient, it does not break the contact. If we use uh, analytical gradient with heuristics proposed in here, then it can break the, the, uh, some contact, but it does not provide the periodic motion. With uh, our uh, analytical gradient, we, it can actually repeatedly jump. And we are extending this idea to uh, 3D robot. And this is actually unstable pose. The robot has to... Uh, uh, discover the foot sequences 
Anyway, so I will skip to the summary of uh, my talk. So with this to uh, for this robot, we can we could control the body uh, using body project control. We can control the running robot and the agile climbing uh, leg the locomotion. Then we are uh, actually working toward to uh, hybrid of MPC and RL approach and then contact implicit MPC. So thank you. Uh, Great. We have maybe question for uh, time for one question. So our next speaker is Jitendra Malik from UC Berkeley. Can you use that mic? Yeah. Hello. Uh, okay, so let me start. Okay, so I want to start with a video. This way, yeah. Okay, can you, you hear me and in remote land? Okay. So I want to start with a demo. So this is a robot which is walking. Uh, there's a paper on it in the main conference. Uh, all it has is onboard computing and onboard uh, sensing. The camera and the head of the robot is all that is. It does not know the environment. And uh, we have tried this policy on different kinds of stepping stools and so on. Okay, uh, here's this climbing on stairs. Note the height of each step is more or less the height of the robot. Okay, unfortunately it's laggy because of... Uh, So it's completely adaptive. Okay. Okay, so how to think about this work? Uh, there is, uh, in control theory, I mean, 1960 is like a golden period where optimal control and many of the big ideas were developed and uh, Kalman and so forth. I mean, this is the stuff that led a man to land on moon, right? Uh, there is something from that era called adaptive control, which somehow was like the less forgotten Let's remember it, cousin. But basically, the idea is I mean, this is your standard linear kind of model. But the important point is that the system dynamics itself can change. And when we talk about walking robots, it's going to change drastically. I mean, we can have different kinds of terrain. You can have soft sand, you can have hard road, you can have concrete, you can have uphill, downhill, you can have leafy terrain, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we have tried a robot in a very wide variety of conditions. So the canonical example from the 1960s was you have an airplane and in the beginning of the flight, it's heavy because it has a lot of fuel. By the end of the flight, it has much less mass and you have to adapt to that. And there are ideas from that era called, uh, I mean, there's model reference adaptive control. There are indirect methods, direct methods. I mean, I'm doing this to, for people who know the control literature. 
The point is we can revisit all this in the modern deep learning era. And that's basically what we have done. And we did this with this. Uh, so if you remember one thing from this talk, it's this uh, idea which we call rapid motor adaptation or RMA for short. So think of it as adaptive control done with the tools of deep learning and reinforcement learning. It's just that. But we've got a pretty general formulation and we can use it in a variety of different settings. So this paper was presented at last RSS. Then we could do walking in, uh, on, we showed walking on various kinds of terrains, but it was a blind robot. Key principle, no pre-programmed gates. So nothing is pre-programmed, no footfall pattern is imitated or any such thing. In fact, there's evidence from when people learn how to, children learn how to walk, they don't follow any gate. So this business about that gates are, you know, gallop and trot and pace. I mean, this is, this is a myth, okay? This is uh, when children learn to walk, it's not, there is this periodic pattern for walking and running that is that emerges much later. And it's a consequence of efficiency. Energy efficiency requires that periodicity, but basic walking does not require that. Kids can walk like this or like this and so forth. So we did not program any gates. Everything has to emerge. The basic idea here, which I'm, I mean, obviously I'm not going to go into the details of the paper, but key concept here is that there's a policy that is trained with reinforcement learning and simulation. That's, everybody does that. There's a, a, an extra argument called Z, Z sub T. This is a latent, and this is capturing the, the, the environment. So Z sub T is, in our case, an eight-dimensional vector, and it's going to vary depending on what kind of terrain you are in. Now, of course, you don't know that in advance. So this itself has to be estimated. So you're running an estimator, uh, which is called the adaptation module, and which uses the immediate past history of the robot. And if this is going to work, this has to be a very fast process. So basically there is the, the control loop at which the, the base policy is running. And then there is a outer loop at which this Z sub T is being estimated. And this is operating at something like 10 Hertz. And there's a technique by which this itself can be trained in simulation. And what this is based on is the past history. So if you want to think of it in like the standard Kalman story, we are, we are trying to estimate this. The, the, this is, okay. So that's the big idea. And uh, okay, I'll show you a demo which gives the, the, an explanation of what's going on. And for agile locomotion, it's very important that this estimation happen very quickly and reliably. So we are going to have this robot walk. Okay, so there's Ashish who's actually standing there. What he's done is he's got this mattress and he's poured some olive oil on the mattress. Okay. And now the robot is going to try to walk on this. Okay. And then what will happen is that, okay, sorry, this thing is, okay. So then there are the feet of the robot have some plastic on it. Okay. So notice it starts to slip and then it walks, right? So these are, this is what I mean. The environment is changing, so the model is changing and we need to change the policy. So the policy gets one argument which corresponds to the Z, but now the challenge is this itself has to be estimated quickly, right? Okay, this is a slow-mo version. You notice slipping, okay? And uh, okay, so that's the, the idea. And it turns out that we can actually estimate this quickly in this period of like 0.1 second, 0.2 seconds and so forth. And that's what enables it to recover. Okay, another characteristic is that uh, we, uh, we don't need to program any gates. So we our reward function is just energy. This is what you should think of for a biological system. When you're walking or running, you're just trying to get somewhere and you want to use minimal energy. So if you go at a small uh, speed, uh, there's a walking gait that emerges at medium, it's trot, and then there's a gallop. So this footfall pattern was not pre-programmed, it just emerged. It's a consequence of energy efficiency, and this is known from the biomechanics literature. For humans, at low speeds, walking is efficient. At high speeds, running is efficient. But this is not programmed. It just comes, 
You just make sure that your cost function is energy in it. Okay, so now how do we deal with, uh, so this was, I showed you a blind robot which was slipping. Now, how do you deal with, uh, uh, what is the advantage of vision? Vision enables you to anticipate. So you can estimate the terrain in front of you. So here, what you have is like this egocentric depth, which is from this camera on the head of the robot. And from that, we run an, an estimator, which is estimating basically uh, some aspects of the terrain. And those aspects of the terrain are estimated just for the sake of uh, being able to walk and not fall. Like, you know, when the robot was walking on these stools, it should not fall down. So that, so there was basically think of it as there was a Z sub T, which was made, uh, capturing some aspects of the environment. Now you have some other variables which are capturing uh, aspects of the slope of the terrain. Very important. We are not doing any map building. This is not like SLAM. This is uh, what, for example, the Zurich group's effort is like building a map from multiple views. No, there's no such thing. Trying to build a map, is, a terrain map is solving an intermediate problem, which is harder than the, the real problem that you need to solve, which is just avoid falling. Okay, uh, and this, I said RMA is like a general technique for adaptive control and therefore it should apply to multiple settings. So here's a setting which is a, a, a dexterous hand manipulation task. So note, it's exactly one policy, okay? It's not been changed and it can generalize to these different objects. And uh, the next slide shows what, uh, so at the top you have sort of the size of the object, the weight of the object and things like that. And basically exactly the same policy is being done. So what's the difference? Again, that's Z. We are estimating online very quickly in a period of like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds. Uh, this uh, uh, something which corresponds to the shape of the object, something which corresponds to the weight of the object and so on. And so these are different examples. Again, uh, yeah, so different shapes. So the essence of uh, for robotics is generalization and adaptation. And uh, I mean, so robustness is part control theory tells us how to think about that. I think adaptation is what I think our innovation here is. And adaptation using the tools of deep learning rather than the tools from 1963 uh, from adaptive control. And, uh, and the cost function, I wanted to show you, because this reinforcement learning, the ugly underbelly is all the weird reward shaping that people do in order to hack through a solution. This is ugly, this is not what should be done. The reward function should be minimize energy, minimize impact forces, make it, uh, make it smooth, that's it. Everything else should just work from that. If, you're, if it's not working from that, then you're doing something wrong. And, uh, so we have this trainable module and basically the same architecture that we use for walking is used for dexterous manipulation. And uh, then in deployment time, this adaptation module, so notice it's the same architecture. So I'm advocating this as a general approach. The gate emerges, different gates emerge. I was first, spherical is a degenerate case. So your multiple approaches work. How does the Z T change? So it turns out, so I said that this thing is being estimated. It's got only uh, like some hidden state, which is five dimensional, eight dimensional. And those, uh, those aspects of, are being estimated online and they correspond to maybe the size of the object, maybe the weight of the object. So it's not, so please, I want to make clear, this is not the same as systems ID. Systems ID would estimate like 30 parameters and many of them will be unestimable. What we are trying to do is a much reduced version of it which is, uh, which is good enough for the task. So it's kind of like a simpler version of system ID, which is actually tractable. So all the 30 parameters, they in fact usually various combinations of those which, which can result in the same physical behavior. If you think of fluid mechanics and Reynolds number, Froude number and so on, those are all physical invariants. So if you have, you can vary certain quantities while keeping those invariants the same. Uh, we have applied this for uh, quadcopters, where basically we could uh, have the same policy 
for different size quadcopters, different weight quadcopters, because if the weight was wrong or the size was too much, then uh, so like here's this quadcopter, something has been attached to it. Uh, but it's the same policy for small quadcopters, large quadcopters. We don't have to put in different parameters for mass and size because as it starts to fly uh, from the dynamics in the first 0.3 seconds or whatever, it uh, those things get estimated, the Z gets estimated, and then the rest goes through. Okay. And one policy to, uh, so the same policy is deployed all the time. And then uh, finally, we, uh, yeah. And then we also have made this work for uh, uh, biped walking. So I'll conclude here. My general slogan is adaptive control done with, uh, done with uh, deep learning, reinforcement learning. We have worked out the methodology and it applies to a range of problems. And this is what you need for agile robotics. We have a robot outside. It will be walking up and down the stairs. You can watch it. Great. Are there any questions? Sorry. Thank you, Professor Malik. Uh, quick question. So uh, is there a reason specific to kind of take out the adaptive model separately? Can you just feed the whole state history? Is the problem like no, the size of the it, model? It's a, it's a much harder estimation problem then. So you could say, see, so in fact, this enables uh, asynchronous and rapid adaptation. So the adaptation module is asynchronous with respect to the main control loop. The main control loop is running at like 100 hertz or 200 hertz or 500 hertz. This Z sub T is being estimated at a, in, a, in a different way. It's usually a slower estimation, okay? And it can be just asynchronously just transferred and this problem, I mean, I didn't get into how we train that, but it turns out that this problem is basically a supervised learning problem. So it's a very stable problem. When you try to mix the two at the same time, it becomes much more challenging because reinforcement learning is notoriously unstable. And if you're trying to train a policy which has to uh, walk on sand and hard ground and up slopes and down slopes, that the task for reinforcement learning becomes terrible. Now the task for reinforcement learning is easy if it has to learn one policy for flat ground, one for slope up, et cetera. And that is captured by the Z. So it's even though it's one policy, the Z is making a different policies for different conditions. And then you just run an estimator for Z. That's the intuition. Great. One last quick question. Um, great method, very cool. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you had any safety constraints when initially adapting the Z. So let's say you, you move from, from concrete to some very slippery terrain. Are there any safety constraints on the robot's behavior or would, could it fall? No, we, we didn't incorporate anything. Okay. Uh, what is essential here is that the training conditions, so this robot is trained completely in simulation and then just put out into the real world. There is no, no, uh, no, nothing special done to go from simulation to real. And, and basically the idea is that we think of simulation to real as just being another kind of adaptation from real to real. But what's very important is that in simulation conditions, you should see a very large variety of conditions and, 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 and variations among them. And what, what you, you're not never, so the, it's not going to be identical to what you see in the real world, but they should be equivalent proxies in some sense. And they are equivalent in the sense of Z being nearby. And if our training conditions are not sufficiently rich, then there'll be trouble because then you'll go into a part of Z space for which we have not trained in simulation. So then it'll be unsafe. So the, we haven't put in any safety monitors, but the way I would put it in is basically if Z goes out of, you're, you're always monitoring Z. And if you monitor Z and it is outside your convex hull of what you saw in training, then block. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great talk. So I was also wondering if the like module can also handle like longer time horizon problems. Like maybe there's more information that you need from a few seconds ago. So will the, do you think it's a limitation that it can maybe is focusing on adapting to things really quickly rather than other problems that might have longer 
Uh, I mean, so the setting that we talked about, uh, I mean, so in this walking kind of setting, events happen within one or two seconds. So if I don't adapt, I'm going to fall, right? So therefore the adaptation, so that sort of imposes a certain temporal uh, sort of uh, clock rate that I need to honor. Now, there are certain other settings where we can adapt more slowly. Uh, like for example, if you're just doing long range navigation or something like that. And uh, I, I can imagine this some, some version of this idea which is applicable. There's nothing in the math which says that it has to be 0.2 seconds. But I think of 0.2 seconds as making sense because of the, 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 the natural temporal uh, frequencies of walking, right? Which is basically like all the actions of walking are around one hertz. I mean, in fact, I would say it the other way around. We, why do we use one second as a unit of time? Because it's a very natural unit for humans given walking, right? I mean, the, if you think of the leg as a pendulum, the time period is close to a second and so on. Great, thank you. With that, let's move on to our next speakers. Amireja Saban and Xiangun Meng from University of Washington. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Cool, thank you. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see it. All right, let me get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Xiang Yun, and I'm from University of Washington. So today I'm going to present uh, the terrain perception system for the RACER program. So I'm part of the RACER team. Currently, I'm the perception leader of RACER, and the whole RACER project is aimed at achieving aggressive, resilient, high-speed navigation off-road off terrain on a real-side vehicle. To, so to get motivated by this problem, we all quite familiar with on-road driving, where we start to have self-driving uh, cars that are able to carry passengers and deliver goods robustly in on-road city-like environments. But these self-driving vehicles, they also have a kind of limitation because they only work in city-like environments. And that's because they make some assumptions on the structure of the, the environment they navigate within. For example, they may assume that the road is mostly flat and the off there are either obstacles or free space and uh, you already have a kind of a map for you to uh, do the planning to get what to get the route to get to the destination. But in contrast, when it comes to off-road driving, things are much more different. So the vehicle is going to drive in an unstructured environment. It's no longer to have a map, and uh, the the traversability is much more nuanced than on-road drive. But if we can make a vehicle like drive fast in off-road terrain, that actually expand the capability of ground vehicles to make it work in like a, a large, uh, large um, um, other kind of applications, for example, uh, remote inspection, agriculture, or uh, search and rescue. So what are the challenges in off-road perception? Uh, there are quite a number of challenges, but here I'm just going to list three of the main challenges. So first is uh, there's no distinction between free space and obstacles. Um, so it's no longer a binary cost, but you have a spectrum of cost to consider. And in particular, the, the cost of the traversability of the terrain also depend on the physical size of the vehicle. For example, for a large vehicle, uh, it can drive through large bushes uh, without any problem. And second, there's no map of the environment, so you cannot rely on a prior map to do the planning or, or make the perception part easier. You have to rely on your onboard sensors to do the state estimation. And thirdly, is the terrain is mostly non-flat. You will have hills and ditches, and this can actually uh, affect how you like to plan a, um, uh, how you plan a trajectory. Because you, if you want the vehicle to drive uh, on a slope, you don't want it to drive too fast because the vehicle is likely to roll over. And similarly, you don't want the vehicle to drive high speed around uh, close to a ditch because uh, that can se se severely damage the vehicle. Uh, because of those so many challenges in uh, high-speed off-road driving, DARPA recently launched the RACER program, and you can find more details uh, um, uh, in that link. 
So basically we have a um, real vehicle. It's a modified Polaris vehicle with a maximum speed of more than 20 meters per second. It also consists of a suite of sensors, including multiple LIDARs, stereo cameras, infrared cameras, radar, and even event cameras. It has multiple uh, desktop uh, level GPUs. Uh, so you can run like pretty heavy neural nets on it. So this gives us like a pretty cool platform to actually uh, advance off-road, uh, especially high-speed autonomous off-road driving. And here I want to give you a, a teaser video of our, our current uh, perception system and the whole, especially the whole autonomous system is capable of. And this is a video. I'm going to just mute the video. This, this is a video uh, consists of a uh, number of runs we did over the past year uh, on a diverse, a, diver, a diverse set of terrains. So here you can see the vehicles driving fully autonomously on this pretty hilly terrain with lots of bushes uh, around. And the bushes are various sizes. You can see some of the bushes are like small enough so the robot can just crush through it. But there are also some large bushes that the vehicle would actually would like to stay away from them. And when the vehicle is uh, driving downhill, it will try to slow down. And when the vehicle is driving uphill, it needs to gain some momentum in order to, to actually climb the hill. Uh, I want to like, move to another point of this video. You can see is another very different uh, kind of environment where you see lots of puddles on the ground and lots of splashes of water when the vehicle drives through it. And you can see the sensor might occasionally get blocked by the water. So the perception system has to be robust to do this kind of noise in the, in the sensors. Also, sometimes lighting condition can be also unfriendly. So how do we do the perception for aggressive off-road driving? And before digging into the details, I just want to give you like a high level overview of what the perception system is doing in this stack. Uh, we adopt a pretty conventional autonomous navigation stack consisting of the perception system and the local and the global planner. So the perception system, system would take the sensor data, for example, LIDAR and camera, and then produce this bird's eye view cost map around the vehicle. And uh, each location in the cost map will encode the cost of that location and how traversable it is. And then the global planner would take the cost map and the GPS goal and produce a waypoint close to the vehicle for the local planner to, to follow. The local planner would take the cost map and the waypoint to compute what the optimal control is. So you, see, so you, so you can see here the key of the perception system is to produce this uh, bird's eye view cost map that is um, that can be used by the global and the local planners. So what would be the... Uh, objectives of, for terrain perception. What are the things that we need to predict to get a good cost map? So here we designed the terrain perception system to capture both the semantic and geometry of the environment. Uh, more specifically, we want the perception system to predict, produce two kinds, of cost, uh, two, two kinds of maps. So the left one is the semantic map, which encodes the semantic uh, properties of each location. So it's a um, probability distribution of the semantic classes. So here we have a 31 classes uh, um, ontology, which cover most of the commonly observed semantic classes uh, off-road terrains. And on the right side, you see this elevation map, which captured the geometry of the environment. So the elevation map encodes like the, the height of the ground at each location, but also it captures the size geometry of, of the objects, which is also important for estimating the traversability. Because we are doing high-speed off-road driving, uh, we need to estimate the terrain properties fast, completely, and consistently. And that's pretty challenging because the map is pretty large. We currently target like a 100 meter by 100 meter map, and we want to leverage multiple sensors to give us the best possible cost map. So if you adopt a classical approach, like just take the current observation or try to just accumulate the information from the past, you will struggle to sat satisfy all the requirements. So that motivated us to adopt a learning-based approach for terrain perception for high-speed off-road driving. So the terrain uh, perception system we use is called TerrainNet. It's a data-driven perception system. It's a single neural net for end-to-end -end learning of the terrain semantics and geometry. Uh, we have an early version of this that's been published in last year's Coro. So if you're interested, you can take a look at that paper. So at the high level, the terrain net would take sensors, uh, for example, LiDAR camera and robot motion from odometry, and then it would predict 
a set of um, semantic maps and elevation maps. And inside TerrainNet, here are some of the key building blocks. We have a set of 3D and 2D backbones to process 3D and 2D information. Uh, for example, the 3D backbone is mostly used for processing uh, LiDAR information. Uh, because LiDAR is sparse, we, here we mostly use a 3D sparse component. And for 2D backbones, we use it to, produce, to process the camera images. Uh, you can use any kind of your favorite uh, 2D image encoders like ResNet. And these feature maps from the 3D backbone and 2D backbones, they are spatially aligned. So we will fuse them and then uh, feed them into this recurrent terrain memory. Uh, the recurrent terrain memory is very much like a recurrent net, like uh, a GRU or LSTM, but it's, it's a 2D latent feature map. So we're kind of uh, accumulating the history using a recurrent memory. And then we feed the recurrent latent feature map into the inpainting network because the input uh, sensor data can be still sparse after recurrent layer. For example, your LiDAR points can be pretty sparse after like beyond 100 meters. So we use the inpainting network to fill in the gaps to uh, from the context of the surroundings. And then we can apply multiple decoders from the inpainted features to decode the semantic, uh, semantic maps and the elevation maps. So to train the, the terrain net, um, one of the most important things where we get the data. Uh, the, there's actually very few uh, data sets for off-road driving and the ones that exist, they don't contain challenging enough terrains to be useful for racer. So we set up our own data pipeline. Uh, like we, we show a screenshot here. Essentially, we follow what usually what has been done for on-road driving where you accumulate a number of LiDAR scans and ask people to label some of the important objects in the scene. But different from on-road uh, driving, uh, labeling off-road data uh, LiDAR scan can be pretty challenging because yeah, many times you actually don't know what the points are. So here we mostly sparsely label the points. We focus on objects that are important. For example, uh, lethal objects and objects that are uh, rare. Uh, so you see, on the, on, and also we use like the images to give the labels reference, like what things, uh, what are the corresponding LiDAR points correspond to in the image space. And we leverage uh, multimodal learning. Uh, essentially, even though we label LiDAR scans, we use the labels to train both LiDAR Im and image segmentation networks to help us to label a large amount of data. Uh, we adopt a semi and self-supervised training in this process. Uh, like for semi-supervised learning is we have a lot of unlabeled uh, LiDAR scans and we want to infer their semantic labels from the trained model. And for self-supervised training, uh, that's primarily used for elevation map because elevation map uh, essentially just estimate where the ground is and the size of objects. And those can be estimated by uh, having uh, like a complete point cloud. So you don't need to manually label those uh, properties. So here I will show you how Terrain Act worked on a diverse set of validation terrains um, on different kind of so you see the top left, you see the robot is driving on trail and you can see that the, the terrain is able to predict the complete trail um, like 50 meters away from the vehicle. And the bottom left, you can see the vehicle is driving on like a hilly terrains with lots of the trees around. So in general, we find that terrain net general, generalized well to a diverse set of uh, terrains. So now the, the question is, uh, we have the semantic and geometric prediction from terrain as well. How do we convert it into a cost map? And right now we just do a very simple mapping from, um, so for each semantic class, we have a specific cost associated with it. For example, for bushes, we'll have like a medium cost and grass have a lower cost and uh, rocks and trees will have uh, lethal costs. But we also adjust their cost based on the size of objects. For example, in this, um, in this video, you see that there is a bush in the uh, front right of the vehicle and actually they got detected diesel, which is marked as a magenta here. And the cost map, what you see here is um, uh, what is being converted from the predicted semantic and, and elevation maps. And the darker area means at a higher cost and diesel uh, is colored by the magenta. And if I play the video, you can see how the whole stack works together. So you have the global planner, which is the, the yellow line, which shows you the global plan. And the local planner is this, you can see there's multiple rollouts here. We are using MPPI for local planner. 
and you see this red trajectory, which is the computed optimal trajectory. And what I want to highlight here is that uh, you can see the cost map actually highlight the trail. The trail actually has a lower cost than the off-trail area so that we can have the lo local planners uh, keep the vehicle stay on trail so that you can drive at a high speed uh, to the goal. Yeah, so the racer project is still ongoing and we have a bunch of um, things we're working on right now to improve the current perception systems. For example, we want to predict uncertainties in the, uh, in the current uh, predict the semantic elevation map and those can be very useful for the planner. Uh, we want to incorporate additional sensor modalities like um, a vegetation camera, thermal camera and radar. Because we adopt uh, this uh, Cartesian representation of the map, adding additional sensor can be pretty, it's pretty easy. And finally, currently we rely on a, like a manually designed cost mapping to map those geo terrain uh, features to cost uh, to, to the cost. But uh, we want to uh, adopt a more learning driven approach to learn the cost from terrain features using uh, human demonstrations. Uh, so that's it. Um, I would like to thank my colleagues in the racer team and I'm happy to answer any questions. In the interest of time, we'll have to skip questions and move straight to our next talk by Andrew Rezegev. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yep. And see my slides? Yep. Okay. I'm all good to begin. Okay. Thank you for having me um, come over for this workshop. Um, so I'm going to present about the end to end design of bespoke dextrous snake like surgical robots, uh, which is one of my recent publications that I made um, in transactions and robotics. And I'm going to explain to you about how we went about designing snake-like surgical robotic arms using evolution algorithms. So firstly, I'll probably introduce myself. Um, so, okay. So, I'm part of the QUT's medical and healthcare robotics research team. Um, initially, back in the Australian Center for Robotic Vision, back in 2016, our group uh, was focused on creating a robotic solution for the knee arthroscopy problem. And we've got our medical um, expertise from Professor Ross Crawford, an orthopedic surgeon. We have Anjali. Jai Prakash for the robobiologist in our group, uh, Jonathan Roberts, our robotic specialist. And uh, these, these three all, I guess, led our group to try and create new uh, robotic solutions for knee arthroscopy. And I joined their group back when I was an undergraduate in mechatronics engineering, and I completed a PhD with them. And all of our research is now part of the QT Center for Robotics and the Center for Biomedical Technologies. So in my journey, um, I was involved in the snake robot project. That is, we're gonna we're trying to design a snake robot for knee arthroscopy. And from our humble origins in the ACRV, um, I worked with Dr. Liao Wu who was the lead for the snake robot project aspect of the medical robotics group. And then I published my first paper in hand gesture teleoperation. I started my PhD, creating a new robot called Snake Raven, which I'll introduce to you later on. My preliminary ideas for how to design the robot came about in 2019 with collaboration of David Howard. We also co-authored a chapter in the handbook of robotic and image guided surgery. And more recently, I completed the Snake Raven project, published some papers, my thesis, and I'm going to be graduating uh, real soon. So, 
let's get into the problem. So our research has been looking at how we can create a robotic solution for the knee arthroscopy problem. And currently in knee arthroscopy, the surgeon is basically doing all of this manually. They uh, have to hold a human leg and they're steering two rigid instruments that are attached um, into the knee. And from an arthroscope, they're trying to figure out where they are inside, inside that small cavity. And they're using another instrument to perform the intervention. And with this setup, what we see is that there's a limited visibility because you have a rigid small camera. There are multiple tasks to do, controlling the leg, steering instruments, looking at the monitor. The rigid tools constrain the motion um, that they can achieve inside that small cavity. And this whole operation it has per ergonomics, poor ergonomics, as it involves a lot of standing and manipulating the knee. So in addition, the, these tools are rigid and inflexible. So they bring limited visualization, poor instrument control from small incisions, and they are not specialized to patient cases. So we just use these same instruments for every patient scenario, which can be suboptimal um, in certain patient specific cases. And from certain opinions, uh, we did a survey back in 2017. We found that, um, that most surgeons find it very difficult to visualize inside the knee and would benefit from technology to help them visualize. Um, quite often they find that they might do damage to the cartilage. So because of the poor instruments that they have, there's a risk that they can actually unintentionally do more damage to the patient during the operation. And there is an interest in developing a semi-autonomous surgical system. If, if it can reduce damage, improve efficiency, increase their working life and enable concurrent, perhaps multiple surgeries. So let's have a look at what we want to do. So basically this was the dream of our medical robotics group. We wanted to create this surgical robotic system that incorporated all of these different aspects, um, ultrasound vision, leg manipulator, a robotic manipulator, computer vision systems. We could get a depth map and also identify features inside the knee. And the one aspect that I was most invested in is the snake-like instrumentation. So designing new surgical tools that are able to perform this intervention. And I'm going to talk to you all about uh, my approach in addressing this aspect of the problem. So this is, I guess, the concept that I came up with. Let's have a general purpose surgical robot the Raven 2, um, it is a, it, it's the large macro type of arm similar to the Da Vinci robotic system. And the idea is that this robot will be able to do all the procedures, but the instrument that is attached to it is going to be customized to the patient. And it'll be a small micro arm it will be an, a steerable snake-like end effector. And with this combination of this micro snake-like arm and this macro Raven 2 robotic arm, we have a macro micro manipulator that gives the robot both the workspace and the uh, work and the performance to be able to do the operation. And the surgeon will teleoperate the robot from a console. So let's see if I can get this video going. So just to show the robot and how it moves. So with the Raven 2, we can attach instrumentation to it. 
So this could be a custom uh, patient specific tool that's designed for the patient's anatomy. And the Raven 2 provides three degrees of freedom that is constrained about a remote center of motion. So there was a shoulder degree of freedom, elbow and insertion. And then there's the adapter, which essentially all of this is cable driven. And it's simply just cap stands and pulley wheels that keep the, the tendons that actuate the snake-like robot um, in tension. And then the last part, it should show the snake-like actuation. So this is a, a view of the snake-like end effector as a CAD model. It consists of four degrees of freedom. And here are some of the degrees of freedom, uh, proximal and this, the proximal pan and tilt, and then distal pan and tilt. And for this rolling joint mechanism that's actuated by tendons, I'm going to explain to you how we came about uh, that design. Okay. Um, in addition, I've also envisaged the whole system to follow this whole uh, life cycle. So at the beginning, the instruments are designed patient specifically. Um, optimized and then um, manufactured with 3D printing. The new instruments are attached to the robot, used, and after the operation, it gets dismantled. And then we use a new uh, 3D printed end effector for the robot and it repeats the cycle. So I guess with this idea, uh, there are a lot of benefits compared to traditional arthroscopy. Firstly, the, the added degrees of freedom increases the dexterity and reachability of our instrument. This optimized design um, allows it to take account of patient-specific constraints. We can make a low-cost end effector with 3D printed parts. The degrees of freedom also expands the field of view of the camera, which allows us to increase the visualization inside the knee. And we can also perform the whole intervention with one incision. That is by using a fiber optic camera scope and a laser for the actual cutting part of the procedure. And, but there are a few challenges that my research looked into. How do we then create them? How do we optimize them to have the dexterity and reachability um, inside the patient's anatomy? How can we design them with these patient-specific constraints? And when should it be specialized rather than generalized to a patient-specific task? So looking at the background of research, there are uh, works that look at optimizing the design of a snake-like manipulator. They use volume-based uh, workspace reachability, some dexterity optimization and path planning constraints but we don't believe that they've used dexterity optimization in confined spaces or understand how the two are related. How do we achieve best dexterity when there are many obstacles in the workspace? And we haven't seen enough exploration of whether we need to specialize or generalize to a surgical task, which, uh, which these things um, is what we intend to look at in this research. So the contribution of this work, we developed an end-to-end -end automated design workflow for making bespoke end effectors for our telerobot. We utilize a novel orientability index for achieving high dexterity in confined spaces. So orientability is essentially, we can measure dexterity by taking a spatial point in 3D space and all the orientations achieved by the tool can be measured as a surface area on a sphere. And this, can, this is just a ratio of, of a hole. So if the end effect that could reach to all um, angles in 3D space, that would cover the whole sphere. If, the, if this 
voxel point was inaccessible, then none of these points would be um, occupied. So it's essentially just an occupancy grid of all the different orientations that the tool is able to reach in 3D space about a specific point. And lastly, we explore the advantages of design specialization versus generalization by how the design changes between tasks. Okay, so here's the proposed design workflow. We start with a patient scan. Hey, Andrew, I think we're running out of time. Oh, really? Can we, oh, yeah. Sorry, I think you underestimated. I might get on to the main results then. Yeah, can you quickly show your main results? Uh, voxelization, optimization problem. We use differential evolution, conducted experiments to compare the different designs, uh, um, a validation experiment, and then trying to understand what, how do the, the designs change between different tasks. And we find that specialization always surpasses the generalized design. And when it comes to a new target in the environment, a specialized design will always outperform uh, the, uh, any other design. So it's always best to specialize. And looking at all the designs we made, we can see that there's a relationship between how difficult um, the target is in the anatomy and the optimal design selected by the evolution algorithm. So the more occluded the targets are, the more proximal joints are being developed and all the designs try and achieve a high curving distal section in order to achieve higher dexterity by increasing that orientability index. So overall, we created this design pipeline. We found that our approach was better than the current rigid tools being used in the in conventional arthroscopy. It's better than the volume-based approach that's normally used in the literature. We validated the model, found a relationship between the specific designs and, and found that specialization is always better. And we also determined some design trends and guidelines. So I recommend you guys to look uh, more into uh, my research. So thank you for having me. Are there any questions? Do I have time for one quick question? Sure. No one has any quick question? Cool. Uh, if not, let's thank the speaker once again. Cool. cool. Awesome. That concludes the last uh, session of our workshop. Um, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, first up, we have uh, some, before we do the concluding remarks, we have best paper, uh, uh, this one. So I invite Ting Nan to kind of nominate or uh, announce the best paper. Thanks, Bana. So uh, we select one best, uh, best paper based on two criteria. The first one is that it has, it has the best review score. And the second is that we have to unfortunately exclude papers that authors are, for example, one of the organizers. And also we exclude the papers that has also been submit, submitted to the main conferences and accepted. And those papers, they have really high quality, but for fairness, we have to exclude them from this selection. So the best paper we have is learning to navigate over clutter in indoor environments using vision. And then, of course, we have an honorable mentions, which is a very high quality paper. And the name is HL catching with whole body MPC in the black box policy learning. Thanks. Cool. Congratulations to the authors. Um, I just want to kind of conclude uh, by thanking everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I know there was a lot of choices, workshops, so you chose to spend your time here with us. So thank you very much. Um, thank you to all the keynote speakers, Scott, 
Jan and Anima for giving us like really good uh, keynote speeches and uh, really inspiring us like about the overall work that's going on. Uh, I also want to kind of thank all the invited speakers for sharing their work. That's really, really cool. We saw like robots that uh, do kind of super cool climbing on the stuff. They are flying in turbulent winds, catching, playing tennis, table tennis, and snake-like robots. I mean, it's like, and all, of course, lots of quadrupeds. So thank you very much. Like really inspiring, really, really broad work. Um, we had like lots of cool discussions around like sim to real latencies, benchmarks, how can we combine RL and uh, like traditional MPC um, and perception and so on and so forth. So thanks to Carolina for leading that discussion. Uh, thanks to all the paper authors for kind of sending us the papers and preparing posters. So thank you very much. And last but not the least, thank you to all my co-organizers for kind of really putting together lots of moving pieces. So we are doing our own MPC, so to say to kind of try and give you the best kind of experience that's possible. So uh, apologies for any hiccups with the posters and stands and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, once again, thank you very much. Uh, it was our pleasure. Um, and next up is, uh, I think we'll have posters continued. So uh, people who haven't had a chance to kind of look at the posters, please feel free to stop by and take a look. Um, and otherwise I'll see you at the conference. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, one more thing, one more thing, sorry. We also have um, a travel fund for a student. So, and and how do they apply for that? They kind of get, so do you, do they, should we ask them to reach out to us? So we have a travel fund for one student, maybe, maybe think none you should kind of. Yeah, so we have travel funds for one student and we encourage you to apply. And so what we're gonna do is send us, drop an email, uh, if you are a student and you present your posters here, drop us an email. And so we'll uh, select uh, based on the application. Thanks so much. And, and last but not least, also thank you to the technical support we had in this room. We we put a, like, a lot of demand. So thank you for, for helping us. Cool. Thank you.